Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin, translated by John Allen. Book 3, Chapter 18, Section 1, to Book 3, Chapter 20, Section 2. Chapter 18. Justification by works not to be inferred from the promise of a reward. Let us now proceed to those passages which affirm that God will render to every man according to his deeds, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul that doeth evil, but glory, honour, and peace to every man that worketh good. And all shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Come, ye blessed of my father, for I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat, I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink, etc. And with these let us also connect those which represent eternal life as the reward of works, such as the following, The recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him. He that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Every one shall receive his own reward according to his own labour. The declaration that God will render to every one according to his works is easily explained, for that phrase indicates the order of events rather than the cause of them. But it is beyond all doubt that the Lord proceeds to the consummation of our salvation by these several gradations of mercy. Whom he hath predestinated, them he calls. Whom he hath called, he justifies. And whom he hath justified, he finally glorifies. Though he receives his children into eternal life, therefore of his mere mercy, yet since he conducts them to the possession of it through a course of good works, that he may fulfil his work in them in the order he has appointed, we need not wonder if they are said to be rewarded according to their works, by which they are undoubtedly prepared to receive the crown of immortality and for this reason they are properly said to work out their own salvation, while devoting themselves to good works they aspire to eternal life, just as in another place they are commanded to labour for the meat which perisheth not, when they obtain eternal life by believing in Christ, and yet which is immediately added, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. Whence it appears that the word work is not opposed to grace, but refers to human endeavours, and therefore it does not follow either that believers are the authors of their own salvation, or that salvation proceeds from their works. But as soon as they are introduced by the knowledge of the gospel and the illumination of the Holy Spirit into communion with Christ, eternal life is begun in them. Now the good work which God hath begun in them, he will perform until the day of Jesus Christ. And it is performed when they prove themselves to be the genuine children of God by their resemblance to their heavenly Father in righteousness and holiness. We have no reason to infer from the term reward that good works are the cause of salvation. First, let this truth be established in our minds that the kingdom of heaven is not the stipend of servants but the inheritance of children, which will be enjoyed only by those whom the Lord adopts as his children, and for no other cause than on account of this adoption. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. And therefore in the same passages in which the Holy Spirit promises eternal life as the reward of works, by expressly denominating it an inheritance, he proves it to proceed from another cause. Thus Christ enumerates the works which he compensates by the reward of heaven when he calls the elect to the possession of it, but at the same time adds that it is to be enjoyed by right of inheritance. So Paul encourages servants who faithfully discharge their duty to hope for a reward from the Lord, but at the same time calls it the reward of the inheritance. We see how they, almost in express terms, caution us against attributing eternal life to works, instead of ascribing it to the divine adoption. Why, then, it may be asked, do they at the same time make mention of works? This question shall be elucidated by one example from the Scripture. Before the nativity of Isaac there had been promised to Abraham a seed in whom all the nations of the earth were to be blessed, a multiplication of his posterity, which would equal the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea, and other similar blessings. Many years after, in consequence of a divine command, Abraham prepares to sacrifice his son. After this act of obedience, he receives this promise, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, 
and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. What, did Abraham by his obedience merit that blessing which had been promised him before the command was delivered? Here, then, it appears beyond all doubt that the Lord rewards the works of believers with those blessings which he had already given them before their works were thought of, and while he had no reason for his beneficence but his own mercy. Nor does the Lord deceive and trifle with us when he says that he will requite works with what he had freely given previously to the performance of them. For since it is his pleasure that we be employed in good works while aspiring after the manifestation or enjoyment of those things which he has promised, and that they constitute the road in which we should travel to endeavour to attain the blessed hope proposed to us in heaven, therefore the fruit of the promises, to the perfection of which fruit those works conduct us, is justly assigned to them. The Apostle beautifully expressed both these ideas when he said that the Colossians applied themselves to the duties of charity for the hope which was laid up for them in heaven, whereof they heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. For his assertion that they knew from the gospel that there was hope laid up for them in heaven is equivalent to a declaration that it depended not on any works but on Christ alone, which perfectly accords with the observation of Peter that believers are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. When it is said that they must labour for it, it implies that in order to attain to it, believers have a race to run, which terminates only with their lives. But that we might not suppose the reward promised us by the Lord to be regulated according to the proportion of merit, he proposes a parable, in which he has represented himself under the character of a householder, who employs all the persons he meets in the cultivation of his vineyard. Some he hires at the first hour of the day, others at the second, others at the third, and some even at the eleventh hour. In the evening he pays them all the same wages. A brief and just explanation of this parable is given by the ancient writer, whoever he was, of the treatise On the Calling of the Gentiles, which bears the name of Ambrose. I shall adopt his words in preference to my own. Quote, by the example of this comparison, says he, the Lord has shown a variety of manifold vocation pertaining to the same grace. They who, having been admitted into the vineyard at the eleventh hour, are placed on an equality with them who had laboured the whole day, represent the state of those whom, to magnify the excellence of grace, God in his mercy has rewarded in the decline of the day and at the conclusion of life, not paying them the wages due to their labour, but sending down the riches of his goodness in copious effusions on them who he has chosen without works, that even they who have laboured the most and have received no more than the last, may understand theirs to be a reward of grace, not of works. End quote. Lastly, it is also worthy of being observed that in those places where eternal life is called a reward of works, it is not to be understood simply of that communion which we have with God, as the prelude to a happy immortality, when he embraces us in Christ with paternal benevolence, but of the possession or fruition of ultimate blessedness, as the very words of Christ import, in the world to come eternal life and in another place, come, inherit the kingdom, etc. For the same reason, Paul applies the term adoption to the revelation of adoption, which shall be made in the resurrection, and afterwards explains it to be the redemption of our body. Otherwise, as alienation from God is eternal death, so when a man is received into the favour of God, so as to enjoy communion with him, and be united to him, he is translated from death to life, which is solely the fruit of adoption. If they insist with their accustomed pertinacity on the reward of works, we may retort against them that passage of Peter, where eternal life is called the end or reward of faith. Let us not therefore imagine that the Holy Spirit, by these promises, commends the worthiness of our works, as though they merited such a reward. For the Scripture leaves us nothing that can exalt us in the divine presence. Its whole tendency is rather to repress our arrogance and to inspire us with humility, dejection, and contrition. But such promises assist our weakness, which otherwise would immediately slide and fall if it did not sustain itself by this expectation, and alleviate its sorrows by this consolation. First, let every one reflect how difficult it is for a man to relinquish and renounce not only all that belongs to him, but even himself. And yet this is the first lesson which Christ teaches his disciples, that is to say, all the pious, Afterwards he gives them such tuition during the remainder of their lives, under the discipline of the cross, 
that their hearts may not fix either their desires or their dependence on present advantages in short he generally manages them in such a manner that whithersoever they turn their views throughout the world nothing but despair presents itself to them on every side so that paul says if in this life only we have hope in christ we are of all men most miserable to preserve them from sinking under these afflictions they have the presence of the lord who encourages them to raise their heads higher and to extend their views further by assurance that they will find in him that blessedness which they cannot see in the world this blessedness he calls a reward a recompense not attributing any merit to their works but signifying that it is a compensation for their oppressions sufferings and disgrace wherefore there is no objection against our following the example of the scripture in calling eternal life a reward since in that state the lord receives his people from labour into rest from affliction into prosperity and happiness from sorrow into joy from poverty into affluence from ignominy into glory and commutes all the evils which they have endured for blessings of superior magnitude so likewise it will occasion no inconvenience if we consider holiness of life as the way not which procures our admission into the glory of the heavenly kingdom but through which the elect are conducted by their god to the manifestation of it since it is his good pleasure to glorify them whom he has sanctified only let us not imagine a reciprocal relation of merit and reward which is the error into which the sophists fell for want of considering the end which we have stated but how preposterous is it when the lord calls our attention to one end for us to direct our views to another nothing is clearer than that the promise of a reward to good works is designed to afford some consolation to the weakness of our flesh but not to inflate our minds with vainglory whoever therefore infers from this that there is any merit in works or balances the work against the reward errs very widely from the true design of god therefore when the scripture says that the lord the righteous judge shall give to his people a crown of righteousness i not only reply with augustine quote, to whom could the righteous judge have given a crown if the father of mercies had never given grace and how would it have been an act of righteousness if not preceded by that grace which justifies the ungodly how could these due rewards be rendered unless those unmerited blessings were previously bestowed End quote. but i further inquire how could he impute righteousness to our works unless his indulgent mercy had concealed their unrighteousness how could he esteem them worthy of a reward unless his infinite goodness had abolished all their demerit of punishment augustine is in the habit of designating eternal life by the word grace because when it is given as the reward of works it is conferred on the gratuitous gifts of god but the scripture humbles us more and at the same time exalts us for beside prohibiting us to glory in works because they are the gratuitous gifts of god it likewise teaches us that they are always defiled by some pollutions so that they cannot satisfy god if examined according to the rule of his judgment but it is also added to prevent our despondency that they please him merely through his mercy now though augustine expresses himself somewhat differently from us yet that there is no real difference of sentiment will appear from his language to boniface after a comparison between two men the one of a life holy and perfect even to a miracle the other a man of probity and integrity yet not so perfect but that many defects might be discovered he at length makes this inference quote, the latter whose character appears inferior to the former on account of the true faith in god by which he lives and according to which he accuses himself in all his delinquencies and in all his good works praises god ascribing the glory to him the ignominy to himself and deriving from him both the pardon of his sins and the love of virtue this man i say when delivered from his life removes into the presence of christ wherefore but on account of faith which though no man be saved by it without works for it is not a reprobate faith but such as works by love yet produces remission of sins for the just lives by faith but without it works apparently good are perverted into sins end quote. here he avows without any obscurity that for which we so strenuously contend that the righteousness of good works depends on their acceptance by the divine mercy very similar to the foregoing passages is the import of the following make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when ye fail they may receive you into everlasting habitations charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living god 
that they do good, that they be rich in good works, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Here good works are compared to riches which we may enjoy in the happiness of eternal life. I reply that we shall never arrive at the true meaning of these passages unless we advert to the design of the Spirit in such language. If Christ's declaration be true that where our treasure is, there will our heart be also, as the children of this world are generally intent on the acquisition of those things which conduce to the comfort of the present life, so it ought to be the concern of believers, after they have been taught that this life will ere long vanish like a dream, to transmit those things which they really wish to enjoy to that place where they shall possess a perfect and permanent life. It behoves us, therefore, to imitate the conduct of those who determine to migrate to any new situation where they have chosen to reside during the remainder of their lives. They send their property before them without regarding the inconvenience of a temporary absence from it, esteeming their happiness the greater in proportion to the wealth which they possess in the place which they intend for their permanent residence. If we believe heaven to be our country, it is better for us to transmit our wealth thither than to retain it here, where we may lose it by a sudden removal. But how shall we transmit it? Why, if we communicate to the necessities of the poor, whatever is bestowed on them, the Lord considers as given to himself. Whence that celebrated promise, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. Again, he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. For all things that are bestowed on our brethren in a way of charity are so many deposits in the hand of the Lord, which he, as a faithful depository, will one day restore with ample interest. Are our acts of duty, then, it will be asked, so valuable in the sight of God that they are like riches reserved in his hand for us? And who can be afraid to assert this when the Scripture so frequently and plainly declares it? But if any one from the mere goodness of God would infer the merit of works, these testimonies will afford no countenance to such an error, for we can infer nothing from them except the indulgence which God in his mercy is disposed to show us, since in order to animate us from rectitude of conduct, though the duties we perform are unworthy of the least notice from him, yet he suffers not one of them to go unrewarded. But they insist more on the words of the Apostle, who, to console the Thessalonians under their tribulations, tells them that the design of their affliction is that they may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which they also suffer. Seeing, says he, it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. And the author of the epistle to the Hebrews says, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints. To the first passage I reply that it indicates no worthiness of merit, but since it is the will of God the Father that those whom he has chosen as his children be conformed to Christ, his first begotten Son, as it was necessary for him first to suffer and then to enter into the glory destined for him, so we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. The tribulations, therefore, which we suffer for the name of Christ are, as it were, certain marks impressed on us by which God usually distinguishes the sheep of his flock. For this reason, then, we are accounted worthy of the kingdom of God, because we bear in our body the marks of our Lord and Master, which are the badges of the children of God. The same sentiment is conveyed in the following passages. Bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. The reason which the apostle subjoins tends not to establish any merit, but to confirm the hope of the kingdom of God, as though he had said, As it is consistent with the judgment of God to avenge on your enemies those vexations with which they have harassed you, so it is also to grant you respite and repose from those vexations. Of the other passage, which represents it as becoming the righteousness of God not to forget our services, so as almost to imply that he would be unrighteous if he did forget them. The meaning is that in order to arouse our indolence, God has assured us that the labor which we undergo for the glory of his name shall not be in vain. And we should always remember that this promise, as well as all others, would be fraught with no benefit to us unless it were preceded by the gratuitous covenant of mercy on which the whole certainty of our salvation must depend. 
but relying on that covenant we may securely confide that our services, however unworthy, will not go without a reward from the goodness of God. To confirm us in that expectation, the Apostle asserts that God is not unrighteous, but will perform the promise he has once made. This righteousness, therefore, refers rather to the truth of the divine promise than to the equity of rendering to us anything that is our due. To this purpose there is a remarkable observation of Augustine, and as that holy man has not hesitated frequently to repeat it as deserving of remembrance, so I deem it not unworthy of a constant place in our minds. Quote, the Lord, says he, is faithful, who has made himself our debtor, not by receiving anything from us, but by promising all things to us. End quote. Our Pharisees adduce the following passages of Paul, Though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. Again, now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Again, above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. From the first two passages they contend that we are justified rather by charity than by faith, that is, by the superior virtue, as they express it. But this argument is easily overturned, for we have already shown that what is mentioned in the first passage has no reference to true faith. The second we explain to signify true faith, than which he calls charity greater, not as being more meritorious, but because it is more fruitful, more extensive, more generally serviceable, and perpetual in its duration, whereas the use of faith is only temporary. In respect of excellence, the preeminence must be given to the love of God, which is not in this place the subject of Paul's discourse. For the only point which he urges is that with reciprocal charity we mutually edify one another in the Lord. But let us suppose that charity excels faith in all respects, yet what person possessed of sound judgment, or even of the common exercise of reason, would argue from this that it has a greater concern in justification? The power of justifying, attached to faith, consists not in the worthiness of the act. Our justification depends solely on the mercy of God, and the merit of Christ, which, when faith apprehends, it is said to justify us. Now, if we ask our adversaries in what sense they attribute justification to charity, they will reply that because it is a duty pleasing to God, the merit of it, being accepted by the divine goodness, is imputed to us for righteousness. Here we see how curiously their argument proceeds. We assert that faith justifies not by procuring us a righteousness through its own merit, but as the instrument by which we freely obtain the righteousness of Christ. These men, passing over in silence the mercy of God, and making no mention of Christ, in whom is the substance of righteousness, contend that we are justified by the virtue of charity, because it is more excellent than faith. Just as though any one should insist that a king, in consequence of his superior rank, is more expert at making a shoe than a shoemaker. This one argument affords an ample proof that all these Sorbonic schools are destitute of the least experience of justification by faith. But if any wrangler should yet inquire why we understand Paul to use the word faith in different acceptations in the same discourse, I am prepared with a substantial reason for such an interpretation. For since those gifts which Paul enumerates are in some respect connected with faith and hope, because they relate to the knowledge of God, he summarily comprises them all under those two words, as though he had said, The end of prophecy and of tongues, of knowledge and of the gift of interpretation, is to conduct us to the knowledge of God. But we know God in this life only by hope and faith. Therefore, when I mention faith and hope, I comprehend all these things under them. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, that is, all gifts, whatever may be their variety, are referred to these. But the greatest of these is charity. From the third passage they infer that if charity is the bond of perfectness, it is therefore the bond of righteousness, which is no other than perfection. Now, to refrain from observing that what Paul calls perfectness is the mutual connection which subsists between the members of a well-constituted church, and to admit that charity constitutes our perfection before God, yet what new advantage will they gain? On the contrary, I shall always object that we never arrive at that perfection unless we fulfil all the branches of charity, and hence I shall infer that since all men are at an immense distance from complete charity, they are destitute of all hope of perfection. I have no inclination to notice all the passages of Scripture which the folly of the modern Sorbonists seizes as they occur, and without any reason employs against us, 
for some of them are so ridiculous that I could not even mention them unless I wished to be accounted a fool. I shall therefore conclude this subject after having explained a sentence uttered by Christ, with which they are wonderfully pleased. To a lawyer who asked him what was necessary to salvation, he replied, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. What can we wish more, say they, when the author of grace himself commands to obtain the kingdom of heaven by an observance of the commandments? As though it were not evident that Christ adapted his replies to those with whom he conversed. Here a doctor of the law inquires the method of obtaining happiness, and that not simply, but what men must do in order to attain it. Both the character of the speaker and the inquiry itself induced the Lord to make this reply. The inquirer, persuaded of the righteousness of the law, possessed a blind confidence in his works. Besides, he only inquired what were those works of righteousness by which salvation might be procured. He is therefore justly referred to the law, which contains a perfect mirror of righteousness. We also explicitly declare that if life be sought by works, it is indispensably requisite to keep the commandments. And this doctrine is necessary to be known by Christians, for how should they flee for refuge to Christ, if they did not acknowledge themselves to have fallen from the way of life upon the precipice of death? And how could they know how far they have wandered from the way of life without a previous knowledge of what that way of life is? It is then, therefore, that Christ is presented to them as the asylum of salvation when they perceive the vast difference between their own lives and the divine righteousness which consists in the observance of the law. The sum of the whole is that if we seek salvation by works we must keep the commandments by which we are taught perfect righteousness. But to stop here would be failing in the midst of our course, for to keep the commandments is a task to which none of us are equal. Being excluded, then, from the righteousness of the law, we are under the necessity of resorting to some other refuge, namely, to faith in Christ. Wherefore, as the Lord, knowing this doctor of the law to be inflated with a vain confidence in his works, recalls his attention to the law, that it may teach him his own character as a sinner, obnoxious to the tremendous sentence of eternal death, so, in another place, addressing those who have already been humbled under his knowledge, he omits all mention of the law, and consoles them with a promise of grace. Come unto me, all ye that labour, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. At length, after our adversaries have wearied themselves with perversions of scripture, they betake themselves to subtleties and sophisms. They cavil that faith is in some places called a work, and hence they infer that we improperly oppose faith to works, as though faith procured righteousness for us by its intrinsic merit, as an act of obedience to the divine will, and not rather because, by embracing the divine mercy, it seals to our hearts the righteousness of Christ, which that mercy offers to us in the preaching of the gospel. The reader will pardon me for not dwelling on the confutation of such follies, for they require nothing to refute them but their own weakness. But I wish briefly to answer one objection, which has some appearance of reason, to prevent its being the source of any difficulty to persons who have had but little experience. Since common sense dictates that opposites are subject to similar rules, and as all sins are imputed to us for unrighteousness, they maintain it to be reasonable, on the other hand, that all good works should be imputed to us for righteousness. Those who reply that the condemnation of men proceeds from unbelief alone, and not from particular sins, do not satisfy me. I agree with them that incredulity is the fountain and root of all evils, for it is the original defection from God which is afterwards followed by particular transgressions of the law. But as they appear to fix one and the same rule for good and evil works in forming a judgment of righteousness or unrighteousness, here I am obliged to dissent from them. For the righteousness of works is the perfect obedience of the law. We cannot therefore be righteous by works unless we follow this straight line through the whole of our lives. The first deviation from it is a lapse into unrighteousness. Hence it appears that righteousness arises not from one or a few works, but from an inflexible and indefatigable observance of the divine will. But the rule of judging of unrighteousness is very different, for he who has committed fornication or theft is for one transgression liable to the sentence of death, because he has offended against the divine majesty. These disputants of ours, therefore, fall into an error for want of adverting to the decision of James, that whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill, etc. 
it ought not therefore to be deemed absurd when we say that death is the reward justly due to every sin because they are all and every one deserving of the indignation and vengeance of god but it will be a weak argument to infer on the contrary that one good work will reconcile a man to god whose wrath he has incurred by a multitude of sins chapter nineteen on christian liberty we have now to treat of christian liberty an explanation of which ought not to be omitted in a treatise which is designed to comprehend a compendious summary of evangelical doctrine for it is a subject of the first importance and unless it be well understood our consciences scarcely venture to undertake anything without doubting experience in many things hesitation and reluctance and are always subject to fluctuations and fears but especially it is an appendix to justification and affords no small assistance towards the knowledge of its influence hence they who sincerely fear god will experience the incomparable advantage of that doctrine which impious scoffers pursue with their railleries because in the spiritual intoxication with which they are seized they allow themselves the most unbounded impudence wherefore this is the proper time to introduce the subject and though we have slightly touched upon it in some former occasions yet it was useful to defer the full discussion of it to this place because as soon as any mention is made of christian liberty then either inordinate passions rage or violent emotions arise unless timely opposition be made to those wanton spirits who most nefariously corrupt things which are otherwise the best for some under the pretext of this liberty cast off all obedience to god and precipitate themselves into the most unbridled licentiousness and some despise it supposing it to be subversive of all moderation order and moral distinctions what can we do in this case surrounded by such difficulties shall we entirely discard christian liberty and so preclude the occasion of such dangers but as we have observed unless this be understood there can be no right knowledge of christ or of evangelical truth or of internal peace of mind we should rather exert ourselves to prevent the suppression of such a necessary branch of doctrine and at the same time to obviate those absurd objections which are frequently deduced from it christian liberty according to my judgment consists in three parts the first part is that the consciences of believers when seeking an assurance of their justification before god should raise themselves above the law and forget all the righteousness of the law for since the law as we have elsewhere demonstrated leaves no man righteous either we must be excluded from all hope of justification or it is necessary for us to be delivered from it and that so completely as not to have any dependence on works for he who imagines that in order to obtain righteousness he must produce any works however small can fix no limit or boundary but renders himself a debtor to the whole law avoiding therefore all mention of the law and dismissing all thoughts of our own works in reference to justification we must embrace the divine mercy alone and turning our eyes from ourselves fix them solely on christ for the question is not how we can be righteous but how though unrighteous and unworthy we can be considered as righteous and the conscience that desires to attain any certainty respecting this must give no admission to the law nor will this authorize any one to conclude that the law is of no use to believers whom it still continues to instruct and exhort and stimulate to duty though it has no place in their consciences before the tribunal of god for these two things being very different require to be properly and carefully distinguished by us the whole life of christians ought to be an exercise of piety since they are called to sanctification it is the office of the law to remind them of their duty and thereby to excite them to the pursuit of holiness and integrity but when their consciences are solicitous how god may be propitiated what answer they shall make and on what they shall rest their confidence if called to his tribunal there must then be no consideration of the requisitions of the law but christ alone must be proposed for righteousness who exceeds all the perfection of the law on this point turns almost the whole argument of the epistle to the galatians for that they are erroneous expositors who maintain that paul there contends only for liberty from ceremonies may be proved from the topics of his reasoning such as these christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us again stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage behold i paul say unto you that if ye be circumcised christ shall profit you nothing every man that is circumcised is a debtor to do the whole law christ is become of no effect unto you 
whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. These passages certainly comprehend something more exalted than a freedom from ceremonies. I confess indeed that Paul is there treating of ceremonies because he is contending with the false apostles, who attempted to introduce again into the Christian church the ancient shadows of the law which had been abolished by the advent of Christ. But for the decision of this question it was necessary to discuss some higher topics in which the whole controversy lay, first because the brightness of the gospel was obscured by those Jewish shadows. He shows that in Christ we have a complete exhibition of all those things which were adumbrated by the ceremonies of Moses. Secondly, because these impostors instilled into the people the very pernicious opinion that this ceremonial obedience was sufficient to merit the divine favour, he principally contends that believers ought not to suppose that they can obtain righteousness before God by any works of the law, much less by those inferior elements. And he at the same time teaches that from the condemnation of the law, which otherwise impends over all men, they are delivered by the cross of Christ, that they may rely with perfect security on him alone, a topic which properly belongs to our present subject. Lastly, he asserts the liberty of the consciences of believers, which ought to be laid under no obligation in things that are not necessary. The second part of Christian liberty, which is dependent on the first, is that their consciences do not observe the law as being under any legal obligation, but that, being liberated from the yoke of the law, they yield a voluntary obedience to the will of God. For, being possessed with perpetual terrors, as long as they remain under the dominion of the law, they will never engage with alacrity and promptitude in the service of God, unless they have previously received this liberty. We shall more easily and clearly discover the design of these things from an example. The precept of the law is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That this command may be fulfilled, our soul must be previously divested of every other perception and thought, our heart must be freed from all desires, and our might must have collected and contracted to this one point. Those who, compared with others, have made a very considerable progress in the way of the Lord, are yet at an immense distance from this perfection. For though they love God with their soul, and with sincere affection of heart, yet they have still much of their heart and soul occupied by carnal desires, which retard their progress towards God. They do indeed press forward with strong exertions, but the flesh partly debilitates their strength and partly attracts it to itself. What can they do in this case, when they perceive that they are so far from observing the law? They wish, they aspire, they endeavour, but they do nothing with the perfection that is required. If they advert to the law, they see that every work they attempt or meditate is accursed, nor is there the least reason for any person to deceive himself by concluding that an action is not necessarily altogether evil because it is imperfect, and that therefore the good part of it is accepted by God. For the law, requiring perfect love, condemns all imperfection unless its rigour be mitigated. Let him consider his work, therefore, which he wished to be thought partly good, and he will find that very work to be a transgression of the law because it is imperfect." See how all our works, if estimated according to the rigour of the law, are subject to its curse. How then could unhappy souls apply themselves with alacrity to any work for which they could expect to receive nothing but a curse? On the contrary, if they are liberated from the severe exaction of the law, or rather from the whole of its rigour, and hear God calling them with paternal gentleness, then with cheerfulness and prompt alacrity they will answer to his call and follow his guidance. In short, they who are bound by the yoke of the law are like slaves who have certain daily tasks appointed by their masters. They think they have done nothing, and presumed not to enter into the presence of their masters without having finished the work prescribed to them. But children, who are treated by their parents in a more liberal manner, hesitate not to present to them their imperfect, and in some respects faulty works, in confidence that their obedience and promptitude of mind will be accepted by them, though they have not performed all that they wished. Such children ought we to be, feeling a certain confidence that our services, however small, rude, and imperfect, will be approved by our most indulgent father. This he also confirms to us by the prophet. I will spare them, saith he, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Where it is evident, from the mention of service, that the word spare is used to denote indulgence, or an overlooking of faults. And we have great need of this confidence, without which all our endeavours will be vain. 
for god considers us as serving him in none of our works but such as are truly done by us to his honour but how can this be done amidst those terrors where it is a matter of doubt whether our works offend god or honour him this is the reason why the author of the epistle to the hebrews refers to faith and estimates only by faith all the good works which are recorded of the holy patriarchs on this liberty there is a remarkable passage in the epistle to the romans where paul reasons that sin ought not to have dominion over us because we are not under the law but under grace for after he had exhorted believers let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness but yield yourselves unto god as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto god they might on the contrary object that they yet carried about with them the flesh full of inordinate desires and that sin dwelt in them but he adds the consolation furnished by their liberty from the law as though he had said although you do not yet experience sin to be destroyed and righteousness living in you in perfection yet you have no cause for terror and dejection of mind as if god were perpetually offended on account of your remaining sin because by grace you are emancipated from the law that your works may not be judged according to that rule but those who infer that we may commit sin because we are not under the law may be assured that they have no concern with this liberty the end of which is to animate us to virtue the third part of christian liberty teaches us that we are bound by no obligation before god respecting external things which in themselves are indifferent but that we may indifferently sometimes use and at other times omit them and the knowledge of this liberty also is very necessary for us for without it we shall have no tranquillity of conscience nor will there be any end of superstitions many in the present age think it a folly to raise any dispute concerning the free use of meats of days and of habits and similar subjects considering these things as frivolous and nugatory but they are of greater importance than is generally believed for when the conscience has once fallen into the snare it enters a long and inextricable labyrinth from which it is afterwards difficult to escape if a man begins to doubt the lawfulness of using flax in sheets shirts handkerchiefs napkins and tablecloths neither will he be certain respecting hemp and at last he will doubt of the lawfulness of using tow for he will consider with himself whether he cannot eat without tablecloths or napkins whether he cannot do without handkerchiefs if any one imagine delicate food to be unlawful he will ere long have no tranquillity before god in eating brown bread and common viands while he remembers that he might support his body with meat of a quality still inferior if he hesitate respecting good wine he will afterwards be unable with any peace of conscience to drink the most vapid and at last he will not presume even to touch purer and sweeter water than others in short he will come to think it criminal to step over a twig that lies across his path for this is the commencement of no trivial controversy but the dispute is whether the use of certain things be agreeable to god whose will ought to guide all our resolutions and all our actions the necessary consequence is that some are hurried by despair into a vortex of confusion from which they see no way of escape and some despising god and casting off all fear of him make a way of ruin for themselves for all who are involved in such doubts which way soever they turn their views behold something offensive to their consciences presenting itself on every side i know says paul that there is nothing unclean of itself but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean to him it is unclean in these words he makes all external things subject to our liberty provided that our minds have regard to this liberty before god but if any superstitious notion cause us to scruple those things which were naturally pure become contaminated to us wherefore he subjoins happy is he that condemneth not himself in that which he alloweth and he that doubteth is condemned if he eat because he eateth not of faith for whatsoever is not of faith is sin are not they who in these perplexities show their superior boldness by the security of their presumption guilty of departing from god whilst they who are deeply affected with the true fear of god when they are even constrained to admit many things to which their own consciences are averse are filled with terror and consternation no persons of this description receive any of the gifts of god with thanksgiving by which alone paul nevertheless declares them to be all sanctified to our use i mean a thanksgiving proceeding from a mind which acknowledges the beneficence and goodness of god in the blessings he bestows 
for many of them indeed apprehend the good things which they use to be from god whom they praise in his works but not being persuaded that they are given to them how could they give thanks to god as the giver of them we see in short the tendency of this liberty which is that without any scruple of conscience or perturbation of mind we should devote the gifts of god to that use for which he has given them by which confidence our souls may have peace with him and acknowledge his liberality towards us for this comprehends all ceremonies the observation of which is left free that the conscience may not be bound by any obligation to serve them but may remember that by the goodness of god it may use them or abstain from them as shall be most conducive to edification now it must be carefully observed that christian liberty is in all branches a spiritual thing all the virtue of which consists in appeasing terrified consciences before god whether they are disquieted or solicitous concerning the remission of their sins or are anxious to know if their works which are imperfect and contaminated by the defilements of the flesh be acceptable to god or are tormented concerning the use of things that are indifferent wherefore they are guilty of perverting its meaning who either make it the pretext of their irregular appetites that they may abuse the divine blessings to the purposes of sensuality or who suppose that there is no liberty but what is used before men and therefore in the exercise of it totally disregard their weak brethren the former of these sins is the more common in the present age there is scarcely any one whom his wealth permits to be sumptuous who is not delighted with luxurious splendour in his entertainments in his dress and in his buildings who does not desire a pre-eminence in every species of luxury who does not strangely flatter himself on his elegance and all these things are defended under the pretext of christian liberty they allege that they are things indifferent this i admit provided they be indifferently used but there they are too ardently coveted proudly boasted or luxuriously lavished these things of themselves otherwise indifferent are completely polluted by such vices this passage of paul makes an excellent distinction respecting things which are indifferent unto the pure all things are pure but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure but even their mind and conscience is defiled for why are curses denounced on rich men who receive their consolation who are satiated who now laugh who lie in beds of ivory who join field to field who have the harp and the lyre and the tabret and wine in their feasts ivory and gold and riches of all kinds are certainly blessings of divine providence not only permitted but expressly designed for the use of men nor are we anywhere prohibited to laugh or to be satiated with food or to annex new possessions to those already enjoyed by ourselves or by our ancestors or to be delighted with musical harmony or to drink wine this indeed is true but amidst an abundance of all things to be immersed in sensual delights to inebriate the heart and mind with present pleasures and perpetually to grasp at new ones these things are very remote from a legitimate use of the divine blessings let them banish therefore immoderate cupidity excessive profusion vanity and arrogance that with a pure conscience they may make a proper use of the gifts of god when their hearts shall be formed to this sobriety they will have a rule for the legitimate enjoyment of them on the contrary without this moderation even proud and ordinary pleasures are chargeable with excess for it is truly observed that a proud heart frequently dwells under coarse and ragged garments and that simplicity and humility are sometimes concealed under purple and fine linen let all men in their respective stations whether of poverty of competence or of splendour live in the remembrance of this truth that god confers his blessings on them for the support of life not for luxury and let them consider this as the law of christian liberty that they learn the lesson which paul had learnt when he said i have learned in whatsoever state i am therewith to be content i know both how to be abased and i know how to abound everywhere and in all things i am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need many persons err likewise in this respect that as if their liberty would not be perfectly secure unless witnessed by men they make an indiscriminate and imprudent use of it a disorderly practice which occasions frequent offence to their weak brethren there are some to be found in the present day who imagine their liberty would be abridged if they were not to enter on the enjoyment of it by eating animal food on friday their eating is not the subject of my reprehension but their minds require to be divested of this false notion for they ought to consider that they obtain no advantage from their liberty before men but with god 
and that it consists in abstinence as well as in use. If they apprehend it to be immaterial in God's view, whether they eat animal food or eggs, whether their garments be scarlet or black, it is quite sufficient. The conscience to which the benefit of this liberty was due is now emancipated. Therefore, though they abstain from flesh, and wear but one colour, during all the rest of their lives, this is no diminution of their freedom. Nay, because they are free, they therefore abstain with a free conscience, but they fall into a very pernicious error in disregarding the infirmity of their brethren, which it becomes us to bear, so as not rashly to do anything which would give them the least offence. But it will be said that it is sometimes right to assert our liberty before men. This I confess, yet the greatest caution and moderation must be observed, lest we cast off all concern for the weak whom God has so strongly recommended to our regards. I shall now, therefore, make some observations concerning offences, how they are to be discriminated, what are to be avoided, and what are to be disregarded. Whence we may afterwards determine what room there is for our liberty in our intercourse with mankind. I approve of the common distinction between an offence given and an offence taken, since it is plainly countenanced by Scripture, and is likewise sufficiently significant of the thing intended to be expressed. If you do anything at a wrong time or place, or with an unseasonable levity or wantonness or temerity, by which the weak and inexperienced are offended, it must be termed an offence given by you, because it arises from your fault. And an offence is always said to be given in any action, the fault of which proceeds from the performer of that action. An offence taken is when any transaction, not otherwise unseasonable or culpable, is, through malevolence or some perverse disposition, construed into an occasion of offence. For in this instance the offence is not given, but taken without reason by such perverseness of construction. The first species of offence affects none but the weak, the second is created by moroseness of temper and pharisaical superciliousness. Wherefore we shall denominate the former the offence of the weak the latter that of the Pharisees, and we shall so temper the use of our liberty that it ought to submit to the ignorance of weak brethren, but not at all to the austerity of Pharisees. For our duty to the weak Paul fully shows in many places. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. Again, let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way and much more to the same import, which were better examined in its proper connection than recited here. The sum of all is that we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbour for his good to edification. In another place, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling-block to them that are weak. Again, whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat asking no question for conscience's sake, conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. In short, give none offence, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. In another place also, brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. The meaning of this is that our liberty is not given us to be used in opposition to our weak neighbours, to whom charity obliges us to do every possible service, but rather in order that, having peace with God in our minds, we may also live peaceably among men. But how much attention should be paid to an offence taken by Pharisees, we learn from our Lord's injunction, let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. The disciples had informed him that the Pharisees were offended with his discourse. He replies that they are to be let alone and their offence disregarded. But the subject is still pending in uncertainty, unless we know whom we are to account weak and whom we are to consider as Pharisees, without which distinction I see no use of liberty in the midst of offences, but such as must be attended with the greatest danger. But Paul appears to me to have been very clearly decided, both by doctrine and examples, how far our liberty should be either moderated or asserted on the occurrence of offences. When he made Timothy his associate, he circumcised him, but could not be induced to circumcise Titus. Here was a difference in his proceedings, but no change of mind or of purpose. In the circumcision of Timothy, though he was free from all men, yet he made himself servant unto all, and, says he, unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. I made all things to all men, 
that I might by all means save some. Thus we have a proper moderation of liberty if it be indifferently restricted with any advantage. His reason for resolutely restraining from circumcising Titus he declares in the following words, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. We also are under the necessity of vindicating our liberty, if it be endangered in weak consciences by the iniquitous requisitions of false prophets. We must at all times study charity and keep in view the edification of our neighbour. All things, says Paul, are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's. Nothing can be plainer than this rule, that our liberty should be used, if it conduces to our neighbour's edification, but that if it be not beneficial to our neighbour, it should be abridged. There are some who pretend to imitate the prudence of Paul in refraining from the exercise of liberty, while they are doing anything but exercising the duties of charity. For to promote their own tranquillity, they wish all mention of liberty to be buried. Whereas it is no less advantageous to our neighbours sometimes to use our liberty to their benefit and edification, than at other times to moderate it for their accommodation. But a pious man considers this liberty in external things as granted him in order that he may be the better prepared for all the duties of charity. But whatever I have advanced respecting the avoidance of offences, I wish to be referred to in different and unimportant things, for necessary duties must not be omitted through fear of any offence, as if our liberty should be subject to charity, so charity itself ought to be subservient to the purity of faith. It becomes us indeed to have regard to charity, but we must not offend God for the love of our neighbour. We cannot approve the intemperance of those who do nothing but in a tumultuous manner, and who prefer violent measures to lenient ones. Nor must we listen to those who, while they show themselves the leaders in a thousand species of impiety, pretend that they are obliged to act in such a manner that they may give no offence to their neighbours, as though they are not at the same time fortifying the consciences of their neighbours in sin, especially since they are always sticking in the same mire without any hope of deliverance. And whether their neighbour is to be instructed by doctrine or by example, they maintain that he ought to be fed with milk, though they are infecting him with the worst and most pernicious notions. Paul tells the Corinthians, I have fed you with milk, but if the popish mass had been then introduced among them, would he have united in that pretended sacrifice in order to feed them with milk? Certainly not, for milk is not poison. They are guilty of falsehood, therefore, in saying that they feed those whom they cruelly murder under the appearance of such flatteries. But admitting that such dissimulation is to be approved for a time, how long will they feed their children with the same milk? For if they never grow, so as to be able to bear even some light meat, it is a clear proof that they were never fed with milk." I am prevented from pushing this controversy with them any further at present by two reasons. First, because their absurdities scarcely deserve a refutation, being justly despised by all men of sound understanding. Secondly, having done this at large in particular treatises, I am unwilling to travel the same ground over again. Only let the readers remember that, with whatever offences Satan and the world may endeavour to divert us from the ordinances of God, or to retard our pursuit of what he enjoins, Yet we must nevertheless strenuously advance, and moreover, that whatever dangers threaten us, we are not at liberty to deviate even a hair's breadth from his command, and that it is not lawful under any pretext to attempt anything but what he permits. Now since the consciences of believers, being privileged with the liberty which we have described, have been delivered by the favour of Christ from all necessary obligations to the observance of those things in which the Lord has been pleased that they should be left free, we conclude that they are exempt from all human authority. For it is not right that Christ should lose the acknowledgments due to such kindness, or our consciences the benefit of it. Neither is that to be accounted a trivial thing which we see cost Christ so much, which he estimated not with gold or silver, but with his own blood. So that Paul hesitates not to assert that his death is rendered vain if we suffer our souls to be in subjection to men for his sole object in some chapters of his epistle to the Galatians is to prove that Christ is obscured or rather abolished with respect to us, 
unless our consciences continue in their liberty, from which they are certainly fallen. If they can be ensnared in the bonds of love and ordinances at the pleasure of men, but as it is a subject highly worthy of being understood, so it needs a more diffuse and perspicuous explanation. For, as soon as a word is mentioned concerning the abrogation of human establishments, great tumults are excited, partly by seditious persons, partly by cavillers, as though all obedience of men were at once subverted and destroyed. To prevent any one from falling into this error, let us therefore consider, in the first place, that man is under two kinds of government, one spiritual, by which the conscience is formed to piety and the service of God, the other political, by which a man is instructed in the duties of humanity and civility, which are to be observed in an intercourse with mankind. They are generally and not improperly denominated the spiritual and the temporal jurisdiction, indicating that the former species of government pertains to the life of the soul, and that the latter relates to the concerns of the present state, not only to the provision of food and clothing, but to the enactment of laws to regulate a man's life among his neighbours by the rules of holiness, integrity, and sobriety. For the former has its seat in the interior of the mind, whilst the latter only directs the external conduct. One may be termed a spiritual kingdom, and the other a political one. But these two, as we have distinguished them, always require to be considered separately, and while the one is under discussion, the mind must be abstracted from all consideration of the other. For man contains, as it were, two worlds, capable of being governed by various rulers and various laws. This distinction will prevent what the gospel inculcates concerning spiritual liberty from being misapplied to political regulations, as though Christians were less subject to the external government of human laws, because their consciences have been set at liberty before God, as though their freedom of spirit necessarily exempted them from all carnal servitude, Again, because even in those constitutions which seem to pertain to the spiritual kingdom, there may possibly be some deception. It is necessary to discriminate between these also, which are to be accounted legitimate as according to the divine word, and which, on the contrary, ought not to be received among believers. Of civil government I shall treat in another place. Of ecclesiastical laws also I forbear to speak at present, because a full discussion of them will be proper in the fourth book, where we shall treat of the power of the church. But we shall conclude the present argument in the following manner. The question, which, as I have observed, is in itself not very obscure or intricate, greatly perplexes many because they do not distinguish with sufficient precision between the external jurisdiction and the court of conscience. The difficulty is increased by Paul's injunction to obey magistrates, not only for wrath, but also for conscience's sake from which it should follow that the conscience is also bound by political laws. But if this were true, it would supersede all that we have already said, or are now about to say respecting spiritual government. For the solution of this difficulty, it will be of use first to know what conscience is, and the definition of it must be derived from the etymology of the word. For as when men apprehend the knowledge of things in the mind and understanding, they are said to sire, to know, whence is derived the word scientensia, science or knowledge, so when they have a sense of divine justice as an additional witness which permits them not to conceal their sins, or to elude accusation at the tribunal of the supreme judge, this sense is called consentia, conscience, for it is a kind of medium between God and man, because it does not suffer a man to suppress what he knows within himself, but pursues him till it brings him to conviction. This is what Paul means by their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts accusing, or else excusing, one another. Simple knowledge might remain, as it were, confined within a man. This sentiment, therefore, which places man before the divine tribunal, is appointed, as it were, to watch over man, to observe and examine all his secrets, that nothing may remain enveloped in darkness. Hence the old proverb, conscience is as a thousand witnesses. For the same reason Peter speaks of the answer of a good conscience towards God, to express our tranquillity of mind, when, persuaded of the favour of Christ, we present ourselves with boldness in the presence of God. And the author of the epistle to the Hebrews expresses absolution or freedom from every future charge of sin, by having no more conscience of sin. Therefore, as works respect men, so conscience regards God, so that a good conscience is no other than inward integrity of heart, 
in which sense Paul says that the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Afterwards also in the same chapter he shows how widely it differs from understanding, saying that some, having put away a good conscience, concerning faith have made shipwreck. For these words indicate that it is a lively inclination to the service of God, and a sincere pursuit of piety and holiness of life. Sometimes, indeed, it is likewise extended to men, as when the same apostle declares, Herein do I exercise myself, to have always a conscience void of offence towards God and toward men. But the reason of this assertion is that the fruits of a good conscience reach even to men. But in strict propriety of speech it has to do with God alone, as I have already observed. Hence it is that a law which simply binds a man without relation to other men or any consideration of them is said to bind the conscience. For example, God not only enjoins the preservation of the mind chaste and pure from every libidinous desire, but prohibits all obscenity of language and external lasciviousness. The observance of this law is incumbent on my conscience, though there were not another man existing in the world. Thus he who transgresses the limits of temperance not only sins by giving a bad example to his brethren, but contracts guilt on his conscience before God. Things in themselves indifferent are to be guided by other considerations. It is our duty to abstain from them if they tend to the least offence without violating our liberty of conscience. So Paul speaks concerning meat consecrated to idols. If any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice to idols, eat not for conscience's sake. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. A pious man would be guilty of sin, who, being previously admonished, should nevertheless eat such meat. But though, with respect to his brother, abstinence is necessary for him, as it is enjoined by God, yet he ceases not to retain liberty of conscience. We see, then, how this law, though it binds the external action, leaves the conscience free. Chapter 20. On Prayer the principal exercise of faith, and the medium of our daily reception of divine blessings. From the subjects already discussed we clearly perceive how utterly destitute man is of every good and in want of all the means of salvation. Wherefore, if he seek for relief in his necessities, he must go out of himself and obtain it from some other quarter. It has been subsequently stated that the Lord voluntarily and liberally manifests himself in his Christ, in whom he offers us all felicity instead of our misery, and opulence instead of our poverty, in whom he opens to our view the treasures of heaven, that our faith may be wholly engaged in the contemplation of his beloved Son, that all our expectation may depend upon him, and that in him all our hope may rest and be fully satisfied. This, indeed, is that secret and recondite philosophy which cannot be extracted from syllogisms, but is well understood by those whose eyes God has opened, that in his light they may see light. But since we have been taught by faith to acknowledge that whatever we want for the supply of our necessities is in God and our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom it has pleased the Father all the fullness of his bounty should dwell, that we may all draw from it, as from a most copious fountain, it remains for us to seek in him, and by prayers to implore of him, that which we have been informed resides in him. Otherwise to know God as the Lord and giver of every good, who invites us to supplicate him, but neither to approach him nor to supplicate him, would be equally unprofitable as for a man to neglect a treasure discovered to him buried in the earth. Wherefore the apostle, to show that true faith cannot but be engaged in calling upon God, has laid down this order that, as faith is produced by the gospel, so by faith our hearts are brought to invoke the name of the Lord. And this is the same as he had a little before said, that the spirit of adoption who seals the testimony of the gospel in our hearts encourages our spirits so that they venture to pour out their desires before God, excite groanings that cannot be uttered, and cry with confidence, Abba, Father. This last subject, therefore, having been before only cursorily mentioned and slightly touched, requires now to be treated more at large. By means of prayer, then, we penetrate to those riches which are reserved with our Heavenly Father for our use. For between God and men there is a certain communication by which they enter into the sanctuary of heaven, and in his immediate presence remind him of his promises, in order that his declarations, which they have implicitly believed, may in time of necessity be verified in their experience. 
We see, therefore, that nothing is revealed to us, to be expected from the Lord, for which we are not likewise enjoined to pray. So true is it that prayer digs out those treasures which the gospel of the Lord discovers to our faith. Now the necessity and various utility of the exercise of prayer no language can sufficiently explain. It is certainly not without reason that our Heavenly Father declares that the only fortress of salvation consists in invocation of His name, by which we call to our aid the presence of His providence, which watches over all our concerns, of His power, which supports us when weak and ready to faint, and of His goodness, which receives us into favour, though miserably burdened with sins, in which, finally, we call upon Him to manifest His presence with us in all His attributes. Hence our consciences derive peculiar peace and tranquillity, for when the affliction which oppressed us is represented to the Lord, we feel abundant composure, even from this consideration, that none of our troubles are concealed from Him, whom we know both to possess the greatest readiness and the greatest ability to promote our truest interest. Book 3, Chapter 20, Section 3 To Book 3, Chapter 20, Section 22 But some will say, does he not, without information, know both our troubles and our necessities, so that it may appear unnecessary to solicit him with our prayers, as if he were inattentive or sleeping, till aroused by our voice? But such reasoners advert not to the Lord's end in teaching his people to pray, for he has appointed it not so much for his own sake as for ours. It is his pleasure indeed, as is highly reasonable, that his right be rendered to him by their considering him as the author of all that is desired and found useful by men, and by their acknowledgment of this in their prayers. But the utility of this sacrifice by which he is worshipped returns to us. The greater the confidence, therefore, with which the ancient saints gloried in the divine benefits to themselves and others, with so much the more earnestness were they incited to pray. The single example of Elijah shall suffice, who, though certain of God's design, having already with sufficient authority promised rain to King Ahab, yet anxiously prays between his knees, and sends his servant seven times to look for it, not with an intention to discredit the divine oracle, but under a conviction of his duty to prevent his faith becoming languid and torpid by pouring out his prayers before God. Wherefore, although when we are stupid and insensible of our own miseries, he vigilantly watches and guards us, and sometimes affords us unsolicited succour, yet it highly concerns us assiduously to supplicate him that our heart may be always inflamed with a serious and ardent desire of seeking, loving, and worshipping him, while we accustom ourselves in all our necessities to resort to him as our sheet-anchor. Further, that no desire or wish which we should be ashamed for him to know may enter our minds, when we learn to present our wishes, and so to pour out our whole heart in his presence. Next, that we may prepare to receive his blessings with true gratitude of soul, and even with grateful acknowledgments, being reminded by our praying that they come from his hand. Moreover, that when we have obtained what we sought, the persuasion that he has answered our requests may excite us to more ardent meditations on his goodness, and produce a more joyful welcome of those things which we acknowledge to be the fruits of our prayers. Lastly, that use and experience itself may yield our minds a confirmation of his providence in proportion to our imbecility, while we apprehend that he not only promises never to forsake us, and freely opens a way of access for our addressing him in the very moment of necessity, but that his hand is always extended to assist his people, whom he does not feed with mere words, but supports with present aid. On these accounts our most merciful Father, though liable to no sleep or languor, yet frequently appears as if he were sleepy or languid, in order to exercise us, who are otherwise slothful and inactive." in approaching, supplicating, and earnestly importuning him to our own advantage. It is extremely absurd, therefore, in them who, with a view to divert the minds of men from praying to God, pretend that it is useless for us, by our interruptions, to weary the divine providence, which is engaged in the conservation of all things, whereas the Lord declares, on the contrary, that he is nigh to all that call upon him in truth." and equally nugatory is the objection of others that it is superfluous to petition for those things which the Lord is ready voluntarily to bestow, whereas even those very things which flow to us from his spontaneous liberality he wishes us to consider as granted to our prayers. 
this is evinced by that memorable passage in the psalms as well as by many other correspondent texts the eyes of the lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry which celebrates the divine providence as spontaneously engaged to accomplish the salvation of believers yet does not omit the exercise of faith by which sloth is expelled from the minds of men the eyes of god then are vigilant to succour the necessity of the blind but he is likewise willing to hear our groans to give a better proof of his love towards us and thus it is equally true that he that keepeth israel neither slumbers nor sleeps and yet that he remains as it were forgetful of us while he beholds us slothful and dumb now for conducting prayer in a right and proper manner the first rule is that our heart and mind be composed to a suitable frame becoming those who enter into conversation with god this state of mind we shall certainly attain if divested of all carnal cares and thoughts that tend to divert and seduce it from a right and clear view of god it not only devotes itself entirely to the solemn exercise but is likewise as far as possible elevated and carried above itself nor do i here require a mind so disengaged as to be disturbed by no solicitude since there ought on the contrary most anxiously to be kindled within us a fervency of prayer as we see the holy servants of god discover great solicitude and even anguish when they say they utter their complaints to the lord from the deep abysses of affliction and the very jaws of death but i maintain the necessity of dismissing all foreign and external cares by which the wandering mind may be hurried hither and thither and dragged from heaven down to earth it ought to be elevated above itself that it may not intrude into the divine presence any of the imaginations of our blind and foolish reason nor confine itself within the limits of its own vanity but rise to purity worthy of god both these things are highly worthy of observation first that whoever engages in prayer should apply all his faculties and attention to it and not be distracted as is commonly the case with wandering thoughts nothing being more contrary to a reverence for god than such levity which indicates a licentious spirit wholly unrestrained by fear in this case our exertions must be great in proportion to the difficulty we experience for no man can be so intent on praying but he may perceive many irregular thoughts intruding on him and either interrupting or by some oblique digression retarding the course of his devotions but here let us consider what an indignity it is when god admits us to familiar intercourse with him to abuse such great condescension by a mixture of things sacred and profane while our thoughts are not confined to him by reverential awe but as if we were conversing with a mean mortal we quit him in the midst of our prayer and make excursions on every side we may be assured therefore that none are rightly prepared for the exercise of prayer but those who are so affected by the divine majesty as to come to it divested of all earthly cares and affections and this is indicated by the ceremony of lifting up the hands that men may remember that they are at a great distance from god unless they lift up their thoughts on high as it is also expressed in the psalm unto thee do i lift up my soul and the scripture frequently uses this mode of expression to lift up one's prayer that they who desire to be heard by god may not sink into lethargic inactivity to sum up the whole the greater the liberality of god towards us in gently inviting us to disburden ourselves of our cares by casting them upon him the less excusable are we unless his signal and incomparable favour preponderate with us beyond everything else and attract us to him in a serious application of all our faculties and attention to the duty of prayer which cannot be done unless our mind by strenuous exertion rise superior to every impediment our second proposition is that we must pray for no more than god permits for though he enjoins us to pour out our hearts before him yet he does not carelessly give the reins to affections of folly and depravity when he promises to fulfil the desire of believers he does not go to such an extreme of indulgence as to subject himself to their caprice but offences against both these rules are common and great for most men not only presume without modesty or reverence to address god concerning their follies and impudently to utter at his tribunal whatever has amused them in their reveries or dreams but so great is their folly or stupidity that they dare to obtrude upon god all their foulest desires which they would be exceedingly ashamed to reveal to men some heathens have ridiculed and even detested this presumption but the vice itself has always prevailed and hence it was that the ambitious 
chose Jupiter as their patron, the avaricious Mercury, the lovers of learning Apollo and Minerva, the warlike Mars, and the libidinous Venus, just as in the present age, as I have lately hinted, men indulge a greater license to their unlawful desires in their prayers than if they were conversing in a jocular manner with their equals. God suffers not his indulgence to be so mocked, but asserts his power, and subjects our devotions to his commands. Therefore we ought to remember this passage in John. This is the confidence that we have in him, that, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. But as our abilities are very unequal to such great perfection, we must seek some remedy to relieve us. As the attention of the mind ought to be fixed on God, so it is necessary that it should be followed by the affection of the heart. But they both remain far below this elevation, or rather, to speak more consistently with truth, they grow weary and fail in the ascent, or are carried a contrary course. Therefore, to assist this imbecility, God gives us the Spirit to be the director of our prayers, to suggest what is right and to regulate our affections. For the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Not that he really prays or groans, but he excites within us confidence, desires, and sighs, to the conception of which our native powers were altogether inadequate. Nor is it without reason that Paul terms those groanings, which arise from believers under the influence of the Spirit, unutterable, because they who are truly engaged in prayers are not ignorant that they are so perplexed with dubious anxieties that they can scarcely decide what it is expedient to utter, and even while they are attempting to lisp, they stammer and hesitate, whence it follows that the ability of praying rightly is a peculiar gift. These things are not said in order that we may indulge our own indolence, resigning the office of prayer to the Spirit of God, and growing torpid in that negligence to which we are too prone, according to the impious errors of some, that we should wait in indolent supineness, till he call our minds from other engagements and draw them to himself, but rather that, wearied with our sloth and inactivity, we may implore such assistance of the Spirit. Nor does the Apostle, when he exhorts us to pray in the Holy Ghost, encourage us to remit our vigilance, signifying that the inspiration of the Spirit operates in the formation of our prayers, so as not in the least to impede or retard our own exertions, since it is the will of God to prove, in this instance, the efficacious influence of faith on our hearts. Let this be the second rule, that in our supplications we should have a real and permanent sense of our indigence, and seriously considering our necessity of all that we ask, should join with the petitions themselves a serious and ardent desire of obtaining them. For multitudes carelessly recite a form of prayer, as though they were discharging a task imposed on them by God, and though they confess that this is a remedy necessary for their calamities, since it would be certain destruction to be destitute of the divine aid which they implore. Yet that they perform this duty merely in compliance with custom is evident from the coldness of their hearts, and their inattention to the nature of their petitions." They are led to this by some general and confused sense of their necessity, which nevertheless does not excite them to implore a relief for their great need as a case of present urgency. Now what can we imagine more odious or execrable to God than this hypocrisy when any man prays for the pardon of his sins, who at the same time thinks he is not a sinner, or at least does not think that he is a sinner, which is an open mockery of God himself? But such depravity, as I have before observed, pervades the whole human race, that, as a matter of form, they frequently implore of God many things which they either expect to receive from some other source independent of his goodness, or imagine themselves already to possess. The crime of some others appears to be smaller, but yet too great to be tolerated, who, having only imbibed this principle that God must be propitiated by devotions, mutter over their prayers without meditation, but believers ought to be exceedingly cautious never to enter into the presence of God to present any petition without being inflamed with a fervent affection of soul and feeling an ardent desire to obtain it from him. Moreover, although in those things which we request only for the divine glory we do not at the first glance appear to regard our own necessity, yet it is incumbent on us to pray for them with equal fervour and vehemence of desire, as when we pray that his name may be hallowed or sanctified, 
we ought, so to speak, ardently to hunger and thirst for that sanctification. If any man object that we are not always urged to pray by the same necessity, this I grant, and this distinction is usefully represented to us by James. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Common sense itself therefore dictates that because of our extreme indolence, we are the more vigorously stimulated by God to earnestness in prayer according to the exigencies of our condition. And this David calls a time when God may be found, because, as he teaches in many other places, the more severely we are oppressed by troubles, disasters, fears, and other kinds of temptations, we have the greater liberty of access to God, as though he then particularly invited us to approach him. At the same time, it is equally true that we ought to be, as Paul says, praying always, because, how great soever we may believe the prosperity of our affairs, and though we are surrounded on every side by matter of joy, yet there is no moment of time in which our necessity does not furnish incitements to prayer. Does any one abound in wine and corn? Since he cannot enjoy a morsel of bread but by the continual favour of God, his cellars or barns afford no objection to his praying for daily bread. Now, if we reflect how many dangers threaten us at every moment, fear itself will teach us that there is no time in which prayer is unsuitable to us. Yet this may be discovered still better in spiritual concerns. For when will so many sins, of which we are conscious, suffer us to remain in security, without humbly deprecating both the guilt and the punishment? When will temptations grant us a truce, so that we need not be in haste to obtain assistance? Besides, an ardent desire of the divine kingdom and glory ought irresistibly to attract us, not by intervals, but without intermission, rendering every season equally suitable. It is not in vain, therefore, that assiduity in prayer is so frequently enjoined. I speak not yet of perseverance, which shall be mentioned hereafter, but these scriptural admonitions to pray without ceasing are so many reproofs of our sloth, because we feel not our need of this care and diligence. This rule precludes and banishes from prayer hypocrisy, subtlety, and falsehood. God promises that he will be near to all who call upon him in truth, and declares he will be found by those who seek him with their whole heart. But to this persons pleased with their own impurity never aspire. Legitimate prayer, therefore, requires repentance. Whence it is frequently said in the Scriptures that God hears not the wicked, and that their prayers are an abomination, as are also their sacrifices, for it is reasonable that they who shut up their own hearts should find the ears of God closed against them, and God should be inflexible to them who provoke his rigour by their obduracy. In Isaiah he threatens thus, When ye make many prayers, I will not hear, your hands are full of blood. Again to Jeremiah, I protested, yet they inclined not their ear, therefore, though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Because he considers himself grossly insulted by the wicked boasting of his covenant, while they are continually dishonouring his sacred name. Wherefore he complains in Isaiah, this people draw near me with their mouth, but have removed their heart far from me. He does not restrict this solely to prayer, but asserts his abhorrence of hypocrisy in every branch of his worship which is the meaning of this passage in James, you ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. It is true indeed, as we shall presently again see, that the prayers of the faithful depend not on their personal worthiness, yet this does not supersede the admonition of John. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, because an evil conscience shuts the gate against us. Whence it follows that none pray aright, and that no others are heard but the sincere worshippers of God. Whosoever, therefore, engages in prayer, should be displeased with himself on account of his sins, and assume, what he cannot do without repentance, the character and disposition of a beggar. To these must be added a third rule, that whoever presents himself before God, for the purpose of praying to him, must renounce every idea of his own glory, reject all opinion of his own merit, and in a word relinquish all confidence in himself, giving, by this humiliation of himself, all the glory entirely to God, lest, arrogating anything, though ever so little, to ourselves, we perish from his presence in consequence of our vanity. Of this submission, which prostrates every high thought, we have frequent examples in the servants of God, of whom the most eminent for holiness feel the greatest consternation on entering into the presence of the Lord. 
Thus Daniel, whom the Lord himself has so highly commended, said, We do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hearken and do, defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Nor does he, as is generally the case, confound himself with the multitude as one of the people, but makes a separate confession of his own guilt, resorting as a suppliant to the asylum of pardon, as he expressly declares, whilst I was confessing my sin and the sin of my people. We are taught the same humility also by the example of David. Enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. In this manner Isaiah prays, Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned, in thy ways is continuance, and we shall be saved, for we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away, and there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Be not wroth very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity for ever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Observe they have no dependence but this, that considering themselves as God's children, they despair not of his future care of them. Thus Jeremiah, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake, for that is equally consistent with the strictest truth and holiness which was written by an uncertain author but is ascribed to the prophet baruch a soul sorrowful and desolate for the greatness of its sin bowed down and infirm a hungry soul and fainting eyes give glory to thee o lord not according to the righteousnesses of our fathers do we pour out our prayers in thy sight and ask mercy before thy face o lord our god but because thou art merciful have mercy upon us for we have sinned against thee Finally, the commencement and even introduction to praying rightly is a supplication for pardon with an humble and ingenuous confession of guilt. For neither is there any hope that even the holiest of men can obtain any blessing of God till he be freely reconciled to him, nor is it possible for God to be propitious to any but those whom he pardons. It is no wonder, then, if believers with this key open to themselves the gate of prayer, as we learn from many places in the Psalms, for David, when requesting another thing, says, Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness' sake, O Lord. Again, look upon mine affliction and my pain, and forgive all my sins. Where we likewise perceive that it is not sufficient for us to call ourselves to a daily account for recent sins, unless we remember those which might seem to have been long buried in oblivion. For the same psalmist in another place, having confessed one grievous crime, takes occasion thence to revert to his mother's womb, where he had contracted his original pollution, not in order to extenuate his guilt by the corruption of his nature, but that, accumulating all the sins of his life, he may find God the more ready to listen to his prayers in proportion to the severity of his self-condemnation. But though the saints do not always, in express terms, pray for remission of sins, yet if we diligently examine their prayers recited in the Scriptures, it will easily appear, as I assert, that they derived their encouragement to pray from the mere mercy of God, and so always began by deprecating his displeasure. For if every man examine his own conscience, he is so far from presuming familiarly to communicate his cares to God, that he trembles at every approach to him, except in a reliance on his mercy and forgiveness. There is also indeed another special confession when they wish for an alleviation of punishments, which is tacitly praying for the pardon of their sins, because it were absurd to desire the removal of an effect while the cause remains. For we must beware of imitating foolish patients, who are only solicitous for the cure of the symptoms, but neglect the radical cause of the disease. Besides, we should first seek for God to be propitious to us, previously to any external testimonies of his favour, because it is his own will to observe this order, and it would be of little advantage to us to receive benefits from him, unless a discovery to the conscience of his being appeased towards us rendered him altogether amiable in our view. Of this we are likewise apprised by the reply of Christ, for when he had determined to heal a paralytic person, he said, Thy sins be forgiven thee thereby calling our attention to that which ought to be the chief object of desire, 
that God may receive us into his favour, and then, by affording us assistance, discover the effect of reconciliation. But beside the special confession of present guilt, in which believers implore the pardon of every sin and the remission of every punishment, that general preface which conciliates a favourable attention to our prayers is never to be omitted, because, unless they be founded on God's free mercy, they will all be unavailing. To this topic we may refer that passage of John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wherefore, under the law, prayers are required to be consecrated by an atonement of blood, to render them acceptable, and to remind the people that they were unworthy of so great and honourable a privilege, till, purified from their pollutions, they should derive confidence in prayer from the mere mercy of God. But when the saints sometimes appear to urge their own righteousness as an argument in their supplications with God, as when David says, Preserve my soul, for I am holy, and Hezekiah, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth, and have done that which is good in thy sight. Their only design in such modes of expression is, from their regeneration, to prove themselves to be servants and sons of God, to whom he declares he will be propitious. He tells us by the psalmist, as we have already seen, that his eyes are upon the righteous, and that his ears are open unto their cry. And again by the apostle, that whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, in which passages he does not determine the value of prayer according to the merit of works, but intends by them to establish the confidence of those who are conscious to themselves, as all believers ought to be, of unfeigned integrity and innocence. For the observation in John made by the blind man who received his sight, that God heareth not sinners, is a principle of divine truth, if we understand the word sinners in the common acceptation of Scripture, to signify those who are all asleep and content in their sins without any desire of righteousness, since no heart can ever break out into a sincere invocation of God, unaccompanied with aspirations after piety. To such promises, therefore, correspond those declarations of the saints, in which they introduce the mention of their own purity or innocence, that they may experience a manifestation to themselves of what is to be expected by all the servants of God. Besides, they are generally found in the use of this species of prayer, when before the Lord they compare themselves with their enemies, from whose iniquity they desire him to deliver them. Now in this comparison we need not wonder if they produce their righteousness and simplicity of heart, in order to prevail upon him by the justice of their cause, to yield the more ready assistance. We object not, therefore, to the pious heart of a good man making use before the Lord of the consciousness of his own purity, for his confirmation in the promises which the Lord has given for the consolation and support of his true worshippers. But his confidence of success we wish to be independent of every consideration of personal merit, and to rest solely on the divine clemency. The fourth and last rule is that thus prostrate with true humility we should nevertheless be animated to pray by the certain hope of obtaining our requests. It is indeed an apparent contradiction to connect a certain confidence of God's favour with a sense of his righteous vengeance, though these two things are perfectly consistent, if persons oppressed by their own guilt be encouraged solely by the divine goodness. For as we have before stated, that repentance and faith of which one terrifies and the other exhilarates are inseparably connected, so their union is necessary in prayer. And this agreement is briefly expressed by David. I will come, says he, into thy house, in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Under the goodness of God he comprehends faith, though not to the exclusion of fear, for his majesty not only commands our reverence, but our own unworthiness makes us forget all pride and security, and fills us with fear. I do not mean a confidence which delivers the mind from all sense of anxiety, and soothes it into pleasant and perfect tranquillity, for such a placid satisfaction belongs to those whose prosperity is equal to their wishes, who are affected by no care, corroded by no desire, and alarmed by no fear. And the saints have an equal stimulus to calling upon God when their necessities and perplexities harass and disquiet them, and they are almost despairing in themselves, till faith opportunely relieves them because, amidst such troubles, the goodness of God is so glorious in their view, that, though they groan under the pressure of present calamities, and are likewise tormented with the fear of greater in the future, yet a reliance on it alleviates the difficulty of bearing them, and encourages a hope of deliverance. The prayers of a pious man, therefore, must proceed from both these dispositions, and must also contain and discover them both, 
though he must groan under present evils and is anxiously afraid of new ones yet at the same time he must resort for refuge to god not doubting his readiness to extend the assistance of his hand for god is highly incensed by our distrust if we supplicate him for blessings which we have no expectation of receiving there is nothing therefore more suitable to the nature of prayers than that they be conformed to this rule not to rush forward with temerity but to follow the steps of faith to this principle christ calls the attention of us all in the following passage i say unto you what things soever ye desire when ye pray believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them this he confirms also in another place whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer believing ye shall receive with which james agrees if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of god that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not but let him ask in faith nothing wavering where by opposing faith to wavering he very aptly expresses its nature and equally worthy of attention is what he adds that they avail nothing who call upon god in perplexity and doubt and are uncertain in their minds whether they shall be heard or not whom he even compares to waves which are variously tossed and driven about with the wind whence he elsewhere calls a legitimate prayer the prayer of faith besides when god so frequently affirms that he will give to every man according to his faith he implies that we can obtain nothing without faith finally it is faith that obtains whatever is granted in answer to prayer this is the meaning of that famous passage of paul to which injudicious men pay little attention how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god for by a regular deduction of prayer originally from faith he evidently contends that god cannot be sincerely invoked by any but those to whom his clemency and gentleness have been revealed and familiarly discovered by the preaching of the gospel this necessity our adversaries never considered therefore when we inculcate on believers a certain confidence of mind that god is propitious and benevolent towards them they consider us as advancing the greatest of all absurdities but if they were in the habit of true prayer they would certainly understand that there can be no proper invocation of god without a strong sense of the divine benevolence but since no man can fully discover the power of faith without an experience of it in his heart what advantage can arise from disputing with such men who plainly prove that they never had any other than a vain imagination for the value and necessity of that assurance which we require is chiefly learned by prayer and he who does not perceive this betrays great stupidity of conscience leaving then this class of blinded mortals let us ever abide by the decision of paul that god cannot be called upon but by those who receive from the gospel a knowledge of his mercy and a certain persuasion that it is prepared for them for what kind of an address would this be o lord i am truly in doubt whether thou be willing to hear me but since i am oppressed with anxiety i flee to thee that if i be worthy thou mayest assist me this does not resemble the solicitude of the saints whose prayers we read in the scriptures nor is it agreeable to the teaching of the holy spirit by the apostle who commands us to come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and informs us that we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of christ this assurance of obtaining what we implore therefore which is both commanded by the lord himself and taught by the example of the saints it becomes us to hold fast with all our might if we would pray to any good purpose for that prayer alone is accepted by god which arises if i may use the expression from such a presumption of faith and is founded on an undaunted assurance of hope he might indeed have contented himself with the simple mention of faith yet he has not only added confidence but furnished that confidence with liberty or boldness to distinguish by this criterion between us and unbelievers who do indeed pray to god in common with us but entirely at an uncertainty for which reason the whole church prays in the psalm let thy mercy o lord be upon us according as we hope in thee the psalmist elsewhere introduces the same idea this i know for god is for me again in the morning will i direct my prayer unto thee and will look up for from these words we gather that prayers are but empty sounds if unattended by hope from which as from a watch-tower we quietly look out for god with which corresponds the order of paul's exhortation for before exhorting believers to pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit 
he first directs them to take the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now let the reader recollect what I have before asserted, that faith is not at all weakened by being connected with an acknowledgment of our misery, poverty, and impurity, for believers feel themselves oppressed by a grievous load of sins, while destitute of everything which could conciliate the favour of God, and burdened with much guilt, which might justly render him an object of their dread, yet they cease not to present themselves before him, nor does this experience terrify them from resorting to him, since there is no other way of access to him. For prayer was instituted, not that we might arrogantly exalt ourselves in the presence of God, or form a high opinion of anything of our own, but that we might confess our guilt to him, and deplore our miseries with the familiarity of children confiding their complaints to their parents. The immense accumulation of our distresses should operate as so many incitements to urge us to pray, as we are taught likewise by the example of the psalmist, Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. I confess indeed that the operation of such incentives would be fatal were it not for the divine aid, but our most benevolent Father, in his incomparable mercy, has afforded a timely reminder that allaying all perturbation, alleviating all our cares, and dispelling all fears, he might gently allure us to himself and facilitate our approach to him by the removal of every obstacle and every doubt. And in the first place, when he enjoins us to pray, the commandment itself implies a charge of impious contumacy if we disobey it. No command can be more precise than that in the psalm, call upon me in the day of trouble. But as the scripture recommends no one of the duties of piety more frequently, it is unnecessary to dwell any longer upon it. Ask, says our Lord, and it shall be given you. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. To this precept, however, there is also annexed a promise, which is very necessary, for though all men acknowledge obedience to be due to a precept, yet the greater part of them would neglect the calls of God, if he did not promise to be propitious to them, and even to advance to meet them. These two positions being proved, it is evident that all those who turn their backs on God, or do not directly approach him, are not only guilty of disobedience and rebellion, but also convicted of unbelief, because they distrust the promises which is the more worthy of observation, since hypocrites, under the pretext of humility and modesty, treat the command of God with such haughty contempt as to give no credit to his kind invitation, and even defraud him of a principal part of his worship. For, after having refused sacrifices in which all holiness then appeared to consist, he declared the principal and most acceptable part of his service to be calling upon him in the day of trouble. Wherefore, when he requires what is due to him, and animates us to a cheerful obedience, there are no pretexts for diffidence or hesitation sufficiently specious to excuse us. The numerous texts of Scripture, therefore, which enjoin us to call upon God, are as so many banners placed before our eyes to inspire us with confidence. It were temerity to rush into the presence of God without a previous invitation from Him. He therefore opens a way for us by His own word. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. We see how he leads his worshippers and desires them to follow him, and therefore that there is no reason to fear lest the melody which he dictates should not be agreeable to him. Let us particularly remember this remarkable character of God by a reliance on which we shall easily surmount every obstacle. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. For what is more amiable or attractive than for God to bear this character, which assures us that nothing is more agreeable to his nature than to grant the requests of humble suppliants? Hence the psalmist concludes that the way is open, not to a few only, but to all men, because he addresses all in these words, Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. According to this rule, David, in order to obtain his request, pleads the promise that had been given him. Thou, O Lord, hast revealed to thy servant, therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray. Whence we conclude that he would have been fearful had he not been encouraged by the promise. So in another place he furnishes himself with this general doctrine, he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. In the Psalms we may likewise observe the connection of prayer, as it were interrupted, and sudden transitions made, sometimes to the power of God, sometimes to his goodness, and sometimes to the truth of his promises. It might appear as though David mutilated his prayers by an unseasonable introduction of such passages, but believers know by experience that the ardour of devotion languishes unless it be supported by fresh supplies, and therefore a meditation on the nature and the word of God 
is far from being useless in the midst of our prayers. Let us not hesitate, then, to follow the example of David in the introduction of topics calculated to reanimate languid souls with new vigour. And it is wonderful that we are no more affected with promises so exceedingly sweet that the generality of men, wandering through a labyrinth of errors after having forsaken the fountain of living waters, prefer hewing out for themselves cisterns incapable of containing any water to embracing the free offers of divine goodness. The name of the Lord, says Solomon, is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. And Joel, after having predicted the speedy approach of a dreadful destruction, adds this memorable sentence, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, which we know properly refers to the cause of the gospel. Scarcely one man in a hundred is induced to advance to meet the Lord. He proclaims by Isaiah, Before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. And in another place he dignifies the whole church in general with the same honour, as it belongs to all the members of Christ. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him. As I have before said, however, my design is not to enumerate all the texts, but to select the most remarkable, from which we may perceive the condescending kindness of God in inviting us to him, and the circumstances of aggravation attending our ingratitude, while our indolence still lingers in the midst of such powerful incitements. Wherefore let these words perpetually resound in our ears, The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth as well as those which we have cited from Isaiah and Joel, in which God affirms that he is inclined to hear prayers, and is delighted, as with a sacrifice of a sweet savour, when we cast our cares upon him. We derive this singular benefit from the divine promises, when our prayers are conceived without doubt or trepidation, but, in reliance on his word, whose majesty would otherwise terrify us, we venture to call upon him as our father, because he deigns to suggest to us this most delightful appellation, Favoured with such invitations, it remains for us to know that they furnish us with sufficient arguments to enforce our petitions, since our prayers rest on no intrinsic merit, but all their worthiness, as well as all our hope of obtaining our requests, is founded in and dependent on the divine promises, so that there is no need of any other support or further anxiety. Therefore we may be fully assured that though we equal not the sanctity so celebrated in holy patriarchs, prophets, and apostles, Yet, since the command to pray is common to us as well as to them, and we are partakers of the same common faith, if we rely on the divine word, we are associated with them in this privilege. For God's declaration, already noticed, that he will be gentle and merciful to all, gives all, even the most miserable, a hope of obtaining the objects of their supplications, and therefore we should remark the general forms of expression by which no man from the greatest to the least is excluded." Only let him possess sincerity of heart, self-abhorrence, humility and faith, and let not our hypocrisy profane the name of God by a pretended invocation of him. Our most merciful Father will not reject those whom he exhorts to approach him, and even urges by every possible mode of solicitation. Hence the argument of David's prayer, just recited, Thou, O Lord, hast revealed to thy servant, therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. And now, O Lord God, Thou art that God, and thy words be true, and thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Begin, therefore, and do it. As also in another place, let thy kindness be according to thy word unto thy servant. And all the Israelites together, whenever they fortify themselves with a recollection of the covenant, sufficiently declare that fear ought to be banished from our devotions, because it is contrary to the divine injunction, and in this respect they imitated the examples of the patriarchs, particularly of Jacob, who, after having confessed himself not worthy of the least of all the mercies he had received from the hand of God, yet declares himself animated to pray for still greater blessings because God had promised to grant them. But whatever be the pretenses of unbelievers, for not applying to God under the pressure of every necessity, for not seeking him or imploring his aid, they are equally chargeable with defrauding him of the honour due to him, as if they had fabricated for themselves new gods and idols, for by this conduct they deny him to be the author of all their blessings. On the contrary, there is nothing more efficacious to deliver believers from every scruple than this consideration, that no impediment ought to prevent their acting according to the command of God, who declares that nothing is more agreeable to him than obedience. These observations tend more fully to elucidate what I have advanced before, 
that a spirit of boldness in prayer is perfectly consistent with fear, reverence, and solicitude, and that there is no absurdity in God's exalting those that are abased. This establishes an excellent agreement between those apparently repugnant forms of expression. Both Jeremiah and Daniel use this phrase, make prayers fall before God, for so it is in the original. Jeremiah also, let our supplication fall before thee. Again, believers are frequently said to lift up their prayer. So says Hezekiah when requesting the prophet to intercede for him. And David desires that his prayer may ascend as incense. For though, under a persuasion of God's fatherly love, they cheerfully commit themselves to his faithfulness, and hesitate not to implore the assistance he freely promises, yet they are not impudently elated with careless security, but ascend upwards by the steps of the promises, yet in such a manner that they still continue to be suppliant and self-abased. Here several questions are started. The scripture relates that the Lord has complied with some prayers which nevertheless did not arise from a calm or well-regulated heart. Jotham, for a just cause indeed, but from the impulse of rage, resentment, and revenge, devoted the inhabitants of Shechem to the destruction which afterwards fell upon them. The Lord, by fulfilling this curse, seems to approve of such disorderly sallies of passion. Samson also was hurried away by similar fervour when he said, O Lord, strengthen me, that I may be avenged of the Philistines. For, though there was some mixture of honest zeal, yet it was a violent and therefore a sinful avidity of revenge which predominated. God granted the request. Whence it seems deducible that prayers not conformable to the rules of the divine word are nevertheless efficacious. I reply first that a permanent rule is not annulled by particular examples, Secondly, that particular emotions have sometimes been excited in a few individuals, causing a distinction between them and men in general. For the answer of Christ to his disciples, who inconsiderably wished to emulate the example of Elias, that they knew not what spirit they were of, is worthy of observation. But we must remark further that God is not always pleased with the prayers which he grants, but that, as far as examples are concerned, there are undeniable evidences of the scripture doctrine that he succours the miserable and hears the groans of those who under the pressure of injustice implore his aid, that he therefore executes his judgments when the complaints of the poor arise to him, though they are unworthy of the least favourable attention. For how often, by punishing the cruelty, rapine, violence, lust, and other crimes of the impious, by restraining their audacity and fury, and even subverting their tyrannical power, has he manifestly assisted the victims of unrighteous oppression, though they have been beating the air with supplications to an unknown God. And one of the psalmists clearly teaches that some prayers are not ineffectual, which nevertheless do not penetrate into heaven by faith, for he collects those prayers which necessity naturally extorts from unbelievers, as well as from believers, but to which the event shows God to be propitious. Does he by such condescension testify that they are acceptable to him, no, he designs to amplify or illustrate his mercy by this circumstance, that even the requests of unbelievers are not refused, and likewise to stimulate his true worshippers to greater diligence in prayer, while they see that even the lamentations of the profane are not unattended with advantage. Yet there is no reason why believers should deviate from the rule given them by God, or envy unbelievers, as though they had made some great acquisition when they have obtained the object of their wishes." In this manner we have said that the Lord was moved by the hypocritical penitence of Ahab in order to prove by this example how ready he is to grant the prayers of his own elect when they seek reconciliation with him by true conversion. Therefore in the Psalms he expostulates with the Jews because, after having experienced his propitiousness to their prayers, they had almost immediately returned to their native perverseness. It is evident also from the history of the judges that whenever they wept, Though their tears were hypocritical, yet they were delivered from the hands of their enemies. As the Lord therefore maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, promiscuously, so he despises not the lamentations of those whose cause is just, and whose afflictions deserve relief. At the same time his attention to them is not more connected with salvation than his furnishing food to the despisers of his goodness. The question relative to Abraham and Samuel is attended with more difficulty the former of whom prayed for the inhabitants of Sodom without any divine direction, and the latter for Saul, even contrary to a plain prohibition. 
the same is the case of jeremiah who deprecated the destruction of the city for though they suffered a repulse yet it seems harsh to deny them to have been under the influence of faith but the modest reader will i hope be satisfied with this solution that mindful of the general principles by which god enjoins them to be merciful even to the unworthy they were not entirely destitute of faith though in a particular instance their opinion may have disappointed them augustine has somewhere this judicious observation quote, how do the saints pray in faith when they implore of god that which is contrary to his decrees it is because they pray according to his will not that hidden and immutable will but that with which he inspires them that he may hear them in a different way as he wisely discriminates end quote. this is an excellent remark because according to his incomprehensible designs he so regulates the events of things that the prayers of the saints which contain a mixture of faith and error are not in vain yet this no more affords an example for imitation than a sufficient plea to excuse the saints themselves whom i admit to have transgressed the bounds of duty wherefore when no certain promise can be found we should present our supplications to god in a conditional way which is implied in this petition of david awake to the judgment that thou hast commanded because he suggests that he was directed by a particular revelation to pray for a temporal blessing it will also be of use to remark that the things i have delivered concerning the four rules for praying aright are not required by god with such extreme rigour as to cause the rejection of all prayers in which he does not find a perfection of faith or repentance united with ardent zeal and well-regulated desires we have said that although prayer is a familiar intercourse between god and pious men yet reverence and modesty must be preserved that we may not give a loose to all our wishes nor even in our desires exceed the divine permission and to prevent the majesty of god being lessened in our view our minds must be raised to a pure and holy veneration of him this no man has ever performed with the purity required for to say nothing of the multitude how many complaints of david savour of intemperance of spirit not that he would designedly remonstrate with god or murmur at his judgments but he faints in consequence of his infirmity and finds no better consolation than to pour his sorrows into the divine bosom moreover god bears with our lisping and pardons our ignorance whenever any inconsiderate expressions escape us and certainly without this indulgence there could be no freedom of prayer but though it was david's intention to submit himself wholly to the divine will and his patience in prayer was equal to his desire of obtaining his requests yet we sometimes perceive the appearance and ebullition of turbulent passions very inconsistent with the first rule we have laid down we may discover particularly from the conclusion of the thirty-ninth psalm with what vehemence of grief this holy man was hurried away beyond all the bounds of propriety oh spare me says he before i go hence and be no more one might be ready to say that the man being in despair desires nothing but the removal of god's hand that he may putrefy in his own iniquities and miseries he does not intend to rush into intemperance of language or as is usual with the reprobate desire god to depart from him he only complains that he cannot bear the divine wrath in these temptations also the saints often drop petitions not sufficiently conformable to the rule of god's word and without due reflection on what is right and proper all prayers polluted with these blemishes deserve to be rejected yet if the saints mourn correct themselves and return to themselves again god forgives them thus they offend likewise against the second rule because they frequently have to contend with their own indifference nor do their poverty and misery sufficiently incite them to seriousness of devotion now their minds frequently wander and are almost absorbed in vanity and they also need pardon in this respect lest languid or mutilated or interrupted and desultory prayers should meet with a repulse god has naturally impressed the minds of men with a conviction that prayers require to be attended with an elevation of heart hence the ceremony of elevating the hands as before observed which has been common in all ages and nations and still continues but where is the person who while lifting up the hands is not conscious of dullness because his heart cleaves to the earth as to praying for the remission of sins though none of the faithful omit this article yet they who have been truly engaged in prayers perceive that they scarcely offer the tenth part of the sacrifices mentioned by david the sacrifices of god are a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart o god thou wilt not despise 
thus they have always to pray for a twofold forgiveness both because they are conscious of many transgressions with which they are not so deeply affected as to be sufficiently displeased with themselves and as they are enabled to advance in repentance and the fear of god humbled with a just sorrow for their offences they deprecate the vengeance of the judge but above all the weakness or imperfection of their faith would vitiate the prayers of believers were it not for the divine indulgence but we need not wonder that this defect is forgiven by god who frequently exercises his children with severe discipline as if he fully designed to annihilate their faith it is a very sharp temptation when believers are constrained to cry how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people as though even their prayers were so many provocations of divine wrath so when jeremiah says god shutteth out my prayer he was undoubtedly agitated with severe trouble innumerable examples of this kind occur in the scriptures from which it appears that the faith of the saints is often mingled and agitated with doubts so that amidst the exercises of faith and hope they nevertheless betray some remains of unbelief but since they cannot attain all that is to be wished it becomes them to be increasingly diligent in order that correcting their faults they may daily make nearer approaches to the perfect rule of prayer and at the same time to consider into what an abyss of evils they must have been plunged who even in their very remedies contract new diseases since there is no prayer which god would not justly disdain if he did not overlook the blemishes with which they are all deformed i mention these things not that believers may securely forgive themselves anything sinful but that by severely correcting themselves they may strive to surmount these obstacles and that notwithstanding the endeavours of satan to obstruct them in all their ways with a view to prevent them from praying they may nevertheless break through all opposition certainly persuaded that though they experience many impediments yet god is pleased with their efforts and approves of their prayers provided they strenuously aim at that which they do not immediately attain but since there is no one of the human race worthy to present himself to god and to enter into his presence our heavenly father himself to deliver us at once from shame and fear which might justly depress all our minds has given us his son jesus christ our lord to be our advocate and mediator with him introduced by whom we may boldly approach him confident with such an intercessor that nothing we ask in his name will be denied us as nothing can be denied to him by his father and to this must be referred all that we have hitherto advanced concerning faith because as the promise recommends christ to us as the mediator so unless our hope of success depend on him it deprives itself of all the benefit of prayer for as soon as we reflect on the terrible majesty of god we cannot but be exceedingly afraid and driven away from him by a consciousness of our unworthiness till we discover christ as the mediator who changes the throne of dreadful glory into a throne of grace as the apostle also exhorts us to come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need and as there is a rule given for calling upon god as well as a promise that they shall be heard who call upon him so we are particularly enjoined to invoke him in the name of christ and we have an express promise that what we ask in his name we shall obtain hitherto says he ye have asked nothing in my name ask and ye shall receive at that day ye shall ask in my name, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Hence it is plain beyond all controversy that they who call upon God in any other name than that of Christ are guilty of a contumacious neglect of his precepts, and a total disregard of his will, and that they have no promise of any success. For, as Paul says of Christ, all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him are men, that is, are confirmed and fulfilled and we must carefully remark the circumstance of the time when christ commands his disciples to apply to his intercession which was to be after his ascension to heaven at that day says he ye shall ask in my name it is certain that from the beginning no prayers had been heard but for the sake of the mediator for this reason the lord had appointed in the law that the priest alone should enter the sanctuary bearing on his shoulders the names of the tribes of israel and the same number of precious stones before his breast but that the people should stand without in the court and there unite their prayers with those of the priest the use of the sacrifice was to render their prayers effectual the meaning therefore of that shadowy ceremony of the law was that we are all banished from the presence of god and therefore need a mediator to appear in our name to bear us on his shoulders and bind us to his breast 
that we may be heard in his person, and moreover that the sprinkling of his blood purifies our prayers, which have been asserted to be otherwise never free from defilement. And we see that the saints, when they wished to obtain anything by prayer, founded their hope on the sacrifices, because they knew them to be the confirmations of all their prayers. David says, The Lord remember all thy offerings, and accept thy burnt sacrifice. Hence we conclude that God has from the beginning been appeased by the intercession of Christ, so as to accept the devotions of believers. Why then does Christ assign a new period when his disciples shall begin to pray in his name, but because this grace, being now become more illustrious, deserves to be more strongly recommended to us? In the same sense he had just before said, Hitherto ye have asked nothing in my name. Ask. Not that they were totally unacquainted with the office of the Mediator, since all the Jews were instructed in these first principles, but because they did not yet clearly understand that Christ, on his ascension to heaven, would be more evidently the advocate of the church than he was before. Therefore, to console their sorrow for his absence with some signal advantage, he claims the character of an advocate and teaches them that they have hitherto wanted the principal benefit which it shall be given them to enjoy when they shall call upon God with greater freedom in a reliance on his intercession, as the Apostle says that this new way is consecrated by his blood. So much the more inexcusable is our perverseness, unless we embrace with the greatest alacrity such an inestimable benefit which is particularly destined for us. Moreover, since he is the only way of access by which we are permitted to approach God, to them who deviate from this road and desert this entrance, there remains no other way of access to God, nor anything on his throne but wrath, judgment, and terror. Finally, since the Father has appointed him to be our head and leader, they, who in any respect decline or turn aside from him, endeavour, as far as they can, to deface and obliterate a character impressed by God. Thus Christ is appointed as the one mediator by whose intercession the Father is rendered propitious and favourable to us. The saints have likewise their intercessions in which they mutually commend each other's interests to God, and which are mentioned by the Apostle. But these are so far from detracting anything from the intercession of Christ that they are entirely dependent on it. For as they arise from the affection of love, reciprocally felt by us towards each other as members of one body, so likewise they are referred to the unity of the head, being made also in the name of Christ, what are they but a declaration that no man can be benefited by any prayers at all, independently of Christ's intercession? And as the intercession of Christ is no objection to our mutually pleading for one another in our prayers in the church, so let it be considered as a certain maxim that all the intercessions of the whole church should be directed to that principal one. We ought to beware of ingratitude particularly on this head, because God, pardoning our unworthiness, not only permits us to pray each one for himself, but even admits us as intercessors for one another. For when those who richly deserve to be rejected, if they should privately pray each for himself, are liberally appointed by God as advocates of his church, what pride would it betray to abuse this liberality to obscure the honour of Christ? Now the cavil of the sophists is quite frivolous that Christ is the mediator of redemption, but believers of intercession, as if Christ, after performing a temporary mediation, had left to his servants that which is eternal and shall never die. They who detract so diminutive a portion of honour from him treat him doubtless very favourably, but the scripture with the simplicity of which a pious man, forsaking these impostors, ought to be contented, speaks very differently. For... When John says, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, does he only mean that he has been heretofore an advocate for us, or does he not rather ascribe to him a perpetual intercession? What is intended by the assertion of Paul that he is even at the right hand of God, and also maketh intercession for us? And when he elsewhere calls him the one mediator between God and man, does he not refer to prayers which he has mentioned just before? For having first asserted that intercessions should be made for all men, he immediately adds, in confirmation of that idea, that all have one God and one mediator. Consistent with which is the explanation of Augustine, when he thus expresses himself, quote, Christian men in their prayers mutually recommend each other to the divine regard. That person for whom no one intercedes, while he intercedes for all, is the true and only mediator. 
the apostle paul though a principal member under the head yet because he was a member of the body of christ and knew the great and true high priest of the church had entered not typically into the recesses within the veil the holy of holies but truly and really into the interior recesses of heaven into a sanctuary not emblematical but eternal paul i say recommends himself to the prayers of believers neither does he make himself a mediator between god and the people but exhorts all the members of the body of christ mutually to pray for one another since the members have a mutual solicitude for each other and if one member suffers the rest sympathize with it and so should the mutual prayers of all the members who are still engaged in the labours of the present state ascend on each other's behalf to the head who is gone before them into heaven and who is the propitiation for our sins for if paul were a mediator the other apostles would likewise sustain the same character and so there would be many mediators and paul's argument could not be supported when he says for there is one god and one mediator between god and men the man christ jesus in whom we also are one if we keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace End quote. again in another place quote, but if you seek a priest he is above the heavens where he now intercedes for you who died for you on earth End quote. yet we do not dream that he intercedes for us in a suppliant prostration at the father's feet but we apprehend with the apostle that he appears in the presence of god for us in such a manner that the virtue of his death avails as a perpetual intercession for us yet so as that being entered into the heavenly sanctuary he continually till the consummation of all things presents to god the prayers of his people who remain as it were at a distance in the court with respect to the saints who are dead in the flesh but live in christ if we attribute any intercession to them let us not imagine that they have any other way of praying to god than by christ who is the only way or that their prayers are accepted by god in any other name therefore since the scripture calls us away from all others to christ alone since it is the will of our heavenly father to gather together all things in him it would be a proof of great stupidity not to say insanity to be so desirous of procuring an admission by the saints as to be seduced from him without whom they have no access themselves but that this has been practised in some ages and is now practised wherever popery prevails who can deny their merits are frequently obtruded to conciliate the divine favour and in general christ is totally neglected and god is addressed through their names is not this transferring to them that office of exclusive intercession which we have before asserted to be peculiar to christ again who either angel or demon ever uttered to any of the human race a syllable concerning such an intercession as they pretend for the scripture is perfectly silent respecting any such thing what reason then was there for its invention certainly when the human mind thus seeks assistances for itself in which it is not warranted by the word of god it evidently betrays its want of faith now if we appeal to the consciences of all the advocates for the intercession of saints we shall find that the only cause of it is an anxiety in their minds as if christ could fail of success or be too severe in this business by which perplexity they in the first place dishonour christ and rob him of the character of the only mediator which as it has been given by the father as his peculiar prerogative ought therefore not to be transferred to any other and by this very conduct they obscure the glory of his nativity and frustrate the benefit of his cross in a word they divest and defraud him of the praise which is due to him for all his actions and all his sufferings since the end of them all is that he may really be and be accounted the sole mediator they at the same time reject the goodness of god who exhibits himself as their father for he is not a father to them unless they acknowledge christ as their brother which they plainly deny unless they believe themselves to be the objects of his fraternal affection than which nothing can be more mild or tender wherefore the scripture offers him alone to us sends us to him and fixes us in him Quote, he says ambrose is our mouth with which we address the father our eye by which we behold the father our right hand by which we present ourselves to the father without whose mediation neither we nor any of the saints have the least intercourse with god End quote. if they reply that the public prayers in the churches are finished by this conclusion through christ our lord it is a frivolous subterfuge because the intercession of christ is not less profaned when it is confounded with the prayers and merits of the dead than if it were wholly omitted and the dead alone mentioned 
besides in all their litanies both verse and prose where every honour is ascribed to dead saints there is no mention of christ but their folly rises to such a pitch that we have here a striking view of the genius of superstition which when it has once shaken off the reins places in general no limits to its excursions for after men had begun to regard the intercession of saints they by degrees gave to each his particular attributes so that sometimes one sometimes another might be invoked as intercessor according to the difference of the cases then they chose each his particular saint to whose protection they committed themselves as to the care of tutelary gods thus they not only set up as the prophet anciently accused israel gods according to the number of their cities but even according to the multitude of persons but since the saints refer all their desires solely to the will of god and observe it and acquiesce in it he must entertain foolish and carnal and even degrading thoughts of them who ascribes to them any other prayer than that in which they pray for the advent of the kingdom of god very remote from which is what they pretend concerning them that every one of them is disposed by a private affection more particularly to regard his own worshippers at length multitudes fell even into horrid sacrilege by invoking them not as subordinate promoters but as principal agents in their salvation see how low wretched mortals fall when they wander from their lawful station the word of god i omit the grosser monstrosities of impiety for which though they render them detestable to god angels and men they do not yet feel either shame or grief prostrate before the statue or picture of barbara catherine and others they mutter pater noster our father this madness the pastors are so far from endeavouring to remedy or to restrain that allured by the charms of lucre they approve and applaud it but though they attempt to remove from themselves the odium of so foul a crime yet what plea will they urge in defence of this that eligius and medardus are supplicated to look down from heaven on their servants and to assist them and the holy virgin to command her son to grant their petitions it was anciently forbidden at the council of carthage that at the altar any prayers should be made directly to the saints and it is probable that when those holy men could not wholly subdue the force of depraved custom they imposed this restraint that the public prayers might not be deformed by this phrase st peter pray for us but to how much greater lengths of diabolical absurdity have they proceeded who hesitate not to transfer to dead men what exclusively belongs to god and christ book three chapter twenty section twenty three to book three chapter twenty section forty four but when they attempt to make this intercession appear to be founded on the authority of scripture they labour in vain we frequently read they say of the prayers of angels and not only so but the prayers of believers are said to be carried by their hands into the presence of god but if they would compare saints deceased to angels they ought to prove that they are the ministering spirits who are delegated to superintend the concerns of our salvation whose province it is to keep us in all our ways who surround us who advise and comfort us who watch over us all of which offices are committed to angels but not to departed saints how preposterously they include dead saints with angels fully appears from so many different functions by which the scripture distinguishes some from others no man will presume without previous permission to act the part of an advocate before an earthly judge whence then have worms so great a license to obtrude on god as intercessors those who are not recorded to have been appointed to that office god has been pleased to appoint the angels to attend to our salvation whence they frequent the sacred assemblies and the church is to them a theatre in which they admire the various and manifold wisdom of god those who transfer to others that which is peculiar to them certainly confound and pervert the order established by god which ought to be inviolable with equal dexterity they proceed to cite other testimonies god said to jeremiah though moses and samuel stood before me yet my mind could not be towards this people how they say could he thus have spoken concerning persons deceased unless he knew that they were accustomed to intercede for the living but i on the contrary deduce this conclusion that since it appears that neither moses nor samuel interceded for the israelites there was then no intercession of the dead for who of the saints must we believe to be concerned for the salvation of the people when this ceases to be the case with moses who far surpassed all others in this respect while alive but if they pursue such minute subtleties that the dead intercede for the living because the lord has said 
though they interceded, I shall argue with far greater plausibility in this manner. In the people's extreme necessity, no intercession was made by Moses, of whom it was said, though he interceded. Therefore it is highly probable that no intercession is made by any other, since they are all so far from possessing the gentleness, kindness, and paternal solicitude of Moses. This is indeed the consequence of their cavilling, that they are wounded with the same weapons with which they thought themselves admirably defended. But it is very ridiculous that a plain sentence should be so distorted, only because the Lord declares that he will not spare the crimes of the people, even though their cause had been pleaded by Moses or Samuel, to whose prayers he had shown himself so very propitious. This idea is very clearly deduced from a similar passage of Ezekiel. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in the land, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Where he undoubtedly meant to signify, if two of them should return to life again, for the third was then alive, namely Daniel, who is well known to have given an incomparable specimen of his piety, even in the flower of his youth. Let us then leave them whom the scripture clearly shows to have finished their course. Therefore Paul, when speaking of David, does not say that he assists posterity by his prayers, but only that he served his own generation. They further object, Shall we then divest them of every benevolent wish who, through the whole course of their lives, breathed only benevolence and mercy? Truly, as I do not wish too curiously to inquire into their actions or thoughts, so it is by no means probable that they are agitated by the impulse of particular wishes, but rather that with fixed and permanent desires they aspire after the kingdom of God, which consists no less in the perdition of the impious than in the salvation of believers. If this be true, their charity is also comprehended within the communion of the body of Christ, and extends no further than the nature of that communion permits. But though I grant that in this respect they pray for us, yet they do not therefore relinquish their own repose to be distracted with earthly cares, and much less are they therefore to be the objects of our invocation. Neither is it a necessary consequence of this that they must imitate the conduct of men on earth by mutually praying for one another. For this conduces to the cultivation of charity among them, while they divide as it were between them, and reciprocally bear their mutual necessities. And in this indeed they act according to God's precept, and are not destitute of his promise, which too are always the principal points in prayer. No such considerations have any relation to the dead, whom, when the Lord has removed from our society, he has left us no intercourse with them, nor them, indeed, as far as our conjectures can reach, any with us. But, if any one plead that they cannot but retain the same charity towards us, as they are united with us by the same faith, yet who has revealed that they have ears long enough to reach our voices, and eyes so perspicacious as to watch over our necessities? They talk in the schools of I know not what refulgence of the divine countenance irradiating them, in which, as in a mirror, they behold from heaven the affairs of men, but to affirm this, especially with the presumption with which they dare to assert it, what is it but an attempt by the infatuated dreams of our own brains forcibly to penetrate into the secret appointments of God without the authority of his word, and to trample the scripture under our feet, which so frequently pronounces our carnal wisdom to be hostile to the wisdom of God, totally condemns the vanity of our mind, and directs all our reason to be laid in the dust, and the divine will to be the sole object of our regard. The other testimonies of Scripture which they adduce in defence of this false doctrine they distort with the greatest perverseness. But Jacob, they say, prays that his own name and the name of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac, might be named on his posterity. Let us first inquire the form of this naming, or calling on their names, among the Israelites, for they do not invoke their fathers to assist them, but they beseech God to remember his servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their example, therefore, is no vindication of those who address the saints themselves. But, as these stupid mortals understand neither what it is to name the name of Jacob, nor for what reason it should be named, we need not wonder that they so childishly err even in the form itself. This phraseology more than once occurs in the Scriptures, for Isaiah says that the name of the husband is called upon the wife who lives under his care and protection. The naming, or calling, therefore, of the name of Abraham upon the Israelites consists in their deducing their genealogy from him, and revering and celebrating his memory as their great progenitor. 
neither is jacob actuated by a solicitude for perpetuating the celebrity of his name but by a knowledge that all the happiness of his posterity consisted in the inheritance of that covenant which god had made with him and perceiving that this would be the greatest of all blessings to them he prays that they may be numbered among his children which is only transmitting to them the succession of the covenant they on their part when they introduce the mention of this in their prayers do not recur to the intercessions of the dead but to the lord in remembrance of his covenant in which their most merciful father has engaged to be propitious and beneficent to them for the sake of abraham isaac and jacob how little the saints depended in any other sense on the merits of their fathers is evinced by the public voice of the church in the prophet thou art our father though abraham be ignorant of us and israel acknowledge us not thou o lord art our father our redeemer and when they thus express themselves they add at the same time o lord return for thy servant's sake yet not entertaining a thought of any intercession but adverting to the blessing of the covenant but now since we have the lord jesus in whose hand the eternal covenant of mercy is not only made but confirmed to us whose name should we rather plead in our prayers and since these good doctors contend that the patriarchs are in these words represented as intercessors i wish to be informed by them why in such a vast multitude no place not even the lowest among them is allotted to abraham the father of the church from what vile source they derive their advocates is well known let them answer me by proving it right that abraham whom god has preferred to all others and elevated to the highest degree of honour should be neglected and suppressed the truth is that since this practice was unknown in the ancient church they thought proper in order to conceal its novelty to be silent respecting the ancient fathers as though the difference of names were a valid excuse for a recent and corrupt custom but the objection urged by some that god is entreated to have mercy on the people for the sake of david is so far from supporting their error that it is a decisive refutation of it for if we consider the character sustained by david he is selected from the whole company of the saints that god may fulfil the covenant which he made with them so that it refers to the covenant rather than to the person and contains a figurative declaration of the sole intercession of christ for it is certain that what was peculiar to david as being a type of christ is inapplicable to any others but it seems that some are influenced by the frequent declarations which we read that the prayers of the saints are heard why truly because they have prayed they cried unto thee says the psalmist and were delivered they trusted in thee and were not confounded therefore let us likewise pray after their example that we may obtain a similar audience but these men preposterously argue that none will be heard but such as have been once already heard how much more properly does james say elias was a man subject to like passions as we are and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months and he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit what does he infer any peculiar privilege of elias to which we should have recourse not at all but he shows the perpetual efficacy of pure and pious prayer to exhort us to pray in a similar manner for we put a mean construction on the promptitude and benignity of god in hearing them unless we be encouraged by such instances to a firmer reliance on his promises in which he promises to hear us not one or two or even a few but all who call upon his name and this ignorance is so much the less excusable because they appear almost professedly to disregard so many testimonies of scripture david experienced frequent deliverances by the divine power was it that he might arrogate it to himself in order to deliver us by his interposition he makes some very different declarations the righteous shall compass me about for thou shalt deal bountifully with me again they looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed this poor man cried and the lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles the psalms contain many such prayers in which he implores god to grant his requests for his consideration that the righteous may not be put to shame but may be encouraged by his example to entertain a good hope let us be contented at present with one instance for this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee at a time when thou mayest be found a text which i have the more readily cited because the hireling and cavilling advocates of popery have not been ashamed to plead it to prove the intercession of the dead 
as though David had any other design than to show the effect which would proceed from the divine clemency and goodness when his prayers should be heard. And in general it must be maintained that an experience of the grace of God both to ourselves and to others affords no small assistance to confirm our faith in his promises. I do not recite numerous passages where he proposes to himself the past blessings of God as a ground of present and future confidence, since they will naturally occur to those who peruse the Psalms. Jacob, by his example, had long before taught the same lesson. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant, for with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. He mentions the promise indeed, but not alone. He likewise adds the effect that he may in future confide with the greater boldness in the continuance of the divine goodness towards him. For God is not like mortals, who grow weary of their liberality or whose wealth is exhausted, but is to be estimated by his own nature, as is judiciously done by David when he says, Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. After ascribing to him the praise of his salvation, he adds, that he is a God of truth, because, unless he were perpetually and uniformly consistent with himself, there could not be derived from his benefits a sufficient argument for confiding in him and praying to him. But when we know that every act of assistance which he affords us is a specimen and proof of his goodness and faithfulness, we shall have no reason to fear lest our hopes be confounded or our expectations disappointed. Let us conclude this argument in the following manner. Since the scripture represents the principal part of divine worship to be an invocation of God, as he, in preference to all sacrifices, requires of us this duty of piety, no prayer can without evident sacrilege be directed to any other. Wherefore also the psalmist says, If we have stretched out our hands to a strange God, shall not God search this out? Besides, since God will only be invoked in faith, and expressly commands prayers to be conformed to the rule of his word, finally, since faith founded on the word is the source of true prayer, as soon as the least deviation is made from the word, there must necessarily be an immediate corruption of prayer. But it has been already shown that if the scripture be consulted, this honour is there claimed for God alone. With respect to the office of intercession, we have also seen that it is peculiar to Christ, and that no prayer is acceptable to God unless it be sanctified by this mediator. And though believers mutually pray to God for their brethren, we have proved that this derogates nothing from the sole intercession of Christ, because they all commend both themselves and others to God in a reliance upon it. Moreover, we have argued that this is injudiciously applied to the dead, of whom we nowhere read that they are commanded to pray for us. The scripture frequently exhorts us to the mutual performance of this duty for each other, but concerning the dead there is not even a syllable and James, by connecting these two things, confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, tacitly excludes the dead. Wherefore, to condemn this error, this one reason is sufficient, that right prayer originates in faith, and that faith is produced by hearing the word of God, where there is no mention of this fictitious intercession. For the temerity of superstition has chosen itself advocates, who were not of divine appointment. For whilst the scripture abounds with many forms of prayer, there is not to be found an example of this advocacy, without which the papists believe there can be no prayer at all. Besides, it is evident that this superstition has arisen from a want of faith, because they either were not content with Christ as their intercessor, or entirely denied him this glory. The latter of these is easily proved from their impudence, for they adduce no argument more valid to show that we need the mediation of the saints than when they object that we are unworthy of familiar access to God which indeed we acknowledge to be strictly true, but we thence conclude that they rob Christ of everything who consider his intercession as unavailing without the assistance of George and Hippolytus and other such phantasms. But though prayer is properly restricted to wishes and petitions, yet there is so great an affinity between petition and thanksgiving that they may be justly comprehended under the same name, for the species which Paul enumerates fall under the first member of this division, in requests and petitions we pour out our desires before God, imploring those things which tend to the propagation of his glory and the illustration of his name, as well as those benefits which conduce to our advantage. In thanksgiving we celebrate his beneficence towards us with due praises, acknowledging all the blessings we have received as the gifts of his liberality. Therefore David has connected these two parts together, 
Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. The scripture not without reason enjoins us the continual use of both, for we have elsewhere said that our want is so great, and experience itself proclaims that we are molested and oppressed on every side, with such numerous and great perplexities, that we all have sufficient cause for unceasing sighs and groans and ardent supplications to God. For though they enjoy a freedom from adversity, yet the guilt of their sins and the innumerable assaults of temptation ought to stimulate even the most eminent saints to pray for relief. But of the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving there can be no interruption without guilt, since God ceases not to accumulate on us his various benefits, according to our respective cases, in order to constrain us, inactive and sluggish as we are, to the exercise of gratitude. Finally, we are almost overwhelmed with such great and copious effusions of his beneficence. We are surrounded, whithersoever we turn our eyes, by such numerous and amazing miracles of his hand, that we never want matter of praise and thanksgiving. And to be a little more explicit on this point, since all our hopes and all our help are in God, which has already been sufficiently proved, so that we cannot enjoy prosperity either in our persons or in any of our affairs without his benediction, it becomes us assiduously to commend to him ourselves and all our concerns. Further, whatever we think, speak, or act, let all our thoughts, words, and actions be under his direction, subject to his will, and finally, in hope of his assistance. For the curse of God is denounced on all who deliberate and decide on any enterprise in a reliance on themselves, or on any other, who engage in or attempt to begin any undertaking independently of his will and without invoking his aid. And since it has already been several times observed that he is justly honoured when he is acknowledged to be the author of all blessings, it thence follows that they should all be so received from his hand as to be attended with unceasing thanksgiving, and that there is no other proper method of using the benefits which flow to us from his goodness but by continual acknowledgments of his praise and unceasing expressions of our gratitude. For Paul, when he declares that they are sanctified by the word of God and prayer, at the same time implies that they are not at all holy and pure to us without the word and prayer, the word being metonymically used to denote faith. Wherefore, David, after experiencing the goodness of the Lord, beautifully declares, He hath put a new song in my mouth, in which he certainly implies that we are guilty of a criminal silence if we omit to praise him for any benefit, since in every blessing he bestows on us, he gives us additional cause to bless his name. Thus also Isaiah, proclaiming the unparalleled grace of God, exhorts believers to a new and uncommon song, in which sense David elsewhere says, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Hezekiah likewise and Jonah declare that the end of their deliverance shall be to sing the divine goodness in the temple. David prescribes the same general rule for all the saints. What shall I render, says he, unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And this is followed by the church in another psalm. Save us, O Lord, our God, to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. Again, he will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come, and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. Moreover, whenever believers entreat the Lord to do anything for his name's sake, as they profess themselves unworthy to obtain any blessing on their own account, so they lay themselves under an obligation to thanksgiving, and promise that the divine beneficence shall be productive of this proper effect on them, even to cause them to celebrate its fame. Thus Hosea, speaking of the future redemption of the church, addresses the Lord, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, so will we render the calves of our lips. Nor do the divine blessings only claim the praises of the tongue, but naturally conciliate our love. I love the Lord, says David, because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. In another place also, enumerating the assistances he had experienced, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Nor will any praises ever please God, but such as flow from this ardour of love. We must likewise remember the position of Paul, that all petitions to which thanksgiving is not annexed are irregular and faulty. For thus he speaks, In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. 
for since moroseness, weariness, impatience, pungent sorrow and fear impel many to mutter petitions, he enjoins such a regulation of the affections that believers may cheerfully bless God even before they have obtained their requests. If this connection ought to exist in circumstances apparently adverse, God lays us under a still more sacred obligation to sing his praises whenever he grants the enjoyment of our wishes. But, as we have asserted that our prayers, which had otherwise been defiled, are consecrated by the intercession of Christ, so the Apostle, when he exhorts us by Christ to offer the sacrifice of praise, admonishes us that our lips are not sufficiently pure to celebrate the name of God without the intervention of the priesthood of Christ. Whence we infer how prodigious must be the fascination of the papists, the majority of whom wonder that Christ is called an advocate. This is the reason why Paul directs to pray without ceasing, and in everything to give thanks, because he desires that all men, with all possible assiduity, in every time and in every place, and in all circumstances and affairs, may direct their prayers to God, expecting all from him, and ascribing to him the praise of all, since he affords us perpetual matter of prayer and praise. But this diligence in prayer, although it chiefly respects the particular and private devotions of each individual, has, notwithstanding, some reference also to the public prayers of the church. But these cannot be unceasing, nor ought they to be conducted otherwise than according to the polity which is appointed by the common consent. This indeed I confess, for therefore also certain hours are fixed and prescribed, though indifferent with God, yet necessary to the customs of men, that the benefit of all may be regarded, and all the affairs of the church be administered according to the direction of Paul, decently and in order. But this by no means prevents it from being the duty of every church often to stimulate themselves to a greater frequency of prayer, and also to be inflamed with more ardent devotion on the pressure of any necessity unusually great. But the place to speak of perseverance, which is nearly allied to unceasing diligence, will be towards the end. Moreover, these things afford no encouragement to those vain repetitions which Christ has chosen to interdict us. For... He does not forbid us to pray long or frequently, or with great fervour of affection, but he forbids us to confide in our ability to extort anything from God by stunning his ears with garrulous loquacity, as though he were to be influenced by the arts of human persuasion. For we know that hypocrites who do not consider that they are concerned with God are as pompous in their prayers as in a triumph. For that Pharisee who thanked God that he was not like other men undoubtedly flattered himself in the eyes of men if he wished to gain by his prayer the reputation of sanctity. Hence the vaptologia, vain repetition, which from a similar cause at present prevails among the papists, while some vainly consume the time by reiterating the same orisons, and others recommend themselves among the vulgar by a tedious accumulation of words, since this garrulity is a puerile mocking of God, we need not wonder that it is prohibited in the church, that nothing may be heard there but what is serious and proceeds from the very heart. Very similar to this corrupt practice is another, which Christ condemns at the same time, that hypocrites, for the sake of ostentation, seek after many witnesses of their devotions, and rather pray in the marketplace, than that their prayers should want the applause of the world but as it has been already observed that the end of prayer is to elevate our minds towards God, both in a confession of his praise and in a supplication of his aid, we may learn from this that its principal place is in the mind and heart, or rather that prayer itself is the desire of the inmost heart, which is poured out and laid before God, the searcher of hearts. Wherefore our heavenly teacher, as has already been mentioned, when he intended to deliver the best rule respecting prayer, gave the following command, Enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. For when he has dissuaded from imitating the example of hypocrites, who endeavoured by the ambitious ostentation of their prayers to gain the favour of men, he immediately adds a better direction, which is to enter into our closet, and there to pray with the door shut. In which words, as I understand them, he has taught us to seek retirement, that we may be enabled to descend into our own hearts with all our powers of reflection, and promised us that God, whose temples our bodies ought to be, will accede to the desires of our souls. 
for he did not intend to deny the expediency of praying also in other places, but shows that prayer is a kind of secret thing which lies principally in the heart and requires a tranquillity of mind undisturbed by all cares. It was not without reason, therefore, that the Lord himself, when he would engage in an unusual vehemence of devotion, retired to some solitary place far from the tumult of men but with a view to admonish us by his own example that we ought not to neglect these helps by which our hearts naturally too inconstant are more intensely fixed on the devotional exercise but notwithstanding as he did not refrain from praying even in the midst of a multitude if at any time the occasion required it so we in all places where it may be necessary should lift up holy hands and so it is to be concluded that whoever refuses to pray in the solemn assembly of the saints knows nothing of private prayer, either solitary or domestic. And again, that he who neglects solitary and private prayer, how sedulously soever he may frequent the public assemblies, only forms there such as are mere wind, because he pays more deference to the opinion of men than to the secret judgment of God. In the meantime, that the common prayers of the church might not sink into contempt, God anciently distinguished them by splendid titles, especially when he called the temple a house of prayer. For by this expression he taught both that the duty of prayer is a principal part of his worship, and that the temple had been erected as a standard for believers, in order that they might engage in it with one consent. There was also added a remarkable promise, praise waiteth for thee o god in zion and unto thee shall the vow be performed in which words the psalmist informs us that the prayers of the church are never in vain because the lord supplies his people with perpetual matter of praise and joy but though the legal shadows have ceased yet since it has been the divine will by this ceremony to maintain a unity of faith among us also the same promise undoubtedly belongs to us, Christ having confirmed it with his own mouth, and Paul having represented it as perpetually valid. Now, as God in his word commands believers to unite in common prayers, so also it is necessary that public temples be appointed for performing them, where they who refuse to join with the people of God in their devotions have no just reason for abusing this pretext, that they enter into their closets in obedience to the divine mandate, for he who promises to grant whatever shall be implored by two or three persons, convened in his name, proves that he is far from despising prayers offered in public, provided they be free from ostentation and a desire of human applause, and accompanied with a sincere and real affection dwelling in the secret recesses of the heart. If this be the legitimate use of temples, as it certainly is, there is need of great caution, lest we either consider them as the proper habitations of the deity, where he may be nearer to us to hear our prayers, an idea which has begun to be prevalent for several ages, or ascribe to them I know not what mysterious sanctity which might be supposed to render our devotions more holy in the divine view. For since we are ourselves the true temples of God, we must pray within ourselves if we wish to invoke him in his holy temple." But let us, who are directed to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, without any difference of place, relinquish these gross ideas of religion to the Jews or pagans. There was indeed anciently a temple dedicated by divine command to the oblation of prayers and sacrifices. At that time the truth was figuratively concealed under such shadows. But now, having been plainly discovered to us, it no longer permits an exclusive attachment to any material temple. Nor indeed was the temple recommended to the Jews that they might enclose the divine presence within its walls, but that they might be employed in contemplating a representation of the true temple. Therefore Isaiah and Stephen have sharply reprehended those who suppose that God dwells in any respect in temples made with hands. Hence it is, moreover, clearly evident that neither voice nor singing, if used in prayer, has any validity or produces the least benefit with God, unless it proceed from the inmost desire of the heart. But they rather provoke his wrath against us if they be only emitted from the lips and throat, since that is an abuse of his sacred name and a derision of his majesty, as we conclude from the words of Isaiah, which, though their meaning be more extensive, contain also a reproof of this offence. The Lord said, Forasmuch as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honour me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men, therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvellous work among this people, 
even a marvellous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Nor do we here condemn the use of the voice or singing, but rather highly recommend them, provided they accompany the affection of the heart. For they exercise the mind in divine meditation, and fix the attention of the heart, which, by its lubricity and versatility, is easily relaxed and distracted to a variety of objects, unless it be supported by various helps. Besides, as the glory of God ought in some respect to be manifested in every part of our bodies, to this service both in singing and in speaking it becomes us especially to addict and devote our tongues, which were created for the express purpose of declaring and celebrating the divine praises. Nevertheless, the principal use of the tongue is in the public prayers which are made in the congregations of believers, the design of which is that with one common voice, and, as it were, with the same mouth, we may all at once proclaim the glory of God, whom we worship in one spirit and with the same faith. And this is publicly done, that all interchangeably, each one of his brother may receive the confession of faith and be invited and stimulated by his example. Now the custom of singing in churches, to speak of it by the way, not only appears to be very ancient, but that it was even used by the apostles may be concluded from these words of Paul, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Again to the Colossians, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. For in the former passage he inculcates singing with the voice and with the heart, and in the latter he recommends spiritual songs which may conduce to the mutual edification of the saints. Yet that it was not universal is proved by Augustine, who relates that in the time of Ambrose, the church at Milan first adopted the practice of singing, when, during the persecution of the Orthodox faith by Justina, the mother of Valentinian, the people were unusually assiduous in their vigils, and that the other Western churches followed. For he had just before mentioned that this custom had been derived from the churches of the East. He signifies also, in the second book of his Retractions, that in his time it was received in Africa. Quote, One Hilary, says he, who held the tribunicial office, took every opportunity of loading with malicious censures the custom which was then introduced at Carthage, that hymns from the book of Psalms should be sung at the altar, either before the oblation, or while that which had been offered was distributed to the people. In obedience to the commands of my brethren, I answered him, end quote. And certainly if singing be attempered to that gravity which becomes the presence of God and of angels, it adds a dignity and grace to sacred actions, and is very efficacious in exciting the mind to a true concern and ardour of devotion. Yet great caution is necessary that the ears be not more attentive to the modulation of the notes than the mind to the spiritual import of the words, with which danger Augustine confesses himself to have been so affected as sometimes to have wished for the observance of the custom initiated by Athanasius, who directed that the reader should sound the words with such a gentle inflection of voice as would be more nearly allied to rehearsing than to singing. But when he recollected the great benefit which himself had received from singing, he inclined to the other side. With the observance, therefore, of this limitation, it is without doubt an institution of great solemnity and usefulness. As on the reverse, whatever music is composed only to please and delight the ear is unbecoming the majesty of the church, and cannot but be highly displeasing to God. Hence also it plainly appears that public prayers are to be composed not in Greek among the Latins, nor in Latin among the French or English, as has hitherto been universally practised, but in the vernacular tongue, which may be generally understood by the whole congregation, for it ought to be conducted to the edification of the whole church, to whom not the least benefit can result from sounds which they do not understand. But they who disregard the voice both of charity and of humanity ought at least to discover some little respect for the authority of Paul, whose words are free from all ambiguity. When thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say Amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. Who then can sufficiently wonder at the unbridled license of the papists, who, notwithstanding this apostolic caution against it, are not afraid to bellow their verbose prayers in a foreign language, 
of which they neither sometimes understand a syllable themselves, nor wish a syllable to be understood by others. But Paul directs to a different practice. What is it then? said he. I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Signifying by the word Spirit the peculiar gift of tongues, which was abused by some of its possessors when they separated it from understanding. Thus it must be fully admitted that both in public and in private prayer the tongue, unaccompanied by the heart, cannot but be highly displeasing to God, and likewise that the mind ought to be incited by the ardour of meditation to rise to a much higher elevation than can ever be attained by the expression of the tongue. Lastly, that the tongue is indeed not necessary to private prayer any further than as the mind is insufficient to arouse itself, or as the vehemence of its emotions irresistibly carries the tongue along with them. For though some of the best prayers are not vocal, yet it is very common, under strong emotions, for the tongue to break forth into sounds, and the other members into gestures, without the least ostentation. Hence the uncertain muttering of Hannah, somewhat similar to which is experienced by the saints in all ages, when they break forth into abrupt and imperfect sounds, the corporeal gestures usually observed in prayer, such as kneeling and uncovering the head, are customs designed to increase our reverence of God. Now we must learn not only a certain rule, but also the form of praying, even that which our Heavenly Father has given us by His beloved Son, in which we may recognize His infinite goodness and clemency. For beside advising and exhorting us to seek Him in all our necessities, as children, whenever they are afflicted with any distress, for besides advising and exhorting us to seek him in all our necessities, as children, whenever they are afflicted with any distress, are accustomed to have recourse to the protection of their parents, seeing that we did not sufficiently perceive how great was our poverty, what it was right to implore, or what would be suitable to our condition. He has provided a remedy even for this our ignorance, and abundantly supplied the deficiencies of our capacity." for he has prescribed for us a form in which he gives a statement of all that it is lawful to desire of him, all that is conducive to our benefit, and all that it is necessary to ask. From this kindness of his we derive great consolation in the persuasion that we pray for nothing absurd, nothing injurious or unseasonable, in a word, nothing but what is agreeable to him, since our petitions are almost in his own words, Plato, observing the ignorance of men in presenting their supplications to God, which, if granted, were frequently very detrimental to them, pronounces this to be the best method of praying, borrowed from an ancient poet. Quote, King Jupiter, give us those things which are best, whether we pray for them or not, but command evil things to remain at a distance from us, even though we implore them. End quote. And indeed the wisdom of that heathen is conspicuous in this instance, since he considers it as very dangerous to supplicate the Lord to gratify all the dictates of our appetites, and at the same time discovers our infelicity, who cannot, without danger, even open our mouths in the presence of God, unless we be instructed by the Spirit in the right rule of prayer. And this privilege deserves to be the more highly valued by us, since the only begotten Son of God puts words into our mouths which may deliver our minds from all hesitation. This form or rule of prayer, whichever appellation be given to it, is composed of six petitions. For my reason for not agreeing with those who divide it into seven parts is that the evangelist appears, by the insertion of the adversative conjunction, to connect together these two clauses, as though he had said, Suffer us not to be oppressed with temptation, but rather succour our weakness, and deliver us that we may not fall. The ancient writers of the church also are of our opinion, so that what is now added in Matthew in the seventh place must be explained as belonging to the sixth petition. Now, though the whole prayer is such that in every part of it the principal regard must be paid to the glory of God, yet to this the first three petitions are particularly devoted, and to this alone we ought to attend in them, without any consideration of our own interest. The remaining three concern ourselves, and are expressly assigned to supplications for those things which tend to our benefit. As when we pray that God's name may be hallowed, since he chooses to prove whether our love and worship of him be voluntary, or dictated by mercenary motives. We must then think nothing of our own interest, but his glory must be proposed as the only object of our fixed attention, nor is it lawful for us to be differently affected in other petitions of this class. 
and this indeed conduces to our great benefit, because when the divine name is hallowed or sanctified as we pray, it becomes likewise our sanctification. But our eyes should overlook and be, as it were, blind to such advantage, so as not to pay the least regard to it. And even if we were deprived of all hope of private benefit, yet this hallowing and the other things which pertain to the glory of God ought still to be the objects of our desires and of our prayers. This is conspicuous in the examples of Moses and Paul, who felt a pleasure in adverting their minds and eyes from themselves, and in praying with vehement and ardent zeal for their own destruction, that they might promote the kingdom and glory of God, even at the expense of their own happiness. On the other hand, when we pray that our daily bread may be given us, although we wish for what is beneficial to ourselves, yet here also we ought principally to aim at the glory of God, so as not even to ask it, unless it tend to his glory. Now let us attempt an explanation of the prayer itself. Our Father, who art in heaven, etc. The first idea that occurs is what we have before asserted, that we ought never to present a prayer to God but in the name of Christ, since no other name can recommend it to his regard. For by calling God our Father we certainly plead the name of Christ. For with what confidence could any one call God his Father? who could proceed to such a degree of temerity as to arrogate to himself the dignity of a son of God, if we had not been adopted as the children of his grace in Christ, who, being his true son, has been given by him to us as our brother, that the character which properly belongs to him by nature may become ours by the blessing of adoption if we receive this inestimable favour with a steady faith, as John says, that to them is given the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on the name of the only begotten of the Father. Therefore he denominates himself our Father, and wishes us to give him the same appellation, delivering us from all diffidence by the great sweetness of this name, since the affection of love can nowhere be found in a stronger degree than in the heart of a father. Therefore he could not give us a more certain proof of his infinite love towards us than by our being denominated the sons of God but his love to us is as much greater and more excellent than all the love of our parents, as he is superior to all men in goodness and mercy, so that, though all the fathers in the world, divested of every emotion of paternal affection, should leave their children destitute, he will never forsake us, because he cannot deny himself. For we have his promise, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father which is in heaven? Again in the prophet, Can a woman forget her child? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. And if we are his sons, then as a son cannot commit himself to the protection of a stranger and an alien, without at the same time complaining of the cruelty or poverty of his father, so neither can we seek supplies for our wants from any other quarter than from him, without charging him with indigence and inability, or with cruelty and excessive austerity. Neither let us plead that we are justly terrified by a consciousness of our sins, which may cause even a merciful kind father to be daily offended with us. For if, among men, a son can conduct his cause with his father by no better advocate, can conciliate and recover his lost favour by no better mediator than by approaching him as an humble suppliant, acknowledging his own guilt and imploring his father's mercy, for the bowels of a father could not conceal their emotions at such supplications, what will he do, who is the father of mercies and the god of all comfort? Will he not hear the cries and groans of his children when they deprecate his displeasure for themselves, especially since it is to this that he invites and exhorts us, rather than attend to any intercessions of others, to which they resort in great consternation, not without some degree of despair arising from a doubt of the kindness and clemency of their father? Of this exuberance of paternal kindness he gives us a beautiful representation in a parable, where a father meets and embraces a son who has alienated himself from his family, who had dissolutely lavished his substance, who had grievously offended him in every respect, nor does he wait till he actually supplicates for pardon, but anticipates him, recognizes him when returning at a great distance, voluntarily runs to meet him, consoles him, and receives him into favor. For by proposing to our view an example of such great kindness in a man, he intended to teach us how much more abundant compassion we ought, notwithstanding our ingratitude, rebellion, and wickedness, to expect from him, who is not only our father, but the most benevolent and merciful of all fathers, provided we only cast ourselves on his mercy. And to give us the more certain assurance that he is such a father, 
If we be Christians, he will be called not only Father, but expressly our Father, as though we might address him in the following manner. O Father, whose affection towards thy children is so strong, and whose readiness to pardon them is so great, we thy children invoke thee, and pray to thee under the assurance and full persuasion that thou hast no other than a paternal affection towards us, how unworthy soever we are of such a father. But because the contracted capacities of our minds cannot conceive of a favour of such immense magnitude, we not only have Christ as the pledge and earnest of adoption, but as a witness of this adoption he gives us the Spirit, by whom we are enabled with a loud voice freely to cry, Abba, Father. Whenever, therefore, we may be embarrassed by any difficulty, let us remember to supplicate him, that he will correct our timidity, and give us this spirit of magnanimity to enable us to pray with boldness. But since we are not instructed that every individual should appropriate him to himself exclusively as his father, but rather that we should all in common call him our father, we are thereby admonished how strong a fraternal affection ought to prevail among us who by the same privilege of mercy and free grace are equally the children of such a father. For if we all have one common father, from whom proceeds every blessing we enjoy, there ought to be nothing exclusively appropriated by any among us, but what we should be ready to communicate to each other with the greatest alacrity of heart, whenever necessity requires. Now, if we desire, as we ought, to exert ourselves for our mutual assistance, there is nothing in which we can better promote the interests of our brethren than by commending them to the providential care of our most benevolent Father, with whose mercy and favour no other want can be experienced. And indeed, this is a debt which we owe to our Father himself, for as he who truly and cordially loves any father of a family feels likewise a love and friendship for his whole household in the same manner, our zeal and affection towards this heavenly Father must be shown towards his people, his family, his inheritance, whom he has dignified with the honourable appellation of the fullness of his only begotten Son. Let a Christian then regulate his prayers by this rule, that they be common and comprehend all who are his brethren in Christ, and not only those whom he at present sees and knows to be such, but all men in the world, respecting whom what God has determined is beyond our knowledge, only that to wish and hope the best concerning them is equally the dictate of piety and of humanity. It becomes us, however, to exercise a peculiar and superior affection unto them who are of the household of faith, whom the Apostle has in every case recommended to our particular regards. In a word, all our prayers ought to be such, as to respect that community which our Lord has established in his kingdom and in his family. Yet this is no objection to the lawfulness of particular prayers both for ourselves and for other certain individuals, provided our minds be not withdrawn from a regard to this community, nor even diverted from it, but refer everything to this point. For though the words of them be singular, yet, as they are directed to this end, they cease not to be common, all this may be rendered very intelligible by a similitude. God has given a general command to relieve the wants of all the poor, and yet this is obeyed by them who to that end succour the indigence of those whom they either know or see to be labouring under poverty, even though they pass by multitudes who are oppressed with necessities equally severe, because neither their knowledge nor ability can extend to all. In the same manner, no opposition is made to the divine will by them who, regarding and considering this common society of the Church, present such particular prayers in which, with a public spirit, but in particular terms, they recommend to God themselves or others, whose necessity he has placed within their more immediate knowledge. However, there is not a perfect similarity in every respect between prayer and donation of alms, for munificence cannot be exercised but towards them whose wants we have perceived, but we may assist by our prayers even the greatest strangers, and those with whom we are the most unacquainted, how distant soever they may be from us. This is done by that general form of prayer which comprehends all the children of God, among whom they also are numbered. To this may be referred the exhortation which Paul gives believers of his age, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, because by admonishing them that discord shuts the gate against prayers, he advises them unanimously to unite all their petitions together. It is added that he is in heaven, from which it is not hastily to be inferred that he is included and circumscribed within the circumference of heaven as by certain barriers, for Solomon confesses that the heaven of heavens cannot contain him, and he says himself by the prophet, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, 
by which he clearly signifies that he is not limited to any particular region, but diffused throughout all space. But because the dullness of our minds could not otherwise conceive of his ineffable glory, it is designated to us by the heaven, than which we can behold nothing more august or more majestic. Since then, wherever our senses apprehend anything, there they are accustomed to fix it, God is represented as beyond all place, that when we seek him we may be elevated above all reach of both body and soul. Moreover, by this form of expression he is exalted above all possibility of corruption or mutation. Finally, it is signified that he comprehends and contains the whole world, and governs the universe by his power. Wherefore, this is the same as if he had been said to be possessed of an incomprehensible essence, infinite magnitude or sublimity, irresistible power, and unlimited immortality. But when we hear this, our thoughts must be raised to a higher elevation when God is mentioned, that we may not entertain any terrestrial or carnal imaginations concerning him, that we may not measure him by our diminutive proportions, or judge of his will by our affections. We should likewise be encouraged to place the most implicit reliance on him by whose providence and power we understand both heaven and earth to be governed. To conclude, under the name of our Father is represented to us that God, who has appeared to us in his own image, that we might call upon him with a steady faith, and the familiar appellation of Father is not only adapted to produce confidence, but also efficacious to prevent our minds from being seduced to dubious or fictitious deities, and to cause them to ascend from the only begotten Son to the common Father of angels and of saints. Moreover, when his throne is placed in heaven, we are reminded by his government of the world that it is not in vain for us to approach to him who makes us the objects of his present and voluntary care. He that cometh to God, says the Apostle, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Christ asserts both these of his Father, that we may have first a firm faith in his existence, and then a certain persuasion that, since he deigns to extend his providence to us, he will not neglect our salvation. By these principles Paul prepares us for praying in right manner, for his exhortation, Let your requests be made known unto God, is thus prefaced, The Lord is at hand, be careful for nothing. Whence it appears that their prayers must be attended with great doubt and perplexity of mind, who are not well established in this truth, that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. The first petition is, that God's name may be hallowed, the necessity of which is connected with our great disgrace. For what is more shameful than that the divine glory should be obscured partly by our ingratitude, partly by our malignity, and, as far as possible, obliterated by our presumption, infatuation, and perverseness? Notwithstanding all the sacrilegious rage and clamour of the impious, yet the refulgence of holiness still adorns the divine name. Nor does the psalmist without reason exclaim, According to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. For wherever God may be known, there must necessarily be a manifestation of his perfections of power, goodness, wisdom, righteousness, mercy, and truth, which command our admiration and excite us to celebrate his praise. Therefore, because God is so unjustly robbed of his holiness on earth, if it is not in our power to assert it for him, we are at least commanded to regard it in our prayers. The substance of it is that we wish God to receive all the honour that he deserves, that men may never speak or think of him, but with the highest reverence, to which is opposed that profanation which has always been too common in the world, as it continues to be in the present age. And hence the necessity of this petition, which, if we were influenced by only a tolerable degree of piety, ought to be superfluous. But if the name of God be truly hallowed, when separated from all others, it breathes pure glory. We are here commanded to pray not only that God will vindicate his holy name from all contempt and ignominy, but also that he will constrain all mankind to revere it. Now, as God manifests himself to us partly by his word and partly by his works, he is no otherwise hallowed by us than if we attribute to him in both instances that which belongs to him, and so receive whatever proceeds from him, ascribing, moreover, equal praise to his severity and to his clemency, since on the multiplicity and variety of his works he has impressed characters of his glory, which should draw from every tongue a confession of his praise. Thus will the scripture obtain a just authority with us, nor will any event obstruct the benedictions which God deserves in the whole course of his government of the world. 
the tendency of the petition is further that all impiety which sullies this holy name may be utterly abolished that whatever obscures or diminishes this hallowing whether detraction or derision may disappear and that while god restrains all sacrilege his majesty may shine with increasing splendour the second petition is that the kingdom of god may come which though it contains nothing new is yet not without reason distinguished from the first because if we consider our inattention in the most important of all concerns it is useful for that which ought of itself to have been most intimately known to us to be inculcated in a variety of words therefore after we have been commanded to pray to god to subdue and at length utterly to destroy everything that sullies his holy name there is now added another petition similar and almost identically the same that his kingdom may come now though we have already given a definition of this kingdom i now briefly repeat that god reigns when men renouncing themselves and despising the world and the present state submit themselves to his righteousness so as to aspire to the heavenly state thus this kingdom consists in two parts the one god's correcting by the power of his spirit all our carnal and depraved appetites which oppose him in great numbers the other his forming all our powers to an obedience to his commands no others therefore observe a proper order in this petition but they who begin from themselves that is that they may be purified from all corruptions which disturb the tranquillity or violate the purity of god's kingdom now since the divine word resembles a royal sceptre we are commanded to pray that he will subdue the hearts and minds of all men to a voluntary obedience to it this is accomplished when by the secret inspiration of his spirit he displays the efficacy of his word and causes it to obtain the honour it deserves afterwards it is our duty to descend to the impious by whom his authority is resisted with the perseverance of obstinacy and the fury of despair god therefore erects his kingdom on the humiliation of the whole world though his methods of humiliation are various for he restrains the passions of some and breaks the unsubdued arrogance of others it ought to be the object of our daily wishes that god would collect churches for himself from all the countries of the world that he would enlarge their numbers enrich them with gifts and establish a legitimate order among them that on the contrary he would overthrow all the enemies of the pure doctrine and religion that he would confound their counsels and defeat their attempts whence it appears that the desire of a daily progress is not enjoined on us in vain because human affairs are never in such a happy situation as that all defilement of sin is removed and purity can be seen in full perfection this perfection is deferred till the last advent of christ when the apostle says god will be all in all and so this petition ought to withdraw us from all the corruptions of the world which separate us from god and prevent his kingdom from flourishing within us it ought likewise to inflame us with an ardent desire of mortifying the flesh and finally to teach us to bear the cross since these are the means which god chooses for the extension of his kingdom nor should we be impatient that the outward man is destroyed provided the inward man be renewed for this is the order of the kingdom of god that when we submit to his righteousness he makes us partakers of his glory this is accomplished when discovering his light and truth with perpetual accession of splendour before which the shades and falsehoods of satan and of his kingdom vanish and become extinct he by the aids of his spirit directs his children into the path of rectitude and strengthens them to persevere but defeats the impious conspiracies of his enemies confounds their insidious and fraudulent designs disappoints their malice and represses their obstinacy till at length he will consume antichrist with the spirit of his mouth and destroy all impiety with the brightness of his coming the third petition is that the will of god may be done on earth as it is in heaven which though it is an appendage to his kingdom and cannot be disjoined from it is yet not without reason separately mentioned on account of our ignorance which does not apprehend with facility what it is for god to reign in the world there will be nothing absurd then in understanding this as an explanation that god's kingdom will then prevail in the world when all shall submit to his will now we speak not here of his secret will by which he governs all things and appoints them to fulfil his own purposes for though satan and men oppose him with all the violence of rage yet his incomprehensible wisdom is able not only to divert their impetuosity but to overrule it for the accomplishment of his decrees but the divine will here intended is that to which voluntary obedience corresponds and therefore heaven is expressly compared with the earth 
because the angels as the psalmist says spontaneously do his commandments hearkening unto the voice of his word we are therefore commanded to desire that as in heaven nothing is done but according to the divine will and the angels are placidly conformed to everything that is right so the earth all obstinacy and depravity being annihilated may be subject to the same government and in praying for this we renounce our own carnal desires because unless we resign all our affections to god we are guilty of all the opposition in our power to his will for nothing proceeds from us but what is sinful and we are likewise habituated by this petition to a renunciation of ourselves that god may rule us according to his own pleasure and not only so but that he may also create in us new minds and new hearts annihilating our own that we may experience no emotion of desire within us but a mere consent to his will in a word that we may have no will of our own but that our hearts may be governed by his spirit by whose internal teachings we may learn to love those things which please him and to hate those which he disapproves consequently that he may render abortive all those desires which are repugnant to his will these are the three first clauses of this prayer in praying which we ought solely to have in view the glory of god omitting all consideration of ourselves and not regarding any advantage of our own which though they largely contribute to it should not be our end in these petitions but though all these things even if we never think of them nor wish for them nor request them must nevertheless happen in their appointed time yet they ought to be the objects of our wishes and the subjects of our prayers and such petitions it will be highly proper for us to offer that we may testify and profess ourselves to be the servants and sons of god manifesting the sincerest devotedness and making the most zealous efforts in our power for advancing the honour which is due to him both as a master and as a father persons therefore who are not incited by this ardent zeal for promoting the glory of god to pray that his name may be hallowed that his kingdom may come and that his will may be done are not to be numbered among his sons and servants and as all these things will be accomplished in opposition to their inclinations so they will contribute to their confusion and destruction next follows the second part of the prayer in which we descend to our own interests not that we must dismiss all thoughts of the divine glory which according to paul should be regarded even in eating and drinking and only seek what is advantageous to ourselves but we have already announced that this is the distinction that god by exclusively claiming three petitions absorbs us entirely in the consideration of himself that thus he may prove our piety afterwards he permits us to attend to our own interests yet on this condition that the end of all our requests be the illustration of his glory by whatever benefits he confers on us since nothing is more reasonable than that we live and die to him but the first petition of the second part give us this day our daily bread is a general request to god for a supply of all our corporeal wants in the present state not only for food and clothing but also for everything which he sees to be conducive to our good that we may eat our bread in peace by this we briefly surrender ourselves to his care and commit ourselves to his providence that he may feed nourish and preserve us for our most benevolent father disdains not to receive even our body into his charge and protection that he may exercise our faith in these minute circumstances while we expect everything from him even down to a crumb of bread and a drop of water for since it is a strange effect of our iniquity to be affected and distressed with greater solicitude for the body than for the soul many who venture to confide to god the interests of their souls are nevertheless still solicitous concerning the body still anxious what they shall eat and what they shall wear and unless they have an abundance of corn wine and oil for the supply of their future wants tremble with fear of so much greater importance to us is the shadow of this transitory life than that eternal immortality but they who confiding in god have once cast off that anxiety for the concerns of the body expect likewise to receive from him superior blessings even salvation and eternal life it is therefore no trivial exercise of faith to expect from god those things which otherwise fill us with so much anxiety nor is it a small proficiency when we have divested ourselves of this infidelity which is almost universally interwoven with the human constitution the speculations of some concerning supernatural bread appear to me not very consonant with the meaning of christ for if we did not ascribe to god the character of our supporter even in this transitory life our prayer would be defective 
the reason which they allege has too much profanity that it is unbecoming for the children of god who ought to be spiritual not only to devote their own attention to terrestrial cares but also to involve god in the same anxieties with themselves as though truly his benediction and paternal favour were not conspicuous even in our sustenance or there were no meaning in the assertion that godliness hath promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come now though remission of sins is of much greater value than corporeal aliments yet christ has given the first place to the inferior blessing that he might gradually raise us to the two remaining petitions which properly pertain to the heavenly life in which he has consulted our dullness we are commanded to ask our bread that we may be content with the portion which our heavenly father deigns to allot us nor practise any illicit arts for the love of lucre in the meantime it must be understood that it becomes ours by a title of donation because neither our industry nor our labour nor our hands as is observed by moses acquire anything for us of themselves when unattended by the divine blessing and that even an abundance of bread would not be of the least service to us unless it were by the divine power converted into nourishment and therefore this liberality of god is equally as necessary to the rich as to the poor for though their barns and cellars were full they would faint with hunger and thirst unless through his goodness they enjoyed their food the expression this day or day by day as it is in the other evangelist and the epithet daily restrain the inordinate desire of transitory things with which we are often violently inflamed and which leads to other evils since if we have a greater abundance we fondly lavish it away in pleasure delights ostentation and other kinds of luxury therefore we are enjoined to ask only as much as will supply our necessity and as it were for the present day with this confidence that our heavenly father after having fed us to-day will not fail us to-morrow whatever affluence then we possess even when our barns and cellars are full yet it behoves us always to ask for our daily bread because it must be considered as an undeniable truth that all property is nothing any further than the lord by the effusions of his favour blesses it with continual improvement and that even what we have in our possession is not our own any further than he hourly bestows on us some portion of it and grants us the use of it since the pride of man does not easily suffer itself to be convinced of this the lord declares that he has given to all ages an eminent proof of it by feeding his people with manna in the desert in order to apprise us that man doth not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of his mouth which implies that it is his power alone by which our life and strength are sustained although he communicates it to us by corporeal means as he is accustomed to teach us likewise by an opposite example when he breaks at his pleasure the strength and as he himself calls it the staff of bread so that though men eat they pine with hunger and though they drink are parched with thirst now they who are not satisfied with daily bread but whose avidity is insatiable and whose desires are unbounded and they who are satiated with their abundance and think themselves secure amid their immense riches and who nevertheless supplicate the divine being in this petition are guilty of mocking him for the former ask what they would not wish to obtain and even what most of all they abominate that is daily bread only they conceal from god as much as they can their avaricious disposition whereas true prayer ought to pour out before him the whole mind and all the inmost secrets of the soul and the latter implore what they are far from expecting to receive from him what they think they have in their own possession in its being called ours the divine goodness is as we have observed the more conspicuous since it makes that ours to which we have no claim of right yet we must not reject the explanation which i have likewise hinted at that it intends also such as is acquired by just and innocent labour and not procured by acts of deception and rapine because whatever we acquire by any criminal methods is never our own but belongs to others our praying that it may be given to us signifies that it is the simple and gratuitous donation of god from what quarter soever we receive it even when it most of all appears to be obtained by our own skill and industry and to be procured by our own hands since it is solely the effect of his blessing that our labours are attended with success book three chapter twenty section forty five to book three chapter twenty two section eight it follows forgive us our debts in which petition and the next christ has comprised whatever relates to the heavenly life as in these two parts consists the spiritual covenant which god has made for the salvation of his church i will write my law in their hearts and will pardon their iniquities here christ begins with remission of sins immediately after he subjoins a second favour 
that God would defend us by the power and support us by the aid of his Spirit to enable us to stand unconquered against all temptations. Sins he calls debts because we owe the penalty of them, a debt we are altogether incapable of discharging unless we are released by this remission, which is a pardon flowing from his gratuitous mercy, when he freely cancels these debts without any payment from us, being satisfied by his own mercy in Christ, who has once given himself for our redemption. Those, therefore, who rely on God's being satisfied with their own merits or the merits of others, and persuade themselves that remission of sins is purchased by these satisfactions, have no interest in this gratuitous forgiveness, and while they call upon God in this form, they are only subscribing their own accusation, and even sealing their condemnation with their own testimony. For they confess themselves debtors unless they are discharged by the benefit of remission, which nevertheless they accept not, but rather refuse, while they obtrude upon God their own merits and satisfactions. For in this way they do not implore his mercy, but appeal to his judgment. They, who amuse themselves with dreams of perfection, superseding the necessity of praying for pardon, may have disciples whom itching ears lead into delusions, but it must be clear that all whom they gain are perverted from Christ, since he teaches all to confess their guilt, and receives none but sinners, not that he would flatter and encourage sins, but because he knew that believers are never wholly free from the vices of their flesh, but always remain obnoxious to the judgment of God. It ought indeed to be the object of our desires and strenuous exertions that, having fully discharged every part of our duty, we may truly congratulate ourselves before God on being pure from every stain. But as it pleases God to restore his image within us by degrees, so that some contagion always remains in our flesh, the remedy ought never to be neglected. Now if Christ, by the authority given him by the Father, enjoins us, as long as we live, to have recourse to prayer for the pardon of guilt, who will tolerate the new teachers who endeavour to dazzle the eyes of the simple with a visionary phantom of perfect innocence, and fill them with a confidence in the possibility of their being delivered from all sin, which, according to John, is no other than making God a liar? At the same time also these worthless men, by obliterating one article, mutilate and so totally invalidate the covenant of God, in which we have seen our salvation is contained being thus guilty not only of sacrilege by separating things so united, but also of impiety and cruelty by overwhelming miserable souls with despair, and of treachery to themselves and others by contracting a habit of carelessness in diametrical opposition to the divine mercy. The objection of some, that in wishing the advent of God's kingdom, we desire at the same time the abolition of sin is too puerile, because in the first part of the prayer we have an exhibition of the highest perfection, but here of infirmity. Thus these two things are perfectly consistent, that in aspiring towards the mark we may not neglect the remedies required by our necessity. Lastly, we pray that we may be forgiven as we forgive our debtors, that is, as we forgive and pardon all who have ever injured us, either by unjust actions or by contumulous language. Not that it is our province to forgive the guilt of sin and transgression, this is the prerogative of God alone, our forgiveness consists in divesting the mind of anger, enmity, and desire of revenge, and losing the memory of injuries by a voluntary forgetfulness. Wherefore we must not pray to God for forgiveness of sins unless we also forgive all the offences and injuries of others against us, either present or past. But if we retain any enmities in our minds, meditate acts of revenge, and seek opportunities of annoyance, and even if we do not endeavour to obtain reconciliation with our enemies, to oblige them by all kind offices, and to render them our friends, we beseech God by this petition not to grant us remission of sins. For we supplicate him to grant to us what we grant to others. This is praying him not to grant it to us unless we grant it also. What do persons of this description gain by their prayers but a heavier judgment? Lastly, it must be observed that this is not a condition that he would forgive us as we forgive our debtors, because we can merit his forgiveness of us by our forgiveness of others, as though it described the cause of his forgiveness. But by this expression the Lord intended partly to comfort the weakness of our faith, for he has added this as a sign that we may be as certainly assured of remission of sins being granted us by him as we are certain and conscious of our granting it to others. If at the same time our minds be freed and purified from all hatred, envy and revenge. Partly by this as a criterion he expunges from the number of his children those who, hasty to revenge and difficult to forgive, maintain inveterate enmities and cherish in their own hearts towards others 
that indignation which they deprecate from themselves, that they may not presume to invoke him as their father, which is also clearly expressed by Luke in Christ's own words. The sixth petition is, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This, as we have said, corresponds to the promise respecting the law of God to be engraven in our hearts. But because our obedience to God is not without continual warfare and severe and arduous conflicts, we pray here for arms and assistance to enable us to gain the victory. This suggests to us our necessity, not only of the grace of the Spirit within us to soften, bend, and direct our hearts to obedience to God, but also of his aid to render us invincible in opposition to all these stratagems and violent assaults of Satan. Now the forms of temptations are many and varied, for the corrupt conceptions of the mind, provoking us to transgressions of the law, whether suggested by our own concupiscence or excited by the devil, are temptations, and things not evil in themselves, nevertheless become temptations through the subtlety of the devil when they are obtruded on our eyes in such a manner that their intervention occasions our seduction or declension from god and these temptations are either from prosperous or from adverse events from prosperous ones as riches power honours which generally dazzle men's eyes by their glitter and external appearance of goodness and ensnare them with their blandishments that caught with such delusions and intoxicated with such delights they forget their god from unpropitious ones, as poverty, reproaches, contempt, afflictions, and other things of this kind, overcome with the bitterness and difficulty of which they fall into despondency, cast away faith and hope, and at length become altogether alienated from God. To both these kinds of temptations which assail us, whether kindled within us by our concupiscence, or presented to us by the craft of Satan, we pray our Heavenly Father not to permit us to yield, but rather to sustain and raise us up with his hand, that, strong in his might, we may be able to stand firm against all the assaults of our malignant enemy, whatever imaginations he may inject into our minds, and also that whatever is presented to us on either quarter, we may convert it to our benefit, that is, by not being elated with prosperity or dejected with adversity. Yet we do not here pray for an entire exception from all temptations, which we very much need, to excite, stimulate, and animate us, lest we should grow torpid with too much rest, for it was not without reason that David wished to be tempted or tried, nor is it without cause that the Lord daily tries his elect, chastising them by ignominy, poverty, tribulation, and the cross in various forms. But the temptations of God are widely different from those of Satan. Satan tempts to overthrow, condemn, confound, and destroy. But God, that by proving his people, he may make a trial of their sincerity to confirm their strength by exercising it, to mortify, purify, and refine their flesh, which, without such restraints, would run into the greatest excesses. Besides, Satan attacks persons unarmed and unprepared to overwhelm the unwary. God, with the temptation, also makes a way to escape, that they may be able to bear whatever he brings upon them. By the word evil, whether we understand the devil or sin, is of little importance. Satan himself, indeed, is the enemy that lies in wait for our life, but sin is the weapon with which he seeks our destruction. Our petition, therefore, is that we may not be overwhelmed and conquered by any temptations, but that we may stand strong in the power of the Lord against all adverse powers that assault us, which is not to submit to temptations, that, being taken into his custody and charge, and being secure in his protection, we may persevere unconquered, and rise superior to sin, death, the gates of hell, and the whole kingdom of the devil. This is being delivered from evil. Here it must also be carefully remarked that it is not in our power to contend with so powerful an enemy as the devil, and sustain the violence of his assaults. Otherwise it would be useless or insulting to supplicate from God what we already possessed in ourselves. Certainly they who prepare themselves for such a combat with self-confidence are not sufficiently aware of the skill and prowess of the enemy that they have to meet. Now we pray to be delivered from his power, as from the mouth of a ravenous and raging lion, just about to tear us with his teeth and claws, and to swallow us down his throat, unless the Lord snatch us from the jaws of death, knowing at the same time that if the Lord shall be present and fight for us while we are silent, in his strength we shall do valiantly." Let others confide as they please in the native abilities and powers of free will which they suppose themselves to possess. 
let it be sufficient for us to stand and be strong in the power of God alone. But this petition comprehends more than at first appears, for if the Spirit of God is our strength for fighting the battle with Satan, we shall not be able to gain the victory till, being full of him, we shall have laid aside all the infirmity of our flesh. When we pray for deliverance from Satan and sin, therefore we pray to be frequently enriched with new accessions of divine grace, till, being quite filled with them, we may be able to triumph over all evil. To some there appears a difficulty and harshness in our petition to God, that he will not lead us into temptation, whereas according to James it is contrary to his nature for him to tempt us. But this objection has already been partly answered, because our own lust is properly the cause of all the temptations that overcome us, and therefore we are charged with the guilt. Nor does James intend any other than to assert the futility and injustice of transferring to God the vices which we are constrained to impute to ourselves, because we are conscious of our being guilty of them. But notwithstanding this, God may, when he sees fit, deliver us to Satan, abandon us to a reprobate mind and sordid passions, and so lead us into temptations by a righteous yet often secret judgment, the cause being frequently concealed from man, but at the same time well known to him. Whence it is inferred that there is no impropriety in this mode of expression, if we are persuaded that there is any meaning in his frequent threatenings, that he will manifest his vengeance on the reprobate by smiting them with blindness and hardness of heart. These three petitions, in which we particularly commend to God ourselves and all our concerns, evidently prove what we have before asserted, that the prayers of Christians ought to be public, and to regard the public edification of the church and the advancement of the communion of believers. For each individual does not supplicate the gift of any favour to himself in particular, but we all, in common, pray for our bread, the remission of our sins, that we may not be led into temptation, that we may be delivered from evil. The cause is likewise subjoined, which gives us great boldness in asking, and confidence of obtaining, which, though not to be found in the Latin copies, yet appears too apposite to this place to be omitted, namely, His is the kingdom, and the power and the glory for ever. This is a solid and secure basis for our faith, for if our prayers were to be recommended to God by our own merit, who could dare to utter a word in His presence? Now, all miserable, unworthy, and destitute as we are of every recommendation, yet we shall never want an argument or plea for our prayers. Our confidence can never forsake us, for our Father can never be deprived of his kingdom, power, and glory. The whole is concluded with Amen, which expresses our ardent desire to obtain the blessings supplicated of God, and confirms our hope that all these things are already obtained, and will certainly be granted to us, because they are promised by God, who is incapable of deception. And this agrees with that form of petition already quoted, Do this, O Lord, for thy name's sake, not for our sake, or for our righteousness, in which the saints not only express the end of their prayers, but acknowledge that they are unworthy to obtain it, unless God derive the cause from himself, and that their confidence of success arises solely from his nature. Whatever we ought, or are even at liberty to seek from God, is stated to us in this model and directory for prayer, given by that best of masters, Christ, whom the Father has set over us as our teacher, and to whom alone he has enjoined us to listen. For he was always his eternal wisdom, and being made man, was given to men as the angel of great counsel. And this prayer is so comprehensive and complete, that whatever addition is made of anything extraneous or foreign, not capable of being referred to it, is impious and unworthy of the approbation of God. For in this summary he has prescribed what is worthy of him, what is acceptable to him, what is necessary for us, and, in a word, what he chooses to bestow. Wherefore those who presume to go beyond it, and to ask of God anything else, in the first place are determined to make some addition of their own to the wisdom of God, which cannot be done without folly and blasphemy. In the next place, despising the limits fixed by the will of God, they are led far astray by their own irregular desires. And, in the last place, they will never obtain anything, since they pray without faith. And there is no doubt that all prayers of this kind are made without faith, because they are not sanctioned by the word of God, the only basis on which faith can stand. But they who neglect the Master's rule and indulge their own desires not only deviate from the word of God, but make all possible opposition against it. With equal beauty and truth, therefore, Tertullian has called this a legitimate prayer, 
tacitly implying that all others are irregular and unlawful. We would not here be understood as if we were confined to this form of prayer without the liberty of changing a word or syllable, for the scripture contains many prayers expressed in words very different from this, yet written by the same spirit and very profitable for our use. Many, which have little verbal resemblance to it, are continually suggested to believers by the same spirit. We only mean by these observations that no one should even seek, expect, or ask for anything that is not summarily comprehended in this prayer, though there may be a diversity of expression without any variation of sense. As it is certain that all the prayers contained in the scriptures or proceeding from pious hearts are referred to this, so it is impossible to find one anywhere which can surpass or even equal the perfection of this. Here is nothing omitted which ought to be recollected for the praises of God, nothing that should occur to the mind of man for his own advantage, and the whole is so complete as justly to inspire universal despair of attempting any improvement. To conclude, let us remember that this is the teaching of divine wisdom, which taught what it willed, and willed what is needful. But though we have before said that we ought to be always aspiring towards God with our minds, and praying without intermission, yet as our weakness requires many assistances, and our indolence needs to be stimulated, we ought, every one of us, for the sake of regularity, to appoint particular hours which should not elapse without prayer, and which should witness all the affections of the mind entirely engaged in this exercise, as, when we rise in the morning, before we enter on the business of the day, when we sit down to meet, when we have been fed by the divine blessing, when we retire to rest. This must not be a superstitious observance of hours, by which, as if discharging our debt to God, we may fancy ourselves discharged of all obligation for the remaining hours, but a discipline for our weakness, which may thus from time to time be exercised and stimulated. It must especially be the object of our solicitous care, whenever we are oppressed, or see others oppressed with adversity, immediately to resort to him with celerity, not of body, but of mind. Secondly, to suffer no prosperity of our own or others to pass without testifying our acknowledgment of his hand by praise and thanksgiving. Lastly, we must carefully observe this in every prayer, that we entertain not the thought of binding God to certain circumstances, or prescribing to him the time, the place, or the manner of his proceedings. As we are taught by this prayer to fix no law, to impose no condition on him, but to leave it to his will to do what he intends, in the manner at the time and in the place he pleases. Therefore, before we form a petition for ourselves, we first pray that his will may be done, thereby submitting our will to his, that, being as it were bridled and restrained, it may not presume to regulate God, but may constitute him the arbiter and ruler of all its desires. If, with minds composed to this obedience, we suffer ourselves to be governed by the laws of divine providence, we shall easily learn to persevere in prayer, and with suspended desires, to wait patiently for the Lord, assured, though he does not discover himself, yet that he is always near us, and in his own time will declare that his ears have not been deaf to those prayers which, to human apprehension, seemed to be neglected. Now this, if God do not at any time answer our first prayers, will be an immediate consolation to prevent our sinking into despair, like those who, actuated by their own ardour, call upon God in such a manner that, if he do not attend to their first transports and afford them present aid, they at once imagine him to be displeased and angry with them, and casting away all hope of succeeding in their prayers, cease to call upon him. But deferring our hope with a well-tempered equanimity, let us rather practice the perseverance so often recommended to us in the scriptures. For in the Psalms we may frequently observe how David and other faithful men, when almost wearied with praying, they seemed to beat the air, and God seemed deaf to their petitions, yet did not desist from praying, because the authority of the divine word is not maintained unless it be fully credited, notwithstanding the appearance of any circumstances to the contrary nor let us tempt God and provoke him against us by wearying him with our presumption, which is the practice of many who merely bargain with God on a certain condition, as though he were subservient to their passions, bind him with laws of their own stipulation, with which, unless he immediately complies, they give way to anger and fretfulness, to cavils and murmurs and rage. To such persons, therefore, he frequently grants in his wrath what he denies in mercy to others." This is exemplified in the children of Israel, for whom it had been better for the Lord not to have heard them, than for them to swallow his indignation with the meat that he sent them. 
but if after long waiting our sense neither understands what advance we have made by praying nor experiences any advantage resulting from it yet our faith will assure us what cannot be perceived by sense that we have obtained what was expedient for us since the lord so frequently and so certainly promises to take care of our troubles when they have been once deposited in his bosom and thus he will cause us to possess abundance in poverty and consolation in affliction for though all things fail us yet god will never forsake us he cannot disappoint the expectation and patience of his people he will amply compensate us for the loss of all others for he comprehends in himself all blessings which he will reveal to us at the day of judgment when his kingdom will be fully manifested besides though god grants our prayers he does not always answer them according to the express form of the request but seeming to keep us in suspense shows by unknown means that our prayers were not in vain this is the meaning of those words of john if we know that he heareth us whatsoever we ask we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him this seems to be a feeble superfluity of expression but is in reality a very useful declaration that god even when he does not comply with our desires is nevertheless favourable and propitious to our prayers so that a hope depending upon his word can never disappoint us now this patience is very necessary to support believers who would not long stand unless they relied upon it for the lord proves his people with heavy trials and exercises them with severity frequently driving them to various kinds of extremities and suffering them to remain in them a long time before he grants them any enjoyment of his grace and as hannah says the lord killeth and maketh alive he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up in such distresses must they not inevitably faint in their minds and fall into despair unless in the midst of their affliction and desolation and almost death they were revived by this reflection that god regards them and that the end of their present evils is approaching but though they rely on the certainty of this hope they at the same time cease not to pray because without constant perseverance in prayer we pray to no purpose chapter twenty one eternal election or god's predestination of some to salvation and of others to destruction the covenant of life not being equally preached to all and among those to whom it is preached not always finding the same reception this diversity discovers the wonderful depth of the divine judgment nor is it to be doubted that this variety also follows subject to the decision of god's eternal election if it be evidently the result of the divine will that salvation is freely offered to some and others are prevented from attaining it this immediately gives rise to important and difficult questions which are incapable of any other explication than by the establishment of pious minds in what ought to be received concerning election and predestination a question in the opinion of many full of perplexity for they consider nothing more unreasonable than that of the common mass of mankind some should be predestined to salvation and others to destruction but how unreasonably they perplex themselves will afterwards appear from the sequel of our discourse besides the very obscurity which excites such dread not only displays the utility of this doctrine but shows it to be productive of the most delightful benefit we shall never be clearly convinced as we ought to be that our salvation flows from the fountain of god's free mercy till we are acquainted with his eternal election which illustrates the grace of god by this comparison that he adopts not all promiscuously to the hope of salvation but gives to some what he refuses to others ignorance of this principle evidently detracts from the divine glory and diminishes real humility but according to paul what is so necessary to be known can never be known unless god without any regard to works chooses those whom he has decreed at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace and if by grace then it is no more of works otherwise grace is no more grace but if it be of works then it is no more grace otherwise work is no more work if we need to be recalled to the origin of election to prove that we obtain salvation from no other source than the mere goodness of god they who desire to extinguish this principle do all they can to obscure what ought to be magnificently and loudly celebrated and to pluck up humility by the roots in ascribing the salvation of the remnant of the people to the election of grace paul clearly testifies that it is then only known that god saves whom he will of his mere good pleasure and does not dispense a reward to which there can be no claim they who shut the gates to prevent any one from presuming to approach and taste this doctrine do no less injury to man than to god 
for nothing else will be sufficient to produce in us suitable humility or to impress us with a due sense of our great obligations to God. Nor is there any other basis for solid confidence, even according to the authority of Christ, who, to deliver us from all fear and render us invincible amidst so many dangers, snares, and deadly conflicts, promises to preserve in safety all whom the Father has committed to his care. Whence we infer that they who know not themselves to be God's peculiar people will be tortured with continual anxiety, and therefore that the interest of all believers, as well as their own, is very badly consulted by those who, blind to the three advantages we have remarked, would wholly remove the foundation of our salvation. And hence the church rises to our view, which otherwise, as Bernard justly observes, could neither be discovered nor recognized among creatures, being in two respects wonderfully concealed in the bosom of a blessed predestination, and in the mass of a miserable damnation. But before I enter on the subject itself, I must address some preliminary observations to two sorts of persons. The discussion of predestination, a subject of itself rather intricate, is made very perplexed and therefore dangerous by human curiosity, which no barriers can restrain from wandering into forbidden labyrinths and soaring beyond its sphere, as if determined to leave none of the divine secrets unscrutinized or unexplored. As we see multitudes everywhere guilty of this arrogance and presumption, and among them some who are not censurable in other respects, it is proper to admonish them of the bounds of their duty on this subject. First then let them remember that when they inquire into predestination they penetrate the inmost recesses of divine wisdom, where the careless and confident intruder will obtain no satisfaction to his curiosity, but will enter a labyrinth from which he will find no way to depart. For it is unreasonable that man should scrutinize with impunity those things which the Lord has determined to be hidden in himself, and investigate, even from eternity, that sublimity of wisdom which God would have us to adore and not comprehend to promote our admiration of his glory. The secrets of his will, which he determined to reveal to us, he discovers in his word, and these are all that he foresaw would concern us or conduce to our advantage. Quote, we are come into the way of faith, says Augustine, let us constantly pursue it. It conducts into the king's palace, in which are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. For the Lord Christ himself envied not his great and most select disciples when he said, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. We must walk, we must improve, we must grow, that our hearts may be able to understand those things of which we are at present incapable. If the last day finds us improving, we shall then learn what we never could learn in the present state. End quote. If we only consider that the word of the Lord is the only way to lead us to an investigation of all that ought to be believed concerning him, and the only light to enlighten us to behold all that ought to be seen of him, this consideration will easily restrain and preserve us from all presumption, for we shall know that when we have exceeded the limits of the word, we shall get into a devious and darksome course, in which errors, slips, and falls will often be inevitable. Let us then, in the first place, bear in mind that to desire any knowledge of predestination than what is unfolded in the word of God, indicates as great folly as to wish to walk through unpassable roads or to see in the dark. Nor let us be ashamed to be ignorant of some things relative to a subject in which there is a kind of learned ignorance. Rather, let us abstain with cheerfulness from the pursuit of that knowledge, the affectation of which is foolish, dangerous, and even fatal. But if we are stimulated by the wantonness of intellect, we must oppose it with a reflection calculated to repress it, that, as it is not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory is not glory, for there is sufficient to deter us from that presumption which can only precipitate us into ruin. Others, desirous of remedying this evil, will have all mention of predestination to be as it were buried. They teach men to avoid every question concerning it as they would a precipice, though their moderation is to be commended in judging that mysteries ought to be handled with such great sobriety, yet, as they descend too low, they have little influence on the mind of man which refuses to submit to unreasonable restraints. To observe, therefore, the legitimate boundary on this side also, we must recur to the word of the Lord, which affords a certain rule for the understanding. For the Scripture is the school of the Holy Spirit, in which, as nothing necessary and useful to be known is omitted, 
so nothing is taught which it is not beneficial to know. Whatever therefore is declared in the scripture concerning predestination, we must be cautious not to withhold from believers, lest we appear either to defraud them of the favour of their God, or to reprove and censure the Holy Spirit for publishing what it would be useful by any means to suppress. Let us, I say, permit the Christian man to open his heart and his ears to all the discourses addressed to him by God, only with this moderation, that as soon as the Lord closes his sacred mouth, he shall also desist from further inquiry. This will be the best barrier of sobriety, if in learning we not only follow the leadings of God, but as soon as he ceases to teach, we give up our desire of learning. Nor is the danger they dread sufficient to divert our attention from the oracles of God. It is a celebrated observation of Solomon that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but as both piety and common sense suggest that this is not to be understood generally of everything we must seek for the proper distinction lest we content ourselves with brutish ignorance under the pretext of modesty and sobriety now this distinction is clearly expressed in a few words by moses the secret things he says belong unto the lord our god but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children for ever that we may do all the words of this law for we see how he enforces on the people attention to the doctrine of the law only by the celestial decree, because it pleased God to promulgate it, and restrains the same people within those limits with this single reason, that it is not lawful for mortals to intrude into the secrets of God. Profane persons, I confess, suddenly lay hold of something relating to the subject of predestination to furnish occasion for objections, cavils, reproaches, and ridicule, but if we are frightened from it by their impudence, all the principal articles of the faith must be concealed, for there is scarcely one of them which such persons as these leave unviolated by blasphemy. The refractory mind will discover as much insolence on hearing that there are three persons in the divine essence, as on being told that when God created man he foresaw what would happen concerning him nor will they refrain from derision on being informed that little more than five thousand years have elapsed since the creation of the world they will ask why the power of God was so long idle and asleep. Nothing can be advanced which they will not endeavour to ridicule. Must we, in order to check these sacrileges, say nothing of the divinity of the Son and Spirit, or pass over in silence the creation of the world? In this instance, and every other, the truth of God is too powerful to dread the detraction of impious men, as is strenuously maintained by Augustine in his treatise on the perseverance of the faithful. We see the false apostles, with all their defamation and accusation of the true doctrine of Paul, could never succeed to make him ashamed of it. Their assertion that all this discussion is dangerous to pious minds because it is inconsistent with exhortations, shakes their faith, and disturbs and discourages the heart itself, is without any foundation. Augustine admits that he was frequently blamed on these accounts for preaching predestination too freely, but he readily and amply refutes them. But, as many and various absurdities are crowded upon us here, we prefer reserving every one to be refuted in its proper place. I only desire this general admission, that we should neither scrutinize those things which the Lord has left concealed, nor neglect those which he has openly exhibited, lest we be condemned for excessive curiosity on the one hand, or for ingratitude on the other. For it is judiciously remarked by Augustine that we may safely follow the scripture which proceeds as with the pace of a mother stooping to the weakness of a child, that it may not leave our weak capacities behind. But persons who are so cautious or timid as to wish predestination to be buried in silence, lest feeble minds should be disturbed, with what pretext, I ask, will they gloss over their arrogance which indirectly charges God with foolish inadvertency? as though he foresaw not the danger which they suppose they have had the penetration to discover. Whoever therefore endeavours to raise prejudices against the doctrine of predestination, openly reproaches God as though something had inconsiderately escaped from him that is pernicious to the church. Predestination by which God adopts some to the hope of life, and adjudges others to eternal death, no one, desirous of the credit of piety, dares absolutely to deny but it is involved in many cavils especially by those who make foreknowledge the cause of it we maintain that both belong to god but it is preposterous to represent one as dependent on the other when we attribute foreknowledge to god we mean that all things have ever been and perpetually remain before his eyes so that to this knowledge nothing is future or past but all things are present 
and present in such a manner that he does not merely conceive of them from ideas formed in his mind as things remembered by us appear present to our minds but really beholds and sees them as if actually placed before him and this foreknowledge extends to the whole world and to all the creatures predestination we call the eternal decree of god by which he has determined in himself what he would have to become of every individual of mankind for they are not all created with a similar destiny but eternal life is foreordained for some and eternal damnation for others every man therefore being created for one or the other of these ends we say he is predestinated either to life or to death this god has not only testified in particular persons but has given a specimen of it in the whole posterity of abraham which should evidently show the future condition of every nation to depend upon his decision when the most high divided the nations when he separated the sons of adam the lord's portion was his people jacob was the lot of his inheritance the separation is before the eyes of all in the person of abraham as in the dry trunk of a tree one people is peculiarly chosen to the rejection of others no reason for this appears except that moses to deprive their posterity of all occasion of glorying teaches them that their exaltation is holy from god's gratuitous love he assigns this reason for their deliverance that he loved their fathers and chose their seed after them more fully in another chapter the lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people but because the lord loved you he frequently repeats the same admonition behold the heaven is the lord's thy god the earth also with all that therein is only the lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them and he chose their seed after them in another place sanctification is enjoined upon them because they were chosen to be a peculiar people and again elsewhere love is asserted to be the cause of their protection it is declared by the united voice of the faithful he hath chosen our inheritance for us the excellency of jacob whom he loved for the gifts conferred on them by god they ascribe all to gratuitous love not only from a consciousness that these were not obtained by any merit of theirs but from a conviction that the holy patriarch himself was not endued with such excellence as to acquire the privilege of so great an honour for himself and his posterity and the more effectually to demolish all pride he reproaches them with having deserved no favour being a stiff-necked and rebellious people the prophets also frequently reproach the jews with the unwelcome mention of this election because they had shamefully departed from it let them however now come forward who wish to restrict the election of god to the desert of men or the merit of works when they see one nation preferred to all others when they hear that god had no inducement to be more favourable to a few and ignoble and even disobedient and obstinate people will they quarrel with him because he has chosen to give such an example of mercy but their obstreperous clamours will not impede his work nor will the reproaches they hurl against heaven injure or affect his justice they will rather recoil upon their own heads to this principle of the gracious covenant the israelites are also recalled whenever thanks are to be rendered to god or their hopes are to be raised for futurity he hath made us and not we ourselves says the psalmist we are his people and the sheep of his pasture it is not without reason that the negation is added not we ourselves that they may know that of all the benefits they enjoy god is not only the author but derived the cause from himself there being nothing in them deserving of such great honour he also enjoins them to be content with the mere good pleasure of god in these words o ye seed of abraham his servant ye children of jacob his chosen and after having recounted the continual benefits bestowed by god as fruits of election he at length concludes that he had acted with such liberality because he remembered his covenant consistent with this doctrine is the song of the whole church thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance gave our fathers the land because thou hadst a favour unto them it must be observed that where mention is made of the land it is a visible symbol of the secret separation which comprehends adoption david in another place exhorts the people to the same gratitude blessed is the nation whose god is the lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance samuel animates to a good hope the lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake because it hath pleased the lord to make you his people david when his faith is assailed thus arms himself for the conflict blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee he shall dwell in thy courts 
but since the election hidden in god has been confirmed by the first deliverance as well as by the second and other intermediate blessings the word choose is transferred to it in isaiah the lord will have mercy on jacob and will yet choose israel because contemplating a future period he declares that the collection of the residue of the people whom he had appeared to have forsaken would be a sign of the stable and sure election which had likewise seemed to fail when he says also in another place i have chosen thee and not cast thee away he commends the continual course of his signal liberality and paternal benevolence the angel in zechariah speaks more plainly the lord shall choose jerusalem again as though his severe chastisement had been a rejection or their exile had been an interruption of election which nevertheless remains inviolable though the tokens of it are not always visible we must now proceed to a second degree of election still more restricted or that in which the divine grace was displayed in a more special manner when of the same race of abraham god rejected some and by nourishing others in the church proved that he retained them among his children ishmael at first obtained the same station as his brother isaac for the spiritual covenant was equally sealed in him by the symbol of circumcision he is cut off afterwards esau lastly an innumerable multitude and almost all israel in isaac the seed was called the same calling continued in jacob god exhibited a similar example in the rejection of saul which is magnificently celebrated by the psalmist he refused the tabernacle of joseph and chose not the tribe of ephraim but chose the tribe of judah and this the sacred history frequently repeats that the wonderful secret of divine grace may be more manifest in that change i grant it was by their own crime and guilt that ishmael esau and persons of similar characters fell from the adoption because the condition annexed was that they should faithfully keep the covenant of god which they perfidiously violated yet it was a peculiar favour of god that he deigned to prefer them to other nations as it is said in the psalms he hath not dealt so with any nation and as for his judgments they have not known them but i have justly said that here are two degrees to be remarked for in the election of the whole nation god has already shown that in his mere goodness he is bound by no laws but is perfectly free so that none can require of him an equal distribution of grace the inequality of which demonstrates it to be truly gratuitous therefore malachi aggravates the ingratitude of israel because though not only elected out of the whole race of mankind but also separated from a sacred family to be a peculiar people they perfidiously and impiously despised god their most beneficent father was not esau jacob's brother saith the lord yet i loved jacob and i hated esau for god takes it for granted since both were sons of a holy father successors of the covenant and branches from a sacred root that the children of jacob were already laid under more than common obligations by their admission to that honour but esau the firstborn having been rejected and their father though inferior by birth having been made the heir he proves them guilty of double ingratitude and complains of their violating this twofold claim though it is sufficiently clear that god in his secret counsel freely chooses whom he will and rejects others his gratuitous election is but half displayed till we come to particular individuals to whom god not only offers salvation but assigns it in such a manner that the certainty of the effect is liable to no suspense or doubt these are included in that one seed mentioned by paul for though the adoption was deposited in the hand of abraham yet many of his posterity being cut off as putrid members in order to maintain the efficacy and stability of election it is necessary to ascend to the head in whom their heavenly father has bound his elect to each other and united them to himself by an indissoluble bond thus the adoption of the family of abraham displayed the favour of god which he denied to others but in the members of christ there is a conspicuous exhibition of the superior efficacy of grace because being united to their head they never fail of salvation paul therefore justly reasons from the passage of malachi which i have just quoted that where god introducing the covenant of eternal life invites any people to himself there is a peculiar kind of election as to part of them so that he does not efficaciously choose all with indiscriminate grace the declaration jacob have i loved respects the whole posterity of the patriarch whom the prophet there opposes to the descendants of esau yet this is no objection to our having in the person of one individual a specimen of the election which can never fail of attaining its full effect 
These, who truly belong to Christ, Paul correctly observes, are called a remnant, for experience proves that of a great multitude the most part fall away and disappear, so that often only a small portion remains. That the general election of a people is not always effectual and permanent, a reason readily presents itself, because when God covenants with them, he does not also give them the spirit of regeneration to enable them to persevere in the covenant to the end. But the external call, without the internal efficacy of grace, which would be sufficient for their preservation, is a kind of medium between the rejection of all mankind and the election of the small number of believers. The whole nation of Israel was called God's inheritance, though many of them were strangers. But God, having firmly covenanted to be their father and redeemer, regards that gratuitous favour rather than the defection of multitudes, by whom his truth was not violated, because his preservation of a certain remnant to himself made it evident that his calling was without repentance. For God's collection of a church for himself, from time to time, from the children of Abraham, rather than from the profane nations, was in consideration of his covenant, which, being violated by the multitude, he restricted to a few, to prevent its total failure. Lastly, the general adoption of the seed of Abraham was a visible representation of a greater blessing which God conferred on a few out of the multitude. This is the reason that Paul so carefully distinguishes the descendants of Abraham according to the flesh from his spiritual children called after the example of Isaac. Not that the mere descent from Abraham was a vain and unprofitable thing, which could not be asserted without depreciating the covenant but because to the latter alone the immutable counsel of God, in which he predestinated whom he would, was of itself effectual to salvation. But I advise my readers to adopt no prejudice on either side till it shall appear from adduced passages of Scripture what sentiments ought to be entertained. In conformity, therefore, to the clear doctrine of the Scripture, we assert that by an eternal and immutable counsel God has once for all determined both whom he would admit to salvation and whom he would condemn to destruction. We affirm that this counsel, as far as concerns the elect, is founded on his gratuitous mercy, totally irrespective of human merit, but that to those whom he devotes to condemnation the gate of life is closed by just and irreprehensible but incomprehensible judgment. In the elect we consider calling as an evidence of election, and justification as another token of its manifestation, till they arrive in glory which constitutes its completion. As God seals his elect by vocation and justification, so by excluding the reprobate from the knowledge of his name and the sanctification of his spirit, he affords an indication of the judgment that awaits them. Here I shall pass over many fictions fabricated by foolish men to overthrow predestination, it is unnecessary to refute things which, as soon as they are advanced, sufficiently prove their own falsehood. I shall dwell only on those things which are subjects of controversy among the learned, or which may occasion difficulty to simple minds, or which impiety speciously pleads in order to stigmatize the divine justice. Chapter 22. Testimonies of Scripture in Confirmation of this Doctrine all the positions we have advanced are controverted by many, especially the gratuitous election of believers, which nevertheless cannot be shaken. It is a notion commonly entertained that God, foreseeing what would be the respective merits of every individual, makes a correspondent distinction between different persons, that he adopts as his children such as he foreknows will be deserving of his grace, and devotes to the damnation of death others whose dispositions he sees will be inclined to wickedness and impiety. Thus they not only obscure election by covering it with the veil of foreknowledge, but pretend that it originates in another cause. Nor is this commonly received notion the opinion of the vulgar only, for it has had great advocates in all ages, which I candidly confess that no one may cherish a confidence of injuring our cause by opposing us with their names, for the truth of God on this point is too certain to be shaken, too clear to be overthrown by the authority of men. Others, neither acquainted with the scripture nor deserving of any attention, oppose the sound doctrine with extreme presumption and intolerable affrontery. God's sovereign election of some and preterition of others, they make the subject of formal accusation against him. But if this is the known fact, what will they gain by quarrelling with God? We teach nothing but what experience has proved, that God has always been at liberty to bestow his grace on whom he chooses. I will not inquire how the posterity of Abraham excelled other nations, unless it was by that favour, the cause of which can only be found in God. 
let them answer why they are men and not oxen or asses, when it was in God's power to create them dogs, he formed them after his own image. Will they allow the brute animals to expostulate with God respecting their condition as though the distinction were unjust? Their enjoyment of a privilege which they have acquired by no merits is certainly no more reasonable than God's various distribution of his favours according to the measure of his judgment. If they make a transition to persons where the inequality is more offensive to them, the person of Christ at least ought to deter them from carelessly prating concerning this sublime mystery. A mortal man is conceived of the seed of David. To the merit of what virtues will they ascribe his being made, even in the womb, the head of angels, the only begotten Son of God, the image and glory of the Father, the light, righteousness, and salvation of the world? It is judiciously remarked by Augustine that there is the brightest example of gratuitous election in the head of the church himself, that it may not perplex us in the members, that he did not become the Son of God by leading a righteous life, but was gratuitously invested with this high honour, that he might afterwards render others partakers of the gifts bestowed upon him. If any one inquire why others are not all that he was, or why we are all at such a vast distance from him, why we are all corrupt, and he purity itself, he will betray both folly and impudence. But if they persist in the wish to deprive God of the uncontrollable right of choosing and rejecting, let them also take away what is given to Christ. Now it is of importance to attend to what the Scripture declares respecting every individual. Paul's assertion that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world certainly precludes any consideration of merit in us, for it is as though he had said, Our Heavenly Father, finding nothing worthy of his choice in all the posterity of Adam, turned his views towards his Christ to choose members from his body whom he would admit to the fellowship of life. Let believers then be satisfied with this reason that we were adopted in Christ to the heavenly inheritance, because in ourselves we were incapable of such high dignity. He has a similar remark in another place where he exhorts the Colossians to give thanks unto the Father who had made them meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. If election precedes this grace of God which makes us meet to obtain the glory of the life to come, what will God find in us to induce him to elect us? Another passage from this apostle will still more clearly express my meaning. He hath chosen us, he says, before the foundation of the world, according to the good pleasure of his will, that we should be holy and without blame before him, where he opposes the good pleasure of God to all our merits whatsoever. To render the proof more complete, it will be useful to notice all the clauses of that passage, which, taken in connection, leave no room for doubt. By the appellation of the elect or chosen, he certainly designates believers, as he soon after declares, wherefore it is corrupting the term by a shameful fiction to restrict it to the age in which the gospel was published. By saying that they were elected before the creation of the world, he precludes every consideration of merit. For what could be the reason for discrimination between those who yet had no existence and whose condition was afterward to be the same in Adam? Now, if they are chosen in Christ, it follows not only that each individual is chosen out of himself, but also that some are separated from others, for it is evident that all are not members of Christ. The next clause, stating them to have been chosen that they might be holy, fully refutes the error which derives election from foreknowledge, since Paul, on the contrary, declares that all the virtue discovered in men is the effect of election. If any inquiry be made after a superior cause, Paul replies that God thus predestinated, and that it was according to the good pleasure of his will. This overturns any means of election which men imagine in themselves. For all the benefits conferred by God for the spiritual life, he represents as flowing from this one source that God elected whom he would, and before they were born, laid up in reserve for them the grace with which he determined to favour them. Wherever this decree of God reigns, there can be no consideration of any works. The antithesis, indeed, is not pursued here, but it must be understood, as it is amplified by the same writer in another place, who hath called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And we have already shown that the following clause, that we should be holy, removes every difficulty. For, say... Because he foresaw they would be holy, therefore he chose them, and you will invert the order of Paul. We may safely infer then, if he chose us that we should be holy, his foresight of our future holiness was not the cause of his choice. 
for these two propositions, that the holiness of believers is the fruit of election, and that they attain it by means of works, are incompatible with each other. Nor is there any force in the cavil, to which they frequently resort, that the grace of election was not God's reward of antecedent works, but his gift to future ones. For when it is said that believers were elected, that they should be holy, it is fully implied that the holiness they were in future to possess had its origin in election. And what consistency would there be in asserting that things derived from election were the causes of election? A subsequent clause seems further to confirm what he had said, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. For the assertion that God purposed in himself is equivalent to saying that he considered nothing out of himself with any view to influence his determination. Therefore he immediately subjoins that the great and only object of our election is that we should be to the praise of divine grace. Certainly the grace of God deserves not the sole praise of our election, since this election be gratuitous. Now it could not be gratuitous if, in choosing his people, God himself considered what would be the nature of their respective works. The declaration of Christ to his disciples, therefore, is universally applicable to all believers. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, which not only excludes past merits, but signifies that they had nothing in themselves to cause their election independently of his preventing mercy. This also is the meaning of that passage of Paul, Who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For this design is to show that God's goodness altogether anticipates men, finding nothing in them, either future or past, to conciliate his favour towards them. In the epistle to the Romans, where he goes to the bottom of this argument and pursues it more at length, he says, They are not all Israel which are born of Israel because, though all were blessed by hereditary right, yet the succession did not pass to all alike. This controversy originated in the pride and vainglorying of the Jewish people, who, claiming for themselves the title of the church, would make the faith of the gospel to depend on their decision. Just as, in the present day, the papists with this false pretext would substitute themselves in the place of God. Paul, though he admits the posterity of Abraham to be holy in consequence of the covenant, yet contends that most of them are strangers to it, and that not only because they degenerate, from legitimate children becoming spurious ones, but because the preeminence and sovereignty belong to God's special election, which is the sole foundation of the validity of their adoption. If some were established in the hope of salvation by their own piety, and the rejection of others were owing wholly to their own defection, Paul's reference of his readers to the secret election would indeed be weak and absurd. Now, if the will of God, of which no cause appears, or must be sought out of himself, discriminates some from others, so that the children of Israel are not all true Israelites, it is in vain pretended that the condition of every individual originates with himself. He pursues the subject further under the example of Jacob and Esau, for, being both children of Abraham, and both enclosed in their mother's womb, the transfer of the honour of primogeniture to Jacob was by a preternatural change, which Paul, however, contends indicated the election of the one and the reprobation of the other. The origin and the cause are inquired, which the champions of foreknowledge maintain to be exhibited in the virtues and the vices of men. For this is their short and easy doctrine, that God has showed in the person of Jacob that he elects such as are worthy of his grace, and in the person of Esau that he rejects those whom he foresees to be unworthy. This indeed they assert with confidence, but what is the testimony of Paul? The children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. If this distinction between the brothers was influenced by foreknowledge, the mention of the time must certainly be unnecessary. On the supposition that Jacob was elected because that honour was acquired by his future virtues, to what purpose could Paul remark that he was not yet born? It would not have been so proper to add that he had not yet done any good, for it will be immediately replied that nothing is concealed from God, and therefore the piety of Jacob must have been present before him. If grace be the reward of works, they ought to have had their just value attributed to them before Jacob was born, as much as if he were already grown to maturity. But the apostle proceeds in unravelling the difficulty, and teaches that the adoption of Jacob flowed not from works, but from the calling of God. In speaking of works, he introduces no time, future, or past, but positively opposes them to the calling of God, 
intending the establishment of the one and the absolute subversion of the other, as though he had said, We must consider the good pleasure of God, and not the productions of men. Lastly, the very terms election and purpose certainly exclude from this subject all the causes frequently invented by men, independently of God's secret counsel. Now what pretexts will be urged to obscure these arguments by those who attribute to works, either past or future, any influence on election? For this is nothing but an evasion of the Apostle's argument, that the distinction between the two brothers depends not on any consideration of works, but on the mere calling of God, because it was fixed between them when they were not yet born. Nor would their subtlety have escaped him, if there had been any solidity in it, but well knowing the impossibility of God's foreseeing any good in man, except what he had first determined to bestow by the benefit of his election, he resorts not to the preposterous order of placing good works before their cause. We have the Apostle's authority that the salvation of believers is founded solely on the decision of divine election, and that that favour is not procured by works, but proceeds from gratuitous calling. We have also a lively exhibition of this truth in a particular example. Jacob and Esau are brothers, begotten of the same parents, still enclosed in the same womb, not yet brought forth into light. There is in all respects a perfect equality between them, yet the judgment of God concerning them is different, for he takes one and rejects the other. But that also is passed by, and on the younger is bestowed what is refused to the elder. In other instances also God appears always to have treated primogeniture with designed and decided contempt. To cut off from the flesh all occasion of boasting, he rejects Ishmael and favours Isaac, he degrades Manasseh and honours Ephraim. If it be objected that from these inferior and inconsiderable benefits it must not be concluded respecting the life to come, that he who has been raised to the honour of primogeniture is therefore to be considered as adopted to the inheritance of heaven, for there are many who spare not Paul as though in his citation of scripture testimonies he had perverted them from their genuine meaning, I answer as before that the apostle has neither erred through inadvertency nor willfully perverted testimonies of scripture. But he saw, what they cannot bear to consider, that God intended by an earthly symbol to declare the spiritual election of Jacob, which otherwise lay concealed behind his inaccessible tribunal. For unless the primogeniture granted him had reference to the future world, it was a vain and ridiculous kind of blessing which produced him nothing but various afflictions and adversities, grievous exile, numerous cares and bitter sorrows discerning, beyond all doubt, that God's external blessing was an indication of the spiritual and permanent blessing he had prepared for his servant in his kingdom, Paul hesitated not to argue from the former in proof of the latter. It must also be remembered that to the land of Canaan was annexed the pledge of the celestial residence, so that it ought not to be doubted that Jacob was ingrafted with angels into the body of Christ, that he might be a partaker of the same life. While Esau is rejected, therefore, Jacob is elected and distinguished from him by God's predestination without any difference of merit. If you inquire the cause, the apostle assigns the following. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And what is this but a plain declaration of the Lord, that he finds no cause in men to induce him to show favour to them, but derives it solely from his own mercy, and therefore that the salvation of his people is his work? When God fixes your salvation in himself alone, why will you descend into yourself? When he assigns you his mere mercy, why will you have recourse to your own merits? When he confines all your attention to his mercy, why will you divert part of it to the contemplation of your own works? We must, therefore, come to that more select people whom Paul in another place tells us God foreknew, not using this word according to the fancy of our opponents to signify a prospect from a place of idle observation, of things which he had no part in transacting, but in the sense in which it is frequently used. For certainly when Peter says that Christ was delivered to death by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, he introduces God not as a mere spectator, but as the author of our salvation. So the same apostle, by calling believers, to whom he writes, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, properly expresses that secret predestination by which God has marked out whom he would as his children. And the word purpose, which is added as a synonymous term, and in common speech is always expressive of fixed determination, undoubtedly implies that God, as the author of our salvation, does not go out of himself. 
In this sense, Christ is called, in the same chapter, the Lamb foreknown before the foundation of the world. For what can be more absurd or uninteresting than God's looking from on high to see what quarter salvation would come to mankind? The people, therefore, whom Paul describes as foreknown, are no other than a small number scattered among the multitude, who falsely pretend to be the people of God. In another place also, to repress the boasting of hypocrites, assuming before the world the preeminence among the ungodly, Paul declares, The Lord knoweth them that are his. Lastly, by this expression, Paul designates two classes of people, one consisting of the whole race of Abraham, the other separated from it, reserved under the eyes of God and concealed from the view of men. And this, without doubt, he gathered from Moses, who asserts that God will be merciful to whom he will be merciful, though he is speaking of the chosen people, whose condition was, to outward appearance, all alike, as though he had said that the common adoption includes in it peculiar grace towards some who resemble a more sacred treasure, that the common covenant prevents not this small number being exempted from the common lot, and that, determined to represent himself as the uncontrolled dispenser and arbiter in this affair, he positively denies that he will have mercy on one rather than another, from any other motive than his own pleasure, because when mercy meets a person who seeks it, though he suffers no repulse, yet he either anticipates, or in some degree obtains for himself that favour, of which God claims to himself all the praise. Now let the supreme master and judge decide the whole matter. Beholding in his hearers such extreme obduracy that his discourses were scattered among the multitude almost without any effect, to obviate this offence he exclaims, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And this is the Father's will, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing. Observe, the origin is from the donation of the Father, that we are given into the custody and protection of Christ. Here, perhaps, some one may argue in a circle and object that none are considered as the Father's peculiar people but those whose surrender has been voluntary arising from faith. But Christ only insists on this point, that notwithstanding the defections of vast multitudes shaking the whole world, yet the counsel of God will be stable and firmer than the heavens, so that election can never fail. They are said to have been the elect of the Father before he gave them to his only begotten Son. Is it inquired whether this was by nature? No, he draws those who are strangers, and so makes them his children. The language of Christ is too clear to be perplexed by the quibbles of sophistry. No man can come to me, except the Father draw him. Every man that hath heard and learnt of the Father cometh unto me. If all men promiscuously submitted to Christ, election would be common. Now the fewness of believers discovers a manifest distinction. Having asserted his disciples, therefore, who were not given to him to be the peculiar portion of the Father, Christ a little after adds, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are mine, which shows that the whole world does not belong to its creator, only that grace delivers from the curse and wrath of God and from eternal death a few who would otherwise perish, but leaves the world in its destruction to which it has been destined. At the same time, though Christ introduces himself in his mediatorial capacity, yet he claims to himself the right of election in common with the Father. I speak not of all, he says, I know whom I have chosen. If it be inquired whence he chose them, he elsewhere answers, out of the world, which he excludes from his prayers when he commends his disciples to the Father. It must be admitted that when Christ asserts his knowledge of whom he has chosen, it refers to a particular class of mankind, and that they are distinguished not by the nature of their virtues, but by the decree of heaven. Whence it follows that none attain any excellence by their own ability or industry, since Christ represents himself as the author of election. His enumeration of Judas among the elect, though he was a devil, only refers to the apostolical office, which, though an illustrious instance of the divine favour, as Paul so frequently acknowledges in his own person, yet does not include the hope of eternal salvation. Judas, therefore, in his unfaithful exercise of the apostleship, might be worse than a devil, but of those whom Christ has once united to his body, he will never suffer one to perish, for in securing their salvation he will perform what he has promised, by exerting the power of God who is greater than all. What he says in another place, Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, is a mode of expression called catechesis, but the sense is sufficiently plain. The conclusion is that God creates whom he chooses to be his children by a gratuitous adoption that the cause of this is wholly in himself, because he exclusively regards his own secret determination. 
but it will be said ambrose origen and jerome believed that god dispenses his grace among men according to his foreknowledge of the good use which every individual will make of it augustine also was once of the same sentiment but when he had made a greater proficiency in scriptural knowledge he not only retracted but powerfully confuted it and after his retraction rebuking the pelagians for persisting in this error he says quote, who but must wonder that this most ingenious sense should escape the apostle for after proposing what was calculated to excite astonishment respecting those children yet unborn he started to himself by way of objection the following question what then is their unrighteousness with god it was the place for him to answer that god foresaw the merits of each of them yet he says nothing of this but resorts to the decrees and mercy of god End quote and in another place after having discarded all merits antecedent to election he says quote, here undoubtedly falls to the ground the vain reasoning of those who defend the foreknowledge of god in opposition to his grace and affirm that we were elected before the foundation of the world because god foreknew that we would be good not that he himself would make us good this is not the language of him who says ye have not chosen me but i have chosen you for if he elected us because he foreknew our future good he must also have foreknown our choice of him, end quote, and more to the like purpose. This testimony should have weight with those who readily acquiesce in the authority of the fathers. Though Augustine will not allow himself to be disunited from the rest, but shows by clear testimonies the falsehood of that discordance with the odium of which he was loaded by the Pelagians, he makes the following quotations from Ambrose's book on predestination. Quote, Whom Christ has mercy on, him he calls those who were in devout he could if he would have made devout but god calls whom he pleases and makes whom he will religious End quote. if i were inclined to compile a whole volume from augustine i could easily show my readers that i need no words but his but i am unwilling to burden them with prolixity but come let us suppose them to be silent let us attend to the subject itself a difficult question was raised whether it was a just procedure in god to favour with his grace certain particular persons this paul could have decided by a single word if he had pleaded the consideration of works why then does he not do this but rather continues his discourse involved in the same difficulty why but from necessity for the holy spirit who spoke by his mouth never laboured under the malady of forgetfulness without any evasion or circumlocution therefore he answers that god favours his elect because he will and has mercy because he will for this oracle i will be gracious to whom i will be gracious and will show mercy on whom i will show mercy is equivalent to a declaration that god is excited to mercy by no other motive than his own good will to be merciful the observation of augustine therefore remains true quote, that the grace of god does not find men fit to be elected but makes them so End quote. We shall not dwell upon the sophistry of Thomas Aquinas, quote, that the foreknowledge of merits is not the cause of predestination in regard to the act of him who predestinates, but that with regard to us it may in some sense be so called, according to the particular consideration of predestination, as when God is said to predestinate glory for man according to merits, because he decreed to give him grace by which glory is merited, end quote. Book 3, Chapter 22, Section 9 to book three chapter twenty four section seven for since the lord allows us to contemplate nothing in election but his mere goodness the desire of any one to see anything more is a preposterous disposition but if we were inclined to a contention of subtlety we should be at no loss to refute this petty sophism of aquinas he contends that glory is in a certain sense predestinated for the elect according to their merits because god predestinates to them the grace by which glory is merited what if i on the contrary reply that predestination to grace is subordinate to election to life and attendant upon it that grace is predestinated to those to whom the possession of glory has been already assigned because it pleases the lord to conduct his children from election to justification for hence it will follow that predestination to glory is rather the cause of predestination to grace than the contrary but let us dismiss these controversies they are unnecessary with those who think they have wisdom enough in the word of god for it was truly remarked by an ancient ecclesiastical writer that they who ascribe god's election to merits are wiser than they ought to be it is objected by some that god will be inconsistent with himself if he invites all men universally to come to him and receives only a few elect 
Thus, according to them, the universality of the promises destroys the discrimination of special grace, and this is the language of some moderate men, not so much for the sake of suppressing the truth as to exclude thorny questions and restrain the curiosity of many. The end is laudable, but the means cannot be approved, for disingenuous evasion can never be excused, and with those who use insult and invective it is a foul cavil or a shameful error. How the scripture reconciles these two facts, that by external preaching all are called to repentance and faith, and yet that the spirit of repentance and faith is not given to all, I have elsewhere stated, and shall soon have occasion partly to repeat. What they assume, I deny, as being false in two respects, for he who threatens drought to one city while it rains upon another, and who denounces to another place a famine of doctrine, lays himself under no positive obligation to call all men alike. And he who, forbidding Paul to preach the word in Asia, and suffering him not to go into Bithynia, calls him into Macedonia, demonstrates his right to distribute this treasure to whom he pleases. In Isaiah he still more fully declares his predestination of the promises of salvation exclusively for the elect, for of them only, and not indiscriminately of all mankind, he declares that they shall be his disciples. Whence it appears that when the doctrine of salvation is offered to all for their effectual benefit, it is a corrupt prostitution of that which is declared to be reserved particularly for the children of the church. At present let this suffice, that though the voice of the gospel addresses all men generally, yet the gift of faith is bestowed on few. Isaiah assigns the cause that the arm of the Lord is not revealed to all. If he had said that the gospel is wickedly and perversely despised, because many obstinately refuse to hear it, perhaps there would be some colour for this notion of the universal call. The design of the prophet is not to extenuate the guilt of men, when he states that the source of blindness is God's not deigning to reveal his arm to them. He only suggests that their ears are in vain assailed with external doctrine, because faith is a peculiar gift. I would wish to be informed by these teachers whether men become children of God by mere preaching or by faith. Surely when John declares that all who believe in God's only begotten Son are themselves made the children of God, this is not said of all the hearers of the word in a confused mass, but a particular rank is assigned to believers, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. But, they say, there is a mutual agreement between faith and the word. This is the case wherever there is any faith, but it is no new thing for the seed to fall among thorns or in stony places, not only because most men are evidently in actual rebellion against God, but because they are not all endued with eyes and ears. Where then will be the consistency of God's calling to himself, such as he knows will never come? Let Augustine answer for me, quote, Do you wish to dispute with me? Rather unite with me in admiration, and exclaim, O oh, the depth! Let us both agree in fear, lest we perish in error. End quote. Besides, if election is, as Paul represents it, the parent of faith, I retort that argument upon them, that faith cannot be general because election is special. For from the connection of causes and effects, it is easily inferred, when Paul says, God hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings, according as he hath chosen us before the foundation of the world, that therefore these treasures are not common to all, because God has chosen only such as he pleased. This is the reason why, in another place, he commends the faith of God's elect, that none may be supposed to acquire faith by any exertion of their own, but that God may retain the glory of freely illuminating the objects of his previous election. For Bernard justly observes, quote, Friends, hear each one for himself when he addresses them. Fear not, little flock, for to you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. Who are these? Certainly those whom he has foreknown and predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. The great and secret counsel has been revealed. The Lord knows who are his, but what was known to God is manifested to men. Nor does he favour any others with the participation of so great a mystery, but those particular individuals whom he foreknew and predestinated to be his own. End quote. A little after he concludes, quote, The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, from everlasting in predestination, to everlasting in beatification, the one knowing no beginning, the other no end. end quote. But what necessity is there for citing the testimony of Bernard, since we hear from the Master's own mouth that no man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, which implies that all who are not regenerated by God are stupefied with the splendour of his countenance. 
faith indeed is properly connected with election provided it occupies the second place this order is clearly expressed in these words of christ this is the father's will that of all which he hath given me i should lose nothing and this is the will of him that sent me that every one which believeth on the son may have everlasting life if he willed the salvation of all he would give them all into the custody of his son and unite them all to his body by the sacred bond of faith now it is evident that faith is the peculiar pledge of his paternal love reserved for his adopted children therefore christ says in another place the sheep follow the shepherd for they know his voice and a stranger will they not follow for they know not the voice of strangers whence arises this difference but because their ears are divinely penetrated for no man makes himself a sheep but is created such by heavenly grace hence also the lord proves the perpetual certainty and security of our salvation because it is kept by the invincible power of god therefore he concludes that unbelievers are not his sheep because they are not of the number of those whom god by isaiah promised to him for his future disciples moreover the testimonies i have cited being expressive of perseverance are so many declarations of the invariable perpetuity of election now with respect to the reprobate whom the apostle introduces in the same place as jacob without any merit yet acquired by good works is made an object of grace so esau while yet unpolluted by any crime is accounted an object of hatred if we turn our attention to works we insult the apostle as though he saw not that which is clearer to us now that he saw none is evident because he expressly asserts the one to have been elected and the other rejected while they had not done any good or evil in order to prove the foundation of divine predestination not to be in works secondly when he raises the objection whether god is unjust he never urges what would have been the most absolute and obvious defence of his justice that god rewarded esau according to his wickedness but contents himself with a different solution that the reprobate are raised up for this purpose that the glory of god may be displayed by their means lastly he subjoins a concluding observation that god hath mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth you see how he attributes both to the mere will of god if therefore we can assign no reason why he grants mercy to his people but because such is his pleasure neither shall we find any other cause but his will for the reprobation of others for when god is said to harden or show mercy to whom he pleases men are taught by this declaration to seek no cause beside his will chapter twenty three a refutation of the calumnies generally but unjustly urged against this doctrine when the human mind hears these things its petulance breaks all restraint and it discovers as serious and violent agitation as if alarmed by the sound of a martial trumpet many indeed as if they wished to avert odium from god admit election in such a way as to deny that any one is reprobated but this is puerile and absurd because election itself could not exist without being opposed to reprobation god is said to separate those whom he adopts to salvation to say that others obtain by chance or acquire by their own efforts that which election alone confers on a few will be worse than absurd whom god passes by therefore he reprobates and from no other cause than his determination to exclude them from the inheritance which he predestines for his children and the petulance of men is intolerable if it refuses to be restrained by the word of god which treats of his incomprehensible counsel adored by angels themselves but now we have heard that hardening proceeds from the divine power and will as much as mercy unlike the persons i have mentioned paul never strives to excuse god by false allegations he only declares that it is unlawful for a thing formed to quarrel with its maker now how will those who admit not that any are reprobated by god evade this declaration of christ every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up upon all whom our heavenly father has not deigned to plant as sacred trees in his garden they hear destruction plainly denounced if they deny this to be a sign of reprobation there is nothing so clear as to be capable of proof to such persons but if they cease not their clamour let the sobriety of faith be satisfied with this admonition of paul that there is no cause for quarrelling with god if on the one hand willing to show his wrath and to make his power known he endures with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and on the other makes known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy whom he had afore prepared unto glory 
Let the reader observe that to preclude every pretext for murmurs and censures, Paul ascribes supreme dominion to the wrath and power of God, because it is unreasonable for those deep judgments which absorb all our faculties to be called in question by us. It is a frivolous reply of our adversaries that God does not wholly reject the objects of his long suffering, but remains in suspense towards them, awaiting the possibility of their repentance, as though Paul attributed patience to God in expectation of the conversion of those whom he asserts to be fitted to destruction. For Augustine, in expounding this passage where power is connected with patience, justly observes that God's power is not permissive, but influential. They observe also that it is not said without meaning that the vessels of wrath are fitted to destruction, but that God prepared the vessels of mercy, since by this mode of expression he ascribes and challenges to God the praise of salvation, and throws the blame of perdition upon those who by their choice procure it to themselves. But though I concede to them that Paul softens the asperity of the former clause by the difference of phraseology, yet it is not at all consistent to transfer the preparation for destruction to any other than the secret counsel of God, which is also asserted just before in the context, that God raised up Pharaoh, and whom he will he hardeneth, whence it follows that the cause of hardening is the secret counsel of God. This, however, I maintain, which is observed by Augustine, that when God turns wolves into sheep, he renovates them by more powerful grace to conquer their obduracy, and therefore the obstinate are not converted, because God exerts not that mightier grace of which he is not destitute if he chose to display it. These things will amply suffice for persons of piety and modesty who remember that they are men. But as these virulent adversaries are not content with one species of opposition, we will reply to them all as occasion shall require. Foolish mortals enter into many contentions with God as though they could arraign him to plead to their accusations. In the first place they inquire by what right the Lord is angry with his creatures who had not provoked him by any previous offence, for that to devote to destruction, whom he pleases, is more like the caprice of a tyrant than the lawful sentence of a judge. That men have reason, therefore, to expostulate with God if they are predestinated to eternal death, without any demerit of their own, merely by his sovereign will. If such thoughts ever enter the minds of pious men, they will be sufficiently enabled to break their violence by this one consideration, how exceedingly presumptuous it is only to inquire into the causes of the divine will, which is, in fact, and is justly entitled to be the cause of everything that exists. For if it has any cause, then there must be something antecedent on which it depends, which it is impious to suppose. For the will of God is the highest rule of justice, so that what he wills must be considered just for this very reason, because he wills it. When it is inquired, therefore, why the Lord did so, the answer must be, because he would. But, if you go further and ask why he so determined, you are in search of something greater and higher than the will of God, which can never be found. Let human temerity, therefore, desist from seeking that which is not, lest it should fail of finding that which is. This will be a sufficient restraint to any one disposed to reason with reverence concerning the secrets of his God. Against the audaciousness of the impious, who are not afraid openly to rail against God, the Lord will sufficiently defend himself by his own justice, without any vindication by us, when, depriving their consciences of every subterfuge, he shall convict them, and bind them with a sense of their guilt. Yet we espouse not the notion of the Romish theologians concerning the absolute and arbitrary power of God, which on account of its profaneness deserves our detestation. We represent not God as lawless, who is a law to himself, because, as Plato says, laws are necessary to men who are the subjects of evil desires, but the will of God is not only pure from every fault, but the highest standard of perfection, even the law of all laws. But we deny that he is liable to be called to any account. We deny also that we are proper judges to decide on this cause according to our own apprehension. Wherefore, if we attempt to go beyond what is lawful, let us be deterred by the psalmist, who tells us that God will be clear when he is judged by mortal man. Thus God is able to check his enemies by silence, but that we may not suffer them to deride his holy name with impunity, he supplies us from his word with arms against them. Therefore, if any one attack us with such an inquiry as this, why God has from the beginning predestinated some men to death, who, not yet being brought into existence, could not yet deserve the sentence of death, 
we will reply by asking them in return what they suppose God owes to man if he chooses to judge of him from his own nature. As we are all corrupted by sin, we must necessarily be odious to God, and that not from tyrannical cruelty, but in the most equitable estimation of justice. If all whom the Lord predestinates to death are, in their natural condition, liable to the sentence of death, what injustice do they complain of receiving from him? Let all the sons of Adam come forward, let them all contend and dispute with their Creator, because, by his eternal providence, they were previously to their birth adjudged to endless misery. What murmur will they be able to raise against this vindication, when God, on the other hand, shall call them to a review of themselves? If they have all been taken from a corrupt mass, it is no wonder that they are subject to condemnation. Let them not, therefore, accuse God of injustice if his eternal decree has destined them to death, to which they feel themselves, whatever be their desire or aversion, spontaneously led forward by their own nature. Hence appears the perverseness of their disposition to murmur, because they intentionally suppress the cause of condemnation which they are constrained to acknowledge in themselves, hoping to excuse themselves by charging it upon God. But though I ever so often admit God to be the author of it, which is perfectly correct, yet this does not abolish the guilt impressed upon their consciences, and from time to time recurring to their view. They further object, were they not by the decree of God antecedently predestinated to that corruption which is now stated as the cause of condemnation? When they perish in their corruption, therefore, they only suffer the punishment of that misery into which, in consequence of his predestination, Adam fell and precipitated his posterity with him. Is he not unjust, therefore, in treating his creatures with such cruel mockery? I confess indeed that all the descendants of Adam fell by the divine will into that miserable condition in which they are now involved, and this is what I asserted from the beginning, that we must always return at last to the sovereign determination of God's will, the cause of which is hidden in himself. But it follows not, therefore, that God is liable to this reproach, for we will answer them thus in the language of Paul, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honour and another unto dishonour? They will deny this to be in reality any vindication of God's justice and call it a subterfuge, such as is commonly resorted to by persons destitute of a sufficient defence. For what appears to be the meaning of this, but that God possesses power that cannot be resisted of doing anything whatsoever according to his pleasure? But it is very different. For what stronger reason can be alleged than when we are directed to consider who God is? How could any injustice be committed by him who is the judge of the world? If it is the peculiar property of the nature of God to do justice, then he naturally loves righteousness and hates iniquity. The apostle, therefore, has not resorted to sophistry, as if he were in danger of confutation, but has shown that the reason of the divine justice is too high to be measured by a human standard, or comprehended by the littleness of the human mind. The Apostle, indeed, acknowledges that there is a depth in the divine judgments sufficient to absorb the minds of all mankind, if they attempt to penetrate it. But he also teaches how criminal it is to reduce the works of God to such a law, that, on failing to discover the reason of them, we presume to censure them. It is a well-known observation of Solomon, though few rightly understand it, that the great God that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth transgressors. For... He is proclaiming the greatness of God, whose will it is to punish fools and transgressors, although he favours them not with his spirit. And men betray astonishing madness in desiring to comprehend immensity within the limits of their reason. The angels who stood in their integrity, Paul calls elect. If their constancy rested on the divine pleasure, the defection of the others argues their being forsaken, a fact for which no other cause can be assigned than the reprobation hidden in the secret counsel of God. Now, to any follower of Manes or Celestius, a calumniator of divine providence, I reply with Paul that no account ought to be given of it, for its greatness far surpasses our understanding. What wonder or absurdity is there in this? Would he have the divine power so limited as to be unable to execute more than his little capacity can comprehend? I say with Augustine that the Lord created those who, he certainly foreknew, would fall into destruction, and that this was actually so, because he willed it. But of his will it belongs not to us to demand the reason, 
which we are incapable of comprehending, nor is it reasonable that the divine will should be made the subject of controversy with us, which, whenever it is discussed, is only another name for the highest rule of justice. Why, then, is any question started concerning injustice, where justice is evidently conspicuous? Nor let us be ashamed to follow the example of Paul, and stop the mouths of unreasonable and wicked men in this manner, repeating the same answer, as often as they shall dare to repeat their complaints. Who are you, miserable mortals, preferring an accusation against God, because he accommodates not the greatness of his works to your ignorance? As though they were necessarily wrong, because they are concealed from carnal view. Of the immensity of God's judgments you have the clearest evidences. You know they are called a great deep. Now examine your contracted intellects, whether they can comprehend God's secret decrees. What advantage or satisfaction do you gain from plunging yourself, by your mad researches, into an abyss that reason itself pronounces will be fatal to you? Why are you not at least restrained by some fear of what is contained in the history of Job and the books of the prophets concerning the inconceivable wisdom and terrible power of God? If your mind is disturbed, embrace without reluctance the advice of Augustine, quote, you, a man, expect an answer from me, who am also a man. Let us, therefore, both hear him who says, O man, who art thou? Faithful ignorance is better than presumptuous knowledge. Seek merits, you will find nothing but punishment. O oh, the depth! Peter denies, the thief believes, O oh, the depth! Do you seek a reason? I will tremble at the depth. Do you seek a reason? I will wonder. Do you dispute? I will believe. I see the depth, I reach not the bottom. Paul rested because he found admiration. He calls the judgments of God unsearchable, and are you come to scrutinize them? He says his ways are past finding out, and are you come to investigate them? End quote. We shall do no good by proceeding any further. It will not satisfy their petulance, and the Lord needs no other defense than what he has employed by his Spirit, speaking by the mouth of Paul and we forget to speak well when we cease to speak with God. Impiety produces also a second objection, which directly tends not so much to the crimination of God as to the vindication of the sinner, though the sinner whom God condemns cannot be justified without the disgrace of the judge. For this is their profane complaint. Why should God impute as a fault to man those things which were rendered necessary by his predestination? What should they do? Should they resist his decrees? This would be vain, for it would be impossible. Therefore they are not justly punished for those things of which God's predestination is the principal cause. Here I shall refrain from the defence commonly resorted to by ecclesiastical writers, that the foreknowledge of God prevents not man from being considered as a sinner, since God foresees man's evils, not his own. For then the cavil would not stop here. It would rather be urged that still God might, if he would, have provided against the evils he foresaw, and that not having done this, he created man expressly to this end, that he might so conduct himself in the world. But if, by the divine providence, man was created in such a state as afterwards to do whatever he actually does, he ought not to be charged with guilt for things which he cannot avoid, and to which the will of God constrains him. Let us see, then, how this difficulty should be solved. In the first place, the declaration of Solomon ought to be universally admitted, that the Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Observe, all things being at God's disposal, and the decision of salvation or death belonging to him. He orders all things by his counsel and decree in such a manner, that some men are born devoted from the womb to certain death, that his name may be glorified in their destruction. If any one pleads that no necessity was imposed on them by the providence of God, but rather that they were created by him in such a state, in consequence of his foresight of their future depravity, it will amount to nothing. The old writers used, indeed, to adopt this solution, though not without some degree of hesitation. But the schoolmen satisfy themselves with it, as though it admitted of no opposition. I will readily grant, indeed, that mere foreknowledge lays no necessity on the creatures, though this is not universally admitted, for there are some who maintain it to be the actual cause of what comes to pass." But Valla, a man otherwise not much versed in theology, appears to me to have discovered superior acuteness and judiciousness by showing that this controversy is unnecessary, because both life and death are acts of God's will, rather than of his foreknowledge. 
if god simply foresaw the fates of men and did not also dispose and fix them by his determination there would be room to agitate the question whether his providence or foresight rendered them at all necessary but since he foresees future events only in consequence of his decree that they shall happen it is useless to contend about foreknowledge while it is evident that all things come to pass rather by ordination and decree they say it is nowhere declared in express terms that god decreed adam should perish by his defection as though the same god whom the scripture represents as doing whatever he pleases created the noblest of his creatures without any determinate end they maintain that he was possessed of free choice that he might be the author of his own fate but that god decreed nothing more than to treat him according to his desert if so weak a scheme as this be received what will become of god's omnipotence by which he governs all things according to his secret counsel independently of every person or thing besides but whether they wish it or dread it predestination exhibits itself in adam's posterity for the loss of salvation by the whole race through the guilt of one parent was an event that did not happen by nature what prevents their acknowledging concerning one man what they reluctantly grant concerning the whole species why should they lose their labour in sophistical evasions the scripture proclaims that all men were in the person of their father sentenced to eternal death this not being attributable to nature it is evident must have proceeded from the wonderful counsel of god the perplexity and hesitation discovered at trifles by these pious defenders of the justice of god and their facility in overcoming great difficulties are truly absurd i inquire again how it came to pass that the fall of adam independent of any remedy should involve so many nations with their infant children in eternal death because such was the will of god their tongues so loquacious on every other point must here be struck dumb it is an awful decree i confess but no one can deny that god foresaw the future final fate of man before he created him and that he did foreknow it because it was appointed by his own decree if any one here attacks god's foreknowledge he rashly and inconsiderately stumbles for what ground of accusation is there against the heavenly judge for not being ignorant of futurity if there is any just or plausible complaint it lies against predestination nor should it be thought absurd to affirm that god not only foresaw the fall of the first man and the ruin of his posterity in him but also arranged all by the determination of his own will for as it belongs to his wisdom to foreknow everything future so it belongs to his power to rule and govern all things by his hand and this question also as well as others is judiciously discussed by augustine Quote, we most wholesomely confess what we most rightly believe that the god and lord of all things who created everything very good and foreknew that evil would arise out of good and knew that it was more suitable to his almighty goodness to bring good out of evil than not to suffer evil to exist ordained the life of angels and men in such a manner as to exhibit in it first what free will was capable of doing and afterwards what could be affected by the blessings of his grace and the sentence of his justice end quote here they recur to the distinction between will and permission and insist that god permits the destruction of the impious but he does not will it but what reason shall we assign for his permitting it but because it is his will it is not probable however that man procured his own destruction by the mere permission and without any appointment of god as though god had not determined what he would choose to be the condition of the principle of his creatures i shall not hesitate therefore to confess plainly with augustine quote, that the will of god is the necessity of things and that what he has willed will necessarily come to pass as those things are really about to happen which he has foreseen End quote. now if either pelagians or manichaeans or anabaptists or epicureans for we are concerned with these four sects on this argument in excuse for themselves and the impious plead the necessity with which they are bound by god's predestination they allege nothing applicable to the case for if predestination is no other than a dispensation of divine justice mysterious indeed but liable to no blame since it is certain they were not unworthy of being predestinated to that fate it is equally certain that the destruction they incur by predestination is consistent with the strictest justice besides their perdition depends on the divine predestination in such a manner that the cause and matter of it are found in themselves for the first man fell because the lord had determined it was expedient the reason of this determination is unknown to us 
yet it is certain that he determined thus only because he foresaw it would tend to the just illustration of the glory of his name whenever you hear the glory of god mentioned think of his justice for what deserves praise must be just man falls therefore according to the appointment of divine providence but he falls by his own fault the lord had a little before pronounced everything that he had made to be very good whence then comes the depravity of man to revolt from his god lest it should be thought to come from creation god had approved and commended what had proceeded from himself by his own wickedness therefore he corrupted the nature he had received pure from the lord and by his fall he drew all his posterity with him into destruction wherefore let us rather contemplate the evident cause of condemnation which is nearer to us in the corrupt nature of mankind than search after a hidden and altogether incomprehensible one in the predestination of god and we should feel no reluctance to submit our understanding to the infinite wisdom of god so far as to acquiesce in its many mysteries to be ignorant of things which it is neither possible nor lawful to know is to be learned an eagerness to know them is a species of madness some one perhaps will say that I have not yet adduced a sufficient answer to that sacrilegious excuse. I confess it is impossible ever wholly to prevent the petulance and murmurs of impiety, yet I think I have said what should suffice to remove not only all just ground, but every plausible pretext for objection. The reprobate wish to be thought excusable in sinning, because they cannot avoid a necessity of sinning, especially since this necessity is laid upon them by the ordination of God but we deny this to be a just excuse because the ordination of god by which they complain that they are destined to destruction is guided by equity unknown indeed to us but indubitably certain whence we conclude that they sustain no misery that is not inflicted upon them by the most righteous judgment of god in the next place we maintain that they act preposterously who in seeking for the origin of their condemnation direct their views to the secret recesses of the divine counsel and overlook the corruption of nature which is its real source the testimony god gives to his creation prevents their imputing it to him for though by the eternal providence of god man was created to that misery to which he is subject yet the ground of it he has derived from himself not from god since he is thus ruined solely in consequence of his having degenerated from the pure creation of god to vicious and impure depravity the doctrine of god's predestination is calumniated by its adversaries as involving a third absurdity for when we attribute it solely to the determination of the divine will that those whom god admits to be heirs of his kingdom are exempted from the universal destruction from this they infer that he is a respecter of persons which the scripture uniformly denies that therefore either the scripture is inconsistent with itself or in the election of god regard is had to merits in the first place the scripture denies that god is a respecter of persons in a different sense from that in which they understand it for by the word person it signifies not a man but those things in a man which being conspicuous to the eyes usually conciliate favour honour and dignity or attract hatred contempt and disgrace such are riches wealth power nobility magistracy country elegance of form on the one hand and on the other hand poverty necessity ignoble birth slovenliness contempt and the like thus peter and paul declare that god is not a respecter of persons because he makes no difference between the jew and greek to reject one and receive the other merely on account of his nation so james uses the same language when he means to assert that god in his judgment pays no regard to riches and paul in another place declares that in judging god has no respect to liberty or bondage there will therefore be no contradiction in our affirming that according to the good pleasure of his will god chooses whom he will as his children irrespective of all merit while he rejects and reprobates others yet for the sake of further satisfaction the matter may be explained in the following manner they ask how it happens that of two persons distinguished from each other by no merit god in his election leaves one and takes another i on the other hand ask them whether they suppose him that is taken to possess anything that can attract the favour of god if they confess that he has not as indeed they must it will follow that god looks not at man but derives his motive to favour him from his own goodness god's election of one man therefore while he rejects another proceeds not from any respect of man but solely from his own mercy which may freely display and exert itself wherever and whenever it pleases for we have elsewhere seen also that from the beginning 
not many noble or wise or honourable were called, that God might humble the pride of flesh, so far is his favour from being confined to persons. Wherefore some people falsely and wickedly charge God with a violation of equal justice, because in his predestination he observes not the same uniform course of proceeding towards all. If he finds all guilty, they say, let him punish all alike. If innocent, let him withhold the rigour of justice from all. But they deal with him just as if either mercy were forbidden him, or, when he chooses to show mercy, he were constrained wholly to renounce justice. What is it that they require? If all are guilty, that they shall all suffer the same punishment. We confess the guilt to be common, but we say that some are relieved by divine mercy. They say, let it relieve all, but we reply, justice requires that he should likewise show himself to be a just judge in the infliction of punishment. When they object to this, what is it but attempting to deprive God of the opportunity to manifest his mercy, or to grant it to him, at least on the condition that he wholly abandon his justice? Wherefore, there is the greatest propriety in these observations of Augustine, quote, the whole mass of mankind having fallen into condemnation in the first man, the vessels that are formed from it to honour are not vessels of personal righteousness, but of divine mercy and the formation of others to dishonour, is to be attributed not to iniquity, but to the divine decree, end quote, etc. While God rewards those whom he rejects with deserved punishment, and to those whom he calls, freely gives undeserved grace, he is liable to no accusation, but may be compared to a creditor, who has power to release one, and enforce his demands on another. The Lord therefore may give grace to whom he will, because he is merciful, and yet not give it to all, because he is a just judge, may manifest his free grace by giving to some what they never deserve, while by not giving to all he declares the demerit of all. For when Paul says that God hath concluded all under sin, that he might have mercy upon all, it must at the same time be added that he is debtor to none, for no man hath first given to him to entitle him to demand a recompense. Another argument often urged to overthrow predestination is that its establishment would destroy all solicitude and exertion for rectitude of conduct. For who can hear, they say, that either life or death is appointed for him by God's eternal and immutable decree, without immediately concluding that it is of no importance how he conducts himself, since no action of his can in any respect either impede or promote the predestination of God? Thus all will abandon themselves to despair, and run into every excess to which their licentious propensities may lead them. And truly this objection is not altogether destitute of truth, for there are many impure persons who bespatter the doctrine of predestination with these vile blasphemies, and with this pretext elude all admonitions and reproofs. God knows what he has determined to do with us. If he has decreed our salvation, he will bring us to it in his own time." If he has destined us to death, it will be in vain for us to strive against it. But the scripture, while it inculcates superior awe and reverence of mind in the consideration of so great a mystery, instructs the godly in a very different conclusion, and fully refutes the wicked and unreasonable inferences of these persons. For the design of what it contains respecting predestination is not that, being excited to presumption, we may attempt, with nefarious temerity, to scrutinize the inaccessible secrets of God, but rather that, being humbled and dejected, we may learn to tremble at his justice and admire his mercy. At this object believers will aim, but the impure cavils of the wicked are justly restrained by Paul. They profess to go on securely in their vices, because, if they are of the number of the elect, such conduct will not prevent their being finally brought into life. But Paul declares the end of our election to be that we may lead a holy and blameless life. If the object of election be holiness of life, it should rather awaken and stimulate us to a cheerful practice of it, than be used as a pretext for slothfulness. But how inconsistent is it to cease from the practice of virtue, because election is sufficient to salvation, while the end proposed in election is our diligent performance of virtuous actions? Away then with such corrupt and sacrilegious perversions of the whole order of election, they carry their blasphemies much further by asserting that any one who is reprobated by God will labour to no purpose if he endeavour to approve himself to him by innocence and integrity of life. But here they are convicted of a most impudent falsehood. For whence could such exertion originate but from election? 
whoever are of the number of the reprobate being vessels made to dishonour cease not to provoke the divine wrath against them by continual transgressions and to confirm by evident proofs the judgment of god already denounced against them so that their striving with him in vain is what can never happen this doctrine is maliciously and impudently calumniated by others as subversive of all exhortations to piety of life this formerly brought great odium upon augustine which he removed by his treatise on correction and grace addressed to valentine the perusal of which will easily satisfy all pious and teachable persons yet i will touch on a few things which i hope will convince such as are honest and not contentious how openly and loudly gratuitous election was preached by paul we have already seen was he therefore cold in admonitions and exhortations let these good zealots compare his vehemence with theirs theirs will be found ice itself in comparison with his incredible fervour and certainly every scruple is removed by this principle that god hath not called us to uncleanness but that every one should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honour and again that we are his workmanship created in christ jesus unto good works which god hath before ordained that we should walk in them indeed a slight acquaintance with paul will enable any one to understand without tedious arguments how easily he reconciles things which they pretend to be repugnant to each other christ commands men to believe in him yet his limitation is neither false nor contrary to his command when he says no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father let preaching therefore have its course to bring men to faith and by a continual progress to promote their perseverance nor let the knowledge of predestination be prevented that the obedient may not be proud as of anything of their own but may glory in the lord christ had some particular meaning in saying who hath ears to hear let him hear therefore when we exhort and preach persons endued with ears readily obey and those who are destitute of them exhibit an accomplishment of the scripture that hearing they hear not Quote, but why says augustine should some have ears and others not who hath known the mind of the lord must that which is evident be denied because that which is concealed cannot be comprehended End quote these observations i have faithfully borrowed from augustine but as his words will perhaps have more authority than mine i will proceed to an exact quotation of them quote, if on hearing this some persons become torpid and slothful and exchanging labour for lawless desire pursue the various objects of concupiscence must what is declared concerning the foreknowledge of god be therefore accounted false if god foreknew that they would be good will they not be so in whatever wickedness they now live and if he foreknew that they would be wicked will they not be so in whatever goodness they now appear are these then sufficient causes why the truths which are declared concerning the foreknowledge of god should be either denied or passed over in silence especially when the consequence of silence respecting these would be the adoption of other errors the reason of concealing the truth he says is one thing and the necessity of declaring it is another it would be tedious to inquire after all the reasons for passing the truth over in silence but this is one of them lest those who understand it not should become worse while we wish to make those who understand it better informed who indeed are not made wiser by our declaring any such thing nor are they rendered worse but since the truth is of such a nature that when we speak of it he becomes worse who cannot understand it and when we are silent about it he who can understand it becomes worse what do we think ought to be done should not the truth rather be spoken that he who is capable may understand it than buried in silence the consequence of which would be not only that neither would know it but even the more intelligent of the two would become worse who if he heard and understood it would also teach it to many others and we are unwilling to say what we are authorized to say by the testimony of scripture for we are afraid indeed lest by speaking we may offend him who cannot understand but are not afraid lest in consequence of our silence he who is capable of understanding the truth may be deceived by falsehood End quote. and condensing this sentiment afterwards into a smaller compass he places it in a still stronger light quote, wherefore if the apostles and the succeeding teachers of the church both piously treated of god's eternal election and held believers under the discipline of a pious life what reason have these our opponents when silenced by the invincible force of truth to suppose themselves right in maintaining that 
what is spoken of predestination, although it be true, ought not to be preached to the people. But it must by all means be preached, that he who has ears to hear may hear, but who has them unless he receives them from him who has promised to bestow them? Certainly he who receives may not reject, provided he who receives takes and drinks, drinks and lives, for as piety must be preached, that God may be rightly worshipped, so also must predestination, that he who has ears to hear of the grace of God, may glory in God and not in himself. End quote. And yet, being peculiarly desirous of edification, that holy man regulates his mode of teaching the truth, so that offence may as far as possible be prudently avoided. For he suggests that whatever is asserted with truth may also be delivered in a suitable manner. If any one address the people in such a way as this, if you believe not, it is because you are by a divine decree already predestined to destruction. He not only cherishes slothfulness, but even encourages wickedness. If any one extend the declaration to the future, that they who hear will never believe because they are reprobated, this would be rather imprecation than instruction. Such persons, therefore, as foolish teachers, or inauspicious, ominous prophets, Augustine charges to depart from the church. In another place, indeed, he justly maintains, quote, that a man then profits by correction, when he, who causes whom he pleases to profit even without correction, compassionates and assists. But why some in one way and some in another, far be it from us to ascribe the choice to the clay instead of the potter, end quote. Again afterwards, quote, when men are either introduced or restored into the way of righteousness by correction, who works salvation in their hearts but he who gives the increase, whoever plants and waters? He whose determination to save is not resisted by any free will of man. It is beyond all doubt, therefore, that the will of God, who has done whatever he has pleased in heaven and in earth, and who has done even things that are yet future, cannot possibly be resisted by the will of man, so as to prevent the execution of his purposes, since he controls the wills of men according to his pleasure. End quote. Again, quote, when he designs to bring men to himself, does he bind them by corporeal bonds? He acts inwardly, he inwardly seizes their hearts, he inwardly moves their hearts and draws them by their wills, which he has wrought in them. End quote. But he immediately subjoins what must by no means be omitted, quote, that because we know not who belongs or does not belong to the number of the predestinated, it becomes us affectionately to desire the salvation of all. The consequence will be that whomsoever we meet we shall endeavour to make him a partaker of peace. But our peace shall rest upon the sons of peace. On our part, therefore, salutary and severe reproof like a medicine must be administered to all, that they may neither perish themselves nor destroy others, but it will be the providence of God to render it useful to them whom he had foreknown and predestinated. End quote. Chapter 24. Election confirmed by the divine call, the destined destruction of the reprobate procured by themselves. But in order to a further elucidation of the subject, it is necessary to treat of the calling of the elect, and of the binding and hardening of the impious. On the former, I have already made a few observations with a view to refute the error of those who suppose the generality of the promises to put all mankind on an equality. But the discriminating election of God, which is otherwise concealed within himself, he manifests only by his calling, which may therefore with propriety be termed the testification or evidence of it. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, in order to their eventual glorification. Though by choosing his people the Lord adopted them as his children, yet we see that they enter not on the possession of so great a blessing till they are called. On the other hand, as soon as they are called, they immediately enjoy some communication of his election. On this account, Paul calls the spirit received by them both the spirit of adoption and the seal and earnest of the future inheritance, because by his testimony he confirms and seals to their hearts the certainty of their future adoption. For though the preaching of the gospel is a stream from the source of election, yet being common also to the reprobate, it would of itself be no solid proof of it. For God effectually teaches his elect to bring them to faith, as we have already cited from the words of Christ, he which is of God, he and he alone hath seen the Father. 
Again I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me. For he says in another place, No man can come to me except the Father draw him. This passage is judiciously explained by Augustine in the following words. Quote, if, according to the declaration of truth, every one that has learned comes, whosoever comes not certainly has not learned. It does not necessarily follow that he who can come actually comes, unless he has both willed and done it. But every one that has learned of the Father not only can come, but also comes, where there is an immediate union of the advantage of possibility, the inclination of the will, and the consequent action. End quote. In another place he is still clearer. Quote, every one that hath heard and learnt of the Father cometh unto me. Is not this saying, There is no one that hears and learns of the Father, and comes not unto me? For if every one that has heard and learnt of the Father comes, certainly every one that comes not has neither heard nor learned of the Father, for if he had heard and learnt, he would come. Very remote from carnal observation is this school in which men hear and learn of the Father to come to the Son. End quote. Just after, he says, quote, This grace, which is secretly communicated to the hearts of men, is received by no hard heart, for the first object of its communication is that hardness of heart may be taken away. When the Father is heard within, therefore, he takes away the heart of stone and gives a heart of flesh, for thus he forms children of promise and vessels of mercy whom he has prepared for glory. Why then does he not teach all that they may come to Christ, but because all whom he teaches he teaches in mercy. But whom he teaches not, he teaches not in judgment. For he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. End quote. Those whom God has chosen, therefore, he designates as his children, and determines himself to be their father. By calling, he introduces them into his family, and unites them to himself, that they may be one. By connecting calling with election, the scripture evidently suggests that nothing is requisite to it, but the free mercy of God. For if we inquire whom he calls, and for what reason, the answer is, those whom he has elected. But when we come to election, we see nothing but mercy on every side. And so that observation of Paul is very applicable here. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. But not as it is commonly understood by those who make a distribution between the grace of God and the will and exertion of man. For they say that human desires and endeavours have no efficacy of themselves unless they are rendered successful by the grace of God, but maintain that, with the assistance of his blessing, these things have also their share in procuring salvation. To refute their cavil I prefer Augustine's words to my own. Quote, if the apostle only meant that it is not of him that wills, or of him that runs, without the assistance of the merciful Lord, we may retort the converse proposition, that it is not of mercy alone, without the assistance of willing and running. End quote. If this be manifestly impious, we may be certain that the apostle ascribes everything to the Lord's mercy, and leaves nothing to our wills or exertions. This was the opinion of that holy man nor is the least regard due to their paltry sophism that Paul would not have expressed himself so if we had no exertion or will. If he considered not what was in man, but seeing some persons attribute salvation partly to human industry, he simply condemned their error in the former part of the sentence, and in the latter vindicated the claim of divine mercy to the whole accomplishment of salvation. And what do the prophets but perpetually proclaim the gratuitous calling of God? This point is further demonstrated by the very nature and dispensation of calling, which consists not in the mere preaching of the word, but in the accompanying illumination of the spirit. To whom God offers his word, we are informed in the prophet, I am sought of them that asked not for me, I am found of them that sought me not, I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. And lest the Jews should suppose that this clemency extended only to the Gentiles, he recalls to their remembrance the situation from which he took their father Abraham, when he deigned to draw him to himself, that was from the midst of idolatry, in which he and all his family were sunk. When he first shines upon the undeserving with the light of his word, he thereby exhibits a most brilliant specimen of his free goodness. Here, then, the infinite goodness of God is displayed, but not to the salvation of all, for heavier judgment awaits the reprobate, because they reject the testimony of divine love. And God also, to manifest his glory, withdraws from them the efficacious influence of his spirit. 
this internal call therefore is a pledge of salvation which cannot possibly deceive to this purpose is that passage of john hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us and lest the flesh should glory in having answered at least to his call and accepted his free offers he affirms that men have no ears to hear or eyes to see but such as he has formed and that he acts in this not according to individual gratitude but according to his own election of this fact luke gives us an eminent example where jews and gentiles in common heard the preaching of paul and barnabas though they were all instructed on that occasion with the same discourse it is narrated that as many as were ordained to eternal life believed with what face then can we deny the freeness of calling in which election reigns alone even to the last here two errors are to be avoided for some suppose man to be a cooperator with god so that the validity of election depends on his consent thus according to them the will of man is superior to the counsel of god as though the scripture taught that we are only given an ability to believe and not faith itself others not thus innovating the grace of the holy spirit yet induced by i know not what mode of reasoning suspend election on that which is subsequent to it as though it were doubtful and ineffectual till it is confirmed by faith that this is its confirmation to us is very clear that it is the manifestation of god's secret counsel before concealed we have already seen but all that we are to understand by this is that what was before unknown is verified and as it were ratified with a seal but it is contrary to the truth to assert that election has no efficacy till after we have embraced the gospel and that this circumstance gives it all its energy the certainty of it indeed we are to seek here for if we attempt to penetrate to the eternal decree of god we shall be engulfed in the profound abyss but when god has discovered it to us we must ascend to loftier heights that the cause may not be lost in the effect for what can be more absurd and inconsistent when the scripture teaches that we are illuminated according as god has chosen us than that our eyes should be so dazzled with the blaze of this light as to refuse to contemplate election at the same time i admit that in order to attain an assurance of our salvation we ought to begin with the word and that with it our confidence ought to be satisfied so as to call upon god as our father for some persons to obtain certainty respecting the counsel of god which is nigh unto us in our mouth and in our heart preposterously wish to soar above the clouds such temerity therefore should be restrained by the sobriety of faith that we may be satisfied with the testimony of god in his external word respecting his secret grace only the channel which conveys to us such a copious stream to satisfy our thirst must not deprive the fountain-head of the honour which belongs to it as it is erroneous therefore to suspend the efficacy of election upon the faith of the gospel by which we discover our interest in election so we shall observe the best order if in seeking an assurance of our election we confine our attention to those subsequent signs which are certain attestations of it satan never attacks believers with a more grievous or dangerous temptation than when he disquiets them with doubts of their election and stimulates to an improper desire of seeking it in a wrong way i call it seeking in a wrong way when miserable man endeavours to force his way into the secret recesses of divine wisdom and to penetrate even to the highest eternity that he may discover what is determined concerning him at the tribunal of god then he precipitates himself to be absorbed in the profound of an unfathomable gulf then he entangles himself in numberless and inextricable snares then he sinks himself in an abyss of total darkness for it is right that the folly of the human mind should be thus punished with horrible destruction when it attempts by its own ability to rise to the summit of divine wisdom this temptation is the more fatal because there is no other to which men in general have a stronger propensity for there is scarcely a person to be found whose mind is not sometimes struck with this thought whence can you obtain salvation but from the election of god and what revelation have you received of election if this is once impressed a man it either perpetually excruciates the unhappy being with dreadful torments or altogether stupefies him with astonishment indeed i should desire no stronger argument to prove how extremely erroneous the conceptions of such persons are respecting predestination than experience itself since no error can affect the mind more pestilent than such as disturbs the conscience and destroys its peace and tranquillity towards god therefore if we dread shipwreck 
let us anxiously beware of this rock on which none ever strike without being destroyed. But, though the discussion of predestination may be compared to a dangerous ocean, yet in traversing over it the navigation is safe and serene, and I will also add pleasant, unless any one freely wishes to expose himself to danger. For as those who, in order to gain an assurance of their election, examine into the eternal counsel of God without the word, plunge themselves into a fatal abyss, so they who investigate it in a regular and orderly manner, as it is contained in the word, derive from such inquiry the benefit of peculiar consolation. Let this, then, be our way of inquiry, to begin and end with the calling of God. Though this prevents not believers from perceiving that the blessings they daily receive from the hand of God descend from that secret adoption, as Isaiah introduces them, saying, Thou hast done wonderful things, thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For by adoption, as by a token, God chooses to confirm to us all that we are permitted to know of his counsel. Lest this should be thought a weak testimony, let us consider how much clearness and certainty it affords us. Bernard has some pertinent observations on this subject. After speaking of the reprobate, he says, quote, The counsel of God stands, the sentence of peace stands, respecting them who fear him, concealing their faults and rewarding their virtues, so that to them not only good things but evil ones also cooperate for good. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is sufficient for me, for all righteousness, to possess his favour alone, against whom alone I have sinned. All that he has decreed not to impute to me is just as if had never been. End quote. And a little after, quote, O place of true rest, which I might not improperly call a bedchamber, in which God is viewed, not as disturbed with anger or filled with care, but where his will is proved to be good, acceptable, and perfect. This view is not terrifying, but soothing. It excites no restless curiosity, but allays it. It fatigues not the senses, but tranquillizes them. Here true rest is enjoyed. A tranquil God tranquillizes all things, and to behold rest is to enjoy repose. End quote. In the first place, if we seek the fatherly clemency and propitious heart of God, our eyes must be directed to Christ, in whom alone the Father is well pleased. If we seek salvation, life, and the immortality of the heavenly kingdom, recourse must be had to no other, for he alone is the fountain of life, the anchor of salvation, and the heir of the kingdom of heaven. Now what is the end of election but that, being adopted as children by our heavenly Father, we may by his favour obtain salvation and immortality? consider and investigate it as much as you please, you will not find its ultimate scope extend beyond this. The persons, therefore, whom God has adopted as his children, he is said to have chosen, not in themselves, but in Christ, because it was impossible for him to love them, except in him, or to honour them with the inheritance of his kingdom, unless previously made partakers of him. But if we are chosen in him, we shall find no assurance of our election in ourselves, nor even in God the Father, considered alone, abstractedly from the sun. Christ, therefore, is the mirror in which it behoves us to contemplate our election, and here we may do it with safety, for as the Father has determined to unite to the body of his Son all whom are the objects of his eternal choice, that he may have, as his children, all that he recognizes among his members. We have a testimony sufficiently clear and strong that if we have communion with Christ, we are written in the book of life and he gave us this certain communion with himself when he testified by the preaching of the gospel that he was given to us by the Father, to be ours with all his benefits. We are said to put him on and to grow up into him that we may live because he lives. This doctrine is often repeated. God spared not his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. He that believeth on him is passed from death unto life in which sense he calls himself the bread of life, he that eateth which shall live for ever. He, I say, is our witness that all who receive him by faith shall be considered as the children of his heavenly Father. If we desire anything more than being numbered among the sons and heirs of God, we must rise above Christ. If this is our highest limit, what folly do we betray in seeking out of him that which we have already obtained in him, and which can never be found anywhere else? Besides, as he is the Father's eternal wisdom, immutable truth, and determined counsel, we have no reason to fear the least variation in the declarations of his word from that will of the Father which is the object of our inquiry. Indeed, he faithfully reveals it to us, as it has been from the beginning and will ever continue to be. 
This doctrine ought to have a practical influence on our prayers, for though faith in election animates us to call upon God, yet it would be preposterous to obtrude it upon Him when we pray, or to stipulate this condition, O Lord, if I am elected, hear me, since it is His pleasure that we should be satisfied with His promises, and make no further inquiries whether He will be propitious to our prayers. This prudence will extricate us from many snares, if we know how to make a right use of what has been rightly written, but we must not inconsiderately apply to various purposes what ought to be restricted to the object particularly designed. For the establishment of our confidence, there is also another confirmation of election, which, we have said, is connected with our calling. For those whom Christ illuminates with the knowledge of his name, and introduces into the bosom of his church, he is said to receive into his charge and protection and all whom he receives are said to be committed and entrusted to him by the Father, to be kept to eternal life. What do we wish for ourselves? Christ loudly proclaims that all whose salvation was designed by the Father had been delivered by him into his protection. If therefore we want to ascertain whether God is concerned for our salvation, let us inquire whether he has committed us to Christ, whom he constituted the only Saviour of all his people. Now, if we doubt whether Christ has received us into his charge and custody, he obviates this doubt by freely offering himself as our shepherd, and declaring that if we hear his voice, we shall be numbered among his sheep. We therefore embrace Christ, thus kindly offered to us and advancing to meet us, and he will number us with his sheep, and preserve us enclosed in his fold. But yet we feel anxiety for our future state, for, as Paul declares, that whom he predestinated, them he also called. So Christ informs us that many are called, but few chosen. Besides, Paul himself also, in another place, cautions against carelessness, saying, Let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Again, art thou grafted among the people of God? Be not high-minded, but fear. God is able to cut thee off again, and graft in others. Lastly, experience itself teaches us that vocation and faith are of little value, unless accompanied by perseverance, which is not the lot of all. But Christ has delivered us from this anxiety, for these promises undoubtedly belong to the future. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Again my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall neither perish, neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and none is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Besides, when he declares, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up, he fully implies on the contrary that those who are rooted in God can never by any violence be deprived of salvation. With this corresponds that passage of John, If they had been of us, they would, no doubt, have continued with us. Hence also that magnificent exaltation of Paul, in defiance of life and death, of things present and future, which must necessarily have been founded in the gift of perseverance. Nor can it be doubted that he applies this sentiment to all the elect. The same apostle in another place says, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. This also supported David when his faith was failing. Thou wilt not forsake the work of thine own hands." Nor is it to be doubted that when Christ intercedes for all the elect, he prays for them, the same as for Peter, that their faith may never fail. Hence we conclude that they are beyond all danger of falling away, because the intercessions of the Son of God for their perseverance in piety have not been rejected. What did Christ intend we should learn from this, but confidence in our perpetual security, since we have once been introduced into the number of his people? But it daily happens that they who appeared to belong to Christ fall away from him again and sink into ruin. Even in that very place where he asserts that none perish of those who were given to him by the Father, he accepts the son of perdition. This is true, but it is equally certain that such persons never adhered to Christ with that confidence of heart which, we say, gives us an assurance of our election. They went out from us, says John, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. I dispute not their having similar signs of calling with the elect, but I am far from admitting them to possess that certain assurance of election which I enjoin believers to seek from the word of the gospel. 
Wherefore, let not such examples move us from a tranquil reliance on our Lord's promise, where he declares that all who receive him by faith were given him by the Father, and that, since he is their guardian and shepherd, not one of them shall perish. Of Judas we shall speak afterwards. Paul is dissuading Christians not from all security, but from supine, unguarded, carnal security, which is attended with pride, arrogance, and contempt of others, extinguishes humility and reverence of God, and produces forgetfulness of favours received. For he is addressing Gentiles, teaching them that the Jews should not be proudly and inhumanly insulted, because they have been rejected, and the Gentiles substituted in their place. He also inculcates fear, not such a fear as produces terror and uncertainty, but such as teaches humble admiration of the grace of God, without any diminution of confidence in it, as has been elsewhere observed. Besides, he is not addressing individuals, but distinct parties generally. For, as the church was divided into two parties, and emulation gave birth to dissension, Paul admonishes the Gentiles that their substitution in the place of the holy and peculiar people ought to be a motive to fear and modesty. There were, however, many clamorous people among them, whose empty boasting it was necessary to restrain. But we have already seen that our hope extends into futurity, even beyond the grave, and that nothing is more contrary to its nature than doubts respecting our final destiny. Book 3 Chapter 24, Section 8, to Book 3, Chapter 25, Section 9. The declaration of Christ, that many are called and few chosen, is very improperly understood, for there will be no ambiguity in it if we remember what must be clear from the foregoing observations, that there are two kinds of calling. For there is a universal call by which God, in the external preaching of the word, invites all, indiscriminately, to come to him, even those to whom he intends it as a savour of death, and an occasion of heavier condemnation. There is also a special call, with which he, for the most part, favours only believers, when, by the inward illumination of the Spirit, he causes the word preached to sink into their hearts." Yet sometimes he also communicates it to those whom he only enlightens for a season, and afterwards forsakes on account of their ingratitude, and strikes with greater blindness. Now the Lord, seeing the gospel published far and wide, held in contempt by the generality of men, and justly appreciated by few, gives us a description of God under the character of a king, who prepares a solemn feast and sends out his messengers in every direction to invite a great company, but can only prevail on very few, every one alleging impediments to excuse himself, so that at length he is constrained by their refusal to bring in all who can be found in the streets. Thus far every one sees the parable is to be understood of the external call. He proceeds to inform us that God acts like a good master of a feast, walking round the tables, courteously receiving his guests, but that if he finds any one not adorned with a nuptial garment, he suffers not the meanness of such a person to disgrace the festivity of the banquet. I confess this part is to be understood of those who enter into the church by a profession of faith, but are not invested with the sanctification of Christ. Such blemishes, and as it were cankers of his church, God will not always suffer, but will cast them out of it, as their turpitude deserves. Few, therefore, are chosen out of a multitude that are called, but not with that calling by which we say believers ought to judge of their election. For the former is common also to the wicked, but the latter is attended with the spirit of regeneration, the earnest and seal of the future inheritance, which seals our hearts to the day of the Lord. In short, though hypocrites boast of piety, as if they were true worshippers of God, Christ declares that he will finally cast them out of the place which they unjustly occupy. Thus the psalmist says, Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? He that worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. Again, this is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. And thus the Spirit exhorts believers to patience, that they may not be disturbed by Ishmaelites, being united with them in the church, since the mask will at length be torn off, and they will be cast out with disgrace. The same reasoning applies to the exception lately cited, where Christ says that none of them is lost but the son of perdition. Here is indeed some inaccuracy of expression, but the meaning is clear. For... He was never reckoned among the sheep of Christ, as being really such, but only as he occupied the place of one. 
When the Lord declares he was chosen by himself with the other apostles, it only refers to the ministerial office. Have not I chosen you twelve, says he, and one of you is a devil? That is, he had chosen him to the office of an apostle, but when he speaks of election to salvation, he excludes him from the number of the elect. I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen. If any one confound the term election in these passages, he will miserably embarrass himself. If he makes a proper distinction, nothing is plainer. It is therefore a very erroneous and pernicious assertion of Gregory that we are only conscious of our calling, but uncertain of our election, from which he exhorts all to fear and trembling, using also this argument that though we know what we are today, yet we know not what we may be in future. But the context plainly shows the cause of his error on this point, for as he suspended election on the merit of works, this furnished abundant reason for discouragement to the minds of men. He could never establish them, for want of leading them from themselves to a confidence in the divine goodness. Hence believers have some perception of what we stated at the beginning, that predestination, rightly considered, neither destroys nor weakens faith, but rather furnishes its best confirmation. Yet I will not deny that the Spirit sometimes accommodates his language to the limited extent of our capacity, as when he says, They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. As though God were beginning to write in the book of life those whom he numbers among his people, whereas we know from the testimony of Christ that the names of God's children have been written in the book of life from the beginning. But these expressions also signify the rejection of those who seemed to be the chief among the elect, as the psalmist says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. Now the elect are not gathered into the fold of Christ by calling, immediately from their birth, nor all at the same time, but according as God is pleased to dispense his grace to them. Before they are gathered to that chief shepherd, they go astray, scattered in the common wilderness, and differing in no respect from others, except in being protected by the special mercy of God from rushing down the precipice of eternal death. If you observe them, therefore, you will see the posterity of Adam partaking of the common corruption of the whole species. That they go not to the most desperate extremes of piety is not owing to any innate goodness of theirs, but because the eye of God watches over them, and his hand is extended for their preservation. For those who dream of I know not what seed of election sown in their heart from their very birth, always inclining them to piety and the fear of God, are unsupported by the authority of Scripture and refuted by experience itself. They produce indeed a very few examples to prove that certain elect persons were not entire strangers to religion, even before they were truly enlightened, that Paul lived blameless in his Pharisaism, that Cornelius with his alms and prayers was accepted of God, and if there are any other similar ones... What they say of Paul we admit, but respecting Cornelius we maintain that they are deceived, for it is evident he was then enlightened and regenerated, and wanted nothing but a clear revelation of the gospel. But what will they extort from these very few examples? That the elect have always been endued with the spirit of piety? This is just as if any one, having proved the integrity of Aristides, Socrates, Xenocrates, Scipio, Curius, Camillus, and other heathens should conclude from this that all who were left in the darkness of idolatry were followers of holiness and virtue, but this is contradicted in many passages of Scripture. Paul's description of the state of the Ephesians prior to regeneration exhibits not a grain of this seed. Ye were dead, he says, in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also... We all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Again, remember that at that time you were without hope and without God in the world. Again, you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light. But perhaps they will plead that these passages refer to that ignorance of the true God, in which they acknowledge the elect to be involved previously to their calling though this would be an impudent cavil, since the apostles' inferences from them are such as these. Put away lying, and let him that stole steal no more. But what will they reply to other passages, such as that where after declaring to the Corinthians that neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God? 
he immediately adds, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. And another passage, addressed to the Romans, as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? What kind of seed of election was springing up in them, who were all their lives contaminated with various pollutions, and with desperate wickedness, wallowed in the most nefarious and execrable of all crimes? If he had intended to speak according to these teachers, he ought to have shown how much they were obliged to the goodness of God, which had preserved them from falling into such great pollutions. So likewise the persons whom Peter addressed, he ought to have exhorted to gratitude on account of the perpetual seed of election, but, on the contrary, he admonishes them that the time past may suffice to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. What if we come to particular examples? What principle of righteousness was there in Rahab, the harlot before faith, in Manasseh, when Jerusalem was dyed and almost drowned with the blood of the prophets, in the thief who repented in his dying moments? Away, then, with these arguments, which men of presumptuous curiosity raise to themselves without regarding the Scripture, let us rather abide by the declaration of the Scripture that all we, like sheep, have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, that is, destruction. Those whom the Lord has determined to rescue from this gulf of perdition, he defers till his appointed season, before which he only preserves them from falling into unpardonable blasphemy. As the Lord, by his effectual calling of the elect, completes the salvation to which he predestinated them in his eternal counsel, so he has his judgments against the reprobate by which he executes his counsel respecting them. Those, therefore, whom he has created to a life of shame and a death of destruction, that they might be instruments of his wrath and examples of his severity, he causes to reach their appointed end, sometimes depriving them of the opportunity of hearing the word, sometimes by the preaching of it increasing their blindness and stupidity. Of the former there are innumerable examples. Let us only select one that is more evident and remarkable than the rest." Before the advent of Christ there passed about four thousand years in which the Lord concealed the light of the doctrine of salvation from all the Gentiles. If it be replied that he withheld from them the participation of so great a blessing, because he esteemed them unworthy, their posterity will be found equally unworthy of it. The truth of this, to say nothing of experience, is sufficiently attested by Malachi, who follows his reproofs of unbelief and gross blasphemies by an immediate prediction of the coming of the Messiah. Why, then, is he given to the posterity rather than to their ancestors? He will torment himself in vain who seeks for any cause of this beyond the secret and inscrutable counsel of God. Nor need we be afraid lest any disciple of Porphyry should be emboldened to calumniate the justice of God by our silence in its defence. For while we assert that all deserve to perish, and it is of God's free goodness that any are saved, enough is said for the illustration of his glory, so that... Every subterfuge of ours is altogether unnecessary. The Supreme Lord, therefore, by depriving of the communication of his light and leaving in darkness those whom he has reprobated, makes way for the accomplishment of his predestination. For the second class, the Scriptures contain many examples, and others present themselves every day. The same sermon is addressed to a hundred people, twenty receive it with the obedience of faith, the others despise or ridicule or reject or condemn it. If it be replied that the difference proceeds from their wickedness and perverseness, this will afford no satisfaction, because the minds of others would have been influenced by the same wickedness, but for the correction of divine goodness. And thus we shall always be perplexed unless we recur to Paul's question, Who maketh thee to differ? In which he signifies that the excellence of some men beyond others is not from their own virtue, but solely from divine grace. Why, then, in bestowing grace upon some, does he pass over others? Luke assigns a reason to the former, that they were ordained to eternal life. What conclusion, then, shall we draw respecting the latter, but that they are vessels of wrath to dishonour? Wherefore, let us not hesitate to say with Augustine, quote, God could convert to good the will of the wicked, because he is omnipotent. It is evident that he could. Why, then, does he not? Because he would not. Why he would not remains with himself. End quote. For we ought not to aim at more wisdom than becomes us. That will be much better than adopting the evasion of Chrysostom, quote, that he draws those who are willing and who stretch out their hands for his aid, end quote, 
that the difference may not appear to consist in the decree of God, but wholly in the will of man. But such an approach to him is so far from being a mere effort of man, that even pious persons, and such as fear God, still stand in need of the peculiar impulse of the spirit. Lydia, a seller of purple, feared God, and yet it was necessary that her heart should be opened to attend to and profit by the doctrine of Paul. This declaration is not made respecting a single female, but in order to teach us that every one's advancement in piety is the secret work of the Spirit. It is a fact not to be doubted that God sends his word to many whose blindness he determines shall be increased. For with what design does he direct so many commands to be delivered to Pharaoh? Was it from an expectation that his heart would be softened by repeated and frequent messages? Before he began, he knew and foretold the result. He commanded Moses to go and declare his will to Pharaoh, adding at the same time, But I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. So, when he calls forth Ezekiel, he apprises him that he is sending him to a rebellious and obstinate people, that he may not be alarmed if they refuse to hear him. So Jeremiah foretells that his word will be like fire to scatter and destroy the people like stubble. But the prophecy of Isaiah furnishes a still stronger confirmation, for this is his mission from the Lord. Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Observe, he directs his voice to them, but it is that they may become more deaf. He kindles a light, but it is that they may be made more blind. He publishes his doctrine, but it is that they may be more besotted. He applies a remedy, but it is that they may not be healed. John, citing this prophecy, declares that the Jews could not believe because this curse of God was upon them. Nor can it be disputed that to such persons as God determines not to enlighten, he delivers his doctrine involved in enigmatical obscurity, that its only effect may be to increase their stupidity. For Christ testifies that he confined to his apostles the explanations of the parables in which he had addressed the multitude. Because to you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. What does the Lord mean, you will say, by teaching those by whom he takes care not to be understood? Consider whence the fault arises, and you will cease the inquiry. For whatever obscurity there is in the word, yet there is always light enough to convince the consciences of the wicked. It remains now to be seen why the Lord does that which it is evident he does. If it be replied that this is done because men have deserved it by their impiety, wickedness, and ingratitude, it will be a just and true observation, but as we have not yet discovered the reason of this diversity, why some persist in obduracy while others are inclined to obedience, the discussion of it will necessarily lead us to the same remark that Paul has quoted from Moses concerning Pharaoh. Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth." that the reprobate obey not the word of God, when made known to them, is justly imputed to the wickedness and depravity of their hearts, provided it be at the same time stated that they are abandoned to this depravity, because they have been raised up, by a just but inscrutable judgment of God, to display his glory in their condemnation. So, when it is related of the sons of Eli, that they listened not to his salutary admonitions, because the Lord would slay them, it is not denied that their obstinacy proceeded from their own wickedness, but it is plainly implied that, though the Lord was able to soften their hearts, yet they were left in their obstinacy, because his immutable decree had predestinated them to destruction. To the same purpose is that passage of John. Though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not in him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? For though he does not acquit the obstinate from the charge of guilt, yet he satisfies himself with this reason, that the grace of God has no charms for men till the Holy Spirit give them a taste for it. And Christ cites the prophecy of Isaiah, They shall all be taught of God, with no other design than to show that the Jews are reprobate and strangers to the church, because they are destitute of docility, and he adduces no other reason for it than that the promise of God does not belong to them which is confirmed by that passage of Paul, where Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling-block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, is said to be unto them which are called the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
for after remarking what generally happens when the gospel is preached, that it exasperates some and is despised by others, he represents it as duly appreciated only by those who are called. A little before he had mentioned them that believe, not that he had an intention to deny its proper place to the grace of God, which precedes faith, but he seems to add this second description by way of correction, in order that those who had received the gospel might ascribe the praise of their faith to the divine call. And so, likewise, in a subsequent sentence, he represents them as the objects of divine election. When the impious hear these things, they loudly complain that God, by a wanton exercise of power, abuses his wretched creatures for the sport of his cruelty. But we, who know that all men are liable to so many charges at the divine tribunal, that of a thousand questions they would be unable to give a satisfactory answer to one, confess that the reprobate suffer nothing but what is consistent with the most righteous judgment of God. Though we cannot comprehend the reason of this, let us be content with some degree of ignorance where the wisdom of God soars into its own sublimity. But as objections are frequently raised from some passages of Scripture in which God seems to deny that the destruction of the wicked is caused by his decree, but that, in opposition to his remonstrances, they voluntarily bring ruin upon themselves, let us show by a brief explication that they are not at all inconsistent with the foregoing doctrine. A passage is produced from Ezekiel where God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. If this is to be extended to all mankind, why does he not urge many to repentance whose minds are more flexible to obedience than those of others who grow more and more callous to his daily invitations? Among the inhabitants of Nineveh and Sodom, Christ himself declares that his evangelical preaching and miracles would have brought forth more fruit than in Judea. How is it then, if God will have all men to be saved, that he opens not the gate of repentance to those miserable men who would be more ready to receive the favour? Hence we perceive it to be a violent perversion of the passage, if the will of God mentioned by the prophet be set in opposition to his eternal counsel, by which he has distinguished the elect from the reprobate. Now, if we inquire the genuine sense of the prophet, his only meaning is to inspire the penitent with hopes of pardon. And this is the sum, that it is beyond a doubt that God is ready to pardon sinners immediately on their conversion. Therefore he wills not their death, inasmuch as he wills their repentance. But experience teaches that he does not will the repentance of those whom he externally calls, in such a manner as to affect their hearts. Nor should he on this account be charged with acting deceitfully, for, though his external call only renders those who hear, without obeying it, inexcusable, yet it is justly esteemed the testimony of God's grace by which he reconciles men to himself. Let us observe, therefore, the design of the prophet in saying that God has no pleasure in the death of a sinner. It is to assure the pious of God's readiness to pardon them immediately on their repentance, and to show the impious the aggravation of their sin in rejecting such great compassion and kindness of God. Repentance, therefore, will always be met by divine mercy. But on whom repentance is bestowed, we are clearly taught by Ezekiel himself, as well as by all the prophets and apostles. Another passage adduced is from Paul, where he states that God will have all men to be saved, which, though somewhat different from the passage just considered, yet is very similar to it. I reply in the first place that it is evident from the context how God wills the salvation of all, for Paul connects these two things together, that he will have all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. If it was fixed in the eternal counsel of God that they should receive the doctrine of salvation, what is the meaning of that question of Moses? What nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them as we have? How is it that God has deprived many nations of the light of the gospel which others enjoyed? How is it that the pure knowledge of the doctrine of piety has never reached some, and that others have but just heard some obscure rudiments of it? Hence it will be easy to discover the design of Paul. He had enjoined Timothy to make solemn prayers in the church for kings and princes, but, as it might seem somewhat inconsistent, to pray to God for a class of men almost past hope, for they were not only strangers to the body of Christ, but striving with all their power to ruin his kingdom. He subjoins that this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, who will have all men to be saved, which only imports that God has not closed the way of salvation against any order of men, but has diffused his mercy in such a manner that he would have no rank to be destitute of it. 
the other texts adduced are not only declarative of the lord's determination respecting all men in his secret counsel they only proclaim that pardon is ready for all sinners who sincerely seek it for if they obstinately insist on its being said that god is merciful to all i will oppose to them what is elsewhere asserted that our god is in the heavens he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased this text then must be explained in a manner consistent with another where god says i will be gracious to whom i will be gracious and i will show mercy on whom i will show mercy he who makes a selection of objects for the exercise of his mercy does not impart that mercy to all but as it clearly appears that paul is there speaking not of individuals but orders of men i shall forbear any further argument it must be remarked however that paul is not declaring the actual conduct of god at all times in all places and to all persons but merely representing him as at liberty to make kings and magistrates at length partakers of the heavenly doctrine notwithstanding their present rage against it in consequence of their blindness there is more apparent plausibility in their objection from the declaration of peter that the lord is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance but the second clause furnishes an immediate solution of this difficulty for the willingness that they should come to repentance must be understood in consistence with the general tenor of scripture conversion is certainly in the power of god let him be asked whether he wills the conversion of all when he promises a few individuals to give them a heart of flesh while he leaves others with a heart of stone if he were not ready to receive those who implore his mercy there would indeed be no propriety in this address turn ye unto me and i will turn unto you but i maintain that no mortal ever approaches god without being divinely drawn but if repentance depended on the will of man paul would not have said if god peradventure will give them repentance and if god whose voice exhorts all men to repentance did not draw the elect to it by the secret operation of the spirit jeremiah would not have said turn thou me and i shall be turned for thou art the lord my god surely after that i was turned i repented if this be correct it will be said that there can be but little faith in the promises of the gospel which in declaring the will of god assert that he wills what is repugnant to his inviolable decree but this is far from a just conclusion for if we turn our attention to the effect of the promises of salvation we shall find that their universality is not at all inconsistent with the predestination of the reprobate we know the promises to be effectual to us only when we receive them by faith on the contrary the annihilation of faith is at once an abolition of the promises if this is their nature we may perceive that there is no discordance between these two things god's having appointed from eternity on whom he will bestow his favour and exercise his wrath and his proclaiming salvation indiscriminately to all indeed i maintain that there is the most perfect harmony between them for his sole design in thus promising is to offer his mercy to all who desire and seek it which none do but those whom he has enlightened and he enlightens all whom he has predestinated to salvation these persons experience the certain and unshaken truth of the promises so that it cannot be pretended that there is the least contrariety between god's eternal election and the testimony of his grace offered to believers but why does he mention all it is in order that the consciences of the pious may enjoy the more secure satisfaction seeing that there is no difference between sinners provided they have faith and on the other hand that the impious may not plead the want of an asylum to flee to from the bondage of sin while they ungratefully reject that which is offered to them when the mercy of god is offered to both in the gospel it is faith that is the illumination of god which distinguishes between the pious and impious so that the former experience the efficacy of the gospel but the latter derive no benefit from it now this illumination is regulated by god's eternal election the complaint and lamentation of christ o jerusalem jerusalem how often would i have gathered thy children together and ye would not however they cite it affords them no support i confess that christ here speaks not merely in his human character but that he is upbraiding the jews for having in all ages rejected his grace but we must define the will of god which is here intended it is well known how sedulously god laboured to preserve that people to himself and with what extreme obstinacy from the first to the last they refused to be gathered being abandoned to their own wandering desires but this does not authorize the conclusion that the counsel of god was frustrated by the wickedness of men they object that nothing is more inconsistent with the nature of god than to have two wills this i grant them provided it be rightly explained 
but why do they not consider the numerous passages where by the assumption of human affections god condescends beneath his own majesty he says i have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people early and late endeavouring to bring them to himself if they are determined to accommodate all this to god and disregard the figurative mode of expression they will give rise to many needless contentions which may be settled by this one solution that what is peculiar to man is transferred to god the solution however elsewhere stated by us is fully sufficient that though to our apprehension the will of god is manifold and various yet he does not in himself will things at variance with each other but astonishes our faculties with his various and manifold wisdom according to the expression of paul till we shall be enabled to understand that he mysteriously wills what now seems contrary to his will they impertinently object that god being the father of all it is unjust for him to disinherit any but such as have previously deserved this punishment by their own guilt as if the goodness of god did not extend even to dogs and swine but if the question relates to the human race let them answer why god allied himself to one people as their father why he gathered even from these but a very small number as the flower of them but their rage for slander prevents these railers from considering that god maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good but that the inheritance is reserved for the few to whom it shall one day be said come ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world they further object that god hates nothing he has made which though i grant them the doctrine i maintain still remains unshaken that the reprobate are hated by god and that most justly because being destitute of his spirit they can do nothing but what is deserving of his curse they further allege that there is no difference between the jew and the gentile and therefore that the grace of god is offered indiscriminately to all i grant it only let them admit according to the declaration of paul that god calls whom he pleases both of the jews and of the gentiles so that he is under no obligation to any in this way also we answer their arguments from another text which says that god hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all which imports that he will have the salvation of all who are saved ascribed to his mercy though his blessing is not common to all now while many arguments are advanced on both sides let our conclusion be to stand astonished with paul at so great a mystery and amidst the clamour of petulant tongues let us not be ashamed of exclaiming with him o man who art thou that repliest against god for as augustine justly contends it is acting a most perverse part to set up the measure of human justice as the standard by which to set up the measure of human justice as the standard by which to measure the justice of god chapter twenty five the final resurrection though christ the son of righteousness after having abolished death is declared by paul to have brought life and immortality to light shining upon us through the gospel whence also in believing we are said to have passed from death unto life being no more strangers and foreigners but fellow-citizens with the saints and of the household of god who hath made us to sit together in heavenly places with his only begotten son that nothing may be wanting to our complete felicity yet lest we should find it grievous to be still exercised with a severe warfare as though we derived no benefit from the victory gained by christ we must remember what is stated in another place concerning the nature of hope for since we hope for that we see not and according to another text faith is the evidence of things not seen as long as we are confined in the prison of the flesh we are absent from the lord wherefore the same apostle says ye are dead and your life is hid with christ in god and when christ who is our life shall appear then shall you also appear with him in glory this then is our condition that we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great god and our saviour jesus christ here we have need of more than common patience lest being wearied we pursue a retrograde course or desert the station assigned us all that has hitherto been stated therefore concerning our salvation requires minds elevated towards heaven that according to the suggestion of peter we may love christ whom we have not seen and believing in him may rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory till we receive the end of our faith for which reason paul represents the faith and hope of believers as having respect to the hope that is laid up in heaven when we are thus looking towards heaven with our eyes fixed upon christ and nothing detains them on earth from carrying us forward to the promised blessedness we realize the fulfilment of that declaration where your treasure is 
there will your heart be also. Hence it is that faith is so scarce in the world because, to our sluggishness, nothing is more difficult than to ascend through innumerable obstacles, pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. To the accumulation of miseries which generally oppress us are added the mockeries of the profane with which our simplicity is assailed, while voluntarily renouncing the allurements of present advantage or pleasure we seem to pursue happiness which is concealed from our view like a shadow that continually eludes our grasp in a word above and below before and behind we are beset by violent temptations which our minds would long ago have been incapable of sustaining if they had not been detached from terrestrial things and attached to the heavenly life which is apparently at a remote distance he alone therefore has made a solid proficiency in the gospel who has been accustomed to continual meditation on the blessed resurrection the supreme good was a subject of anxious dispute and even contention among the ancient philosophers yet none of them except plato acknowledged the chief good of man to consist in his union with god but of the nature of this union he had not even the smallest idea and no wonder for he was totally uninformed respecting the sacred bond of it we know what is the only and perfect happiness even in this earthly pilgrimage but it daily inflames our hearts with increasing desires after it till we shall be satisfied with its full fruition therefore i have observed that the advantage of christ's benefits is solely enjoyed by those who elevate their minds to the resurrection thus paul also sets before believers this object towards which he tells us he directs all his own efforts forgetting everything else if by any means he may attain unto it and it behoves us to press forward to the same point with the greater alacrity lest if this world engross our attention we should be grievously punished for our sloth he therefore characterizes believers by this mark our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the saviour and that their minds may not flag in this course he associates with them all creatures as their companions for as ruin and deformity are visible on every side he tells us that all things in heaven and earth are tending to renovation for the fall of adam having deranged the perfect order of nature the bondage to which the creatures have been subjected by the sin of man is grievous and burdensome to them not that they are endued with any intelligence, but because they naturally aspire to the state of perfection from which they have fallen. Paul therefore attributes to them groaning and travailing pains, that we who have received the first fruits of the Spirit may be ashamed of remaining in our corruption, and not imitating at least the inanimate elements which bear the punishment of the sin of others. But as a still stronger stimulus to us, he calls the second advent of Christ our redemption. It is true indeed that all the parts of our redemption are already completed, but because Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, he shall appear a second time without sin unto salvation. Whatever calamities oppress us, this redemption should support us even till its full consummation. Let the importance of the object sharpen our pursuit. Paul justly argues that if there be no resurrection of the dead, the whole gospel is vain and fallacious, for we should be of all men the most miserable, being exposed to the hatred and reproaches of mankind, standing in jeopardy every hour, and being even like sheep destined to the slaughter, and therefore its authority would fall to the ground, not in one point only, but in everything it contains relating to adoption and the accomplishment of our salvation. To this subject, the most important of all, let us give an attention never to be wearied by length of time. With this view I have deferred what I shall briefly say of it to another place, that the reader, after receiving Christ as the author of complete salvation, may learn to soar higher, and may know that he is invested with heavenly glory and immortality, in order that the whole body may be conformed to the head, as in his person the Holy Spirit frequently gives an example of the resurrection. It is a thing difficult to be believed that bodies, after having been consumed by corruption, shall at length, at the appointed time, be raised again. Therefore, while many of the philosophers asserted the immortality of the soul, the resurrection of the body was admitted by few. And though this furnishes no excuse, yet it admonishes us that this truth is too difficult to command the assent of the human mind. To enable faith to surmount so great an obstacle, the scripture supplies us with two assistances. One consists in the similitude of Christ, the other in the omnipotence of God. Now, whenever the resurrection is mentioned, let us set before us the image of Christ, who in our nature, which he assumed, finished his course in this mortal life in such a manner, that, having now obtained immortality, he is the pledge of future resurrection to us. 
for in the afflictions that befall us we bear about in the body the dying of the lord jesus that the life also of jesus might be made manifest in our body and to separate him from us is not lawful nor indeed possible without rending him asunder hence the reasoning of paul if there be no resurrection of the dead then is christ not risen for he assumes this as an acknowledged principle that christ neither fell under the power of death nor triumphed over it in his resurrection for himself as a private individual but that all this was a commencement in the head of what must be fulfilled in all the members according to every one's order and degree for it would not be right indeed for them to be in all respects equal to him it is said in the psalms thou wilt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption though a portion of this confidence belongs to us according to the measure bestowed upon us yet the perfect accomplishment has been seen in christ alone who had his body restored to him entire free from all corruption now that we may have no doubt of our fellowship with christ in his blessed resurrection and may be satisfied with this pledge paul expressly affirms that the design of his session in heaven and his advent in the character of judge at the last day is to change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body in another place also he shows that god raised his son from the dead not in order to display a single specimen of his power but to exert on believers the same energy of his spirit whom he therefore calls our life while he dwells in us because he was given for this very purpose to quicken our mortal bodies i am but briefly glancing at things which would admit of a fuller discussion and are deserving of more elegance of style but i trust the pious reader will find in a small compass sufficient matter for the edification of his faith christ therefore rose again that we might be the companions of his future life he was raised by the father inasmuch as he was the head of the church from which he does not suffer him to be separated he was raised by the power of the spirit who is given to us also for the purpose of quickening us in a word he was raised that he might be the resurrection and the life but as we have observed that this mirror exhibits to us a lively image of our resurrection so it will furnish a firm foundation for our minds to rest upon provided we are not wearied or disturbed by the long delay because it is not ours to measure the moments of time by our own inclinations but to wait patiently for god's establishment of his kingdom in his own appointed time to this purpose is the expression of paul christ the firstfruits afterwards they that are christ's at his coming but that no doubt may be entertained of the resurrection of christ on which the resurrection of us all is founded we see in how many and various ways he has caused it to be attested to us scorners will ridicule the history narrated by the evangelists as a childish mockery for what weight they ask is there in the message brought by some women in a fright and afterwards confirmed by the disciples half dead with fear why does not christ set up the splendid trophies of his victory in the midst of the temple and the public places why does he not make a formidable entrance into the presence of pilate why does he not prove himself to be again alive to the priests and all the inhabitants of jerusalem profane men will scarcely believe the persons selected by him to be competent witnesses i reply notwithstanding the contemptible weakness evident in these beginnings yet all this was conducted by the admirable providence of god that they who were lately dispirited with fear were hurried away to the sepulchre partly by love to christ and pious zeal partly by their own unbelief not only to be eye-witnesses of the fact but to hear from the angels the same as they saw with their eyes how can we suspect the authority of those who considered what they heard from the women as idle tales till they had the fact clearly before them as to the people at large and the governor himself it is no wonder that after the ample conviction they had they were denied a sight of christ or any other proofs the sepulchre is sealed a watch is set the body is not found on the third day the soldiers corrupted by bribes circulate a rumour that he was stolen away by his disciples as if they had power to collect a strong force or were furnished with arms or were even accustomed to such a daring exploit but if the soldiers had not courage enough to repulse them why did they not pursue them that with the assistance of the people they might seize some of them the truth is therefore that pilate by his zeal attested the resurrection of christ and the guards who were placed at the sepulchre either by their silence or by their falsehood were in reality so many heralds to publish the same fact in the meantime the voice of the angels loudly proclaimed he is not here but is risen their celestial splendour evidently showed them to be angels and not men 
After this, if there was any doubt still remaining, it was removed by Christ himself. More than once his disciples saw and even felt and handled him, and their unbelief has eminently contributed to the confirmation of our faith. He discoursed among them concerning the mysteries of the kingdom of God, and at length they saw him ascend to heaven. Nor was this spectacle exhibited only to the eleven apostles, but he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once. By the mission of the Holy Spirit he gave an undeniable proof not only of his life, but also of his sovereign dominion, according to his prediction, It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart I will send him unto you. Paul, in his way to Damascus, was not prostrated to the ground by the influence of a dead man, but felt that the person whom he was opposing was armed with supreme power. He appeared to Stephen for another reason, to overcome the fear of death by an assurance of life. To refuse credit to testimonies so numerous and authentic is not diffidence, but perverse and unreasonable obstinacy. The remark we have made that in proving the resurrection our minds should be directed to the infinite power of God is briefly suggested in these words of Paul, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. It would therefore be extremely unreasonable here to consider what could possibly happen in the ordinary course of nature when the object proposed to us is an inestimable miracle, the magnitude of which absorbs all our faculties. Yet Paul adduces an example from nature to reprove the folly of those who deny the resurrection. Thou fool, says he, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. He tells us that seed sown displays an image of the resurrection because the corn is reproduced from putrefaction. Nor would it be a thing so difficult to believe if we paid proper attention to the miracles which present themselves to our view in all parts of the world. But let us remember that no man will be truly persuaded of the future resurrection, but he who is filled with admiration and ascribes to the power of God the glory that is due to it. Transported with this confidence, Isaiah exclaims, Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body they shall arise, awake and sing ye that dwell in dust. Surrounded by desperate circumstances, he has recourse to God, the author of life, unto whom, as the psalmist says, belong the issues from death. Even reduced to a state resembling a dead carcass more than a living man, yet relying on the power of God, just as if he were in perfect health, Job looks forward without any doubts to that day. I know, says he, that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, there to display his power, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself and not another. For though some persons employ great subtlety to pervert these texts, as if they ought not to be understood of the resurrection, they nevertheless confirm what they wish to destroy, since holy men in the midst of calamities seek consolation from no other quarter than from the similitude of the resurrection, which more fully appears from a passage in Ezekiel, for when the Jews rejected the promise of the restoration, and objected that there was no more probability of a way being opened for their return than of the dead coming forth from their sepulchres, a vision is presented to the prophet of a field full of dry bones, and God commands them to receive flesh and nerves. Though this figure is intended to inspire the people with a hope of restoration, he borrows the argument for it from the resurrection as it is to us also the principal model of all the deliverances which believers experience in this world. So Christ, after having declared that the voice of the gospel communicates life, in consequence of its rejection by the Jews, immediately adds, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. After the example of Paul, therefore, let us even now triumphantly exult in the midst of our conflicts, that he who has promised us a life to come, is able to keep that which we have committed to him, and thus let us glory that there is laid up for us a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge shall give us. The consequence of this will be that all the troubles we suffer will point us to the life to come, seeing it is a righteous thing with God and agreeable to his nature to recompense tribulation to them that trouble us, and to us who are unjustly troubled, rest when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed with his mighty angels in flaming fire. But we must remember what immediately follows, that he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because they believe the gospel. Now, though the minds of men ought to be continually occupied with the study of this subject, 
yet as if they expressly intended to abolish all remembrance of the resurrection they have called death the end of all things and the destruction of man for solomon certainly speaks according to a common and received opinion when he says a living dog is better than a dead lion and again who knows whether the spirit of man goeth upward and the spirit of the beast goeth downward this brutish stupidity has infected all ages of the world and even forced its way into the church for the sadducees had the audacity publicly to profess that there is no resurrection and that souls are mortal but that none might be excused by this gross ignorance the very instinct of nature has always set before the eyes of unbelievers an image of the resurrection for what is the sacred and inviolable custom of interring the dead but a pledge of another life nor can it be objected that this originated in error for the rites of sepulture were always observed among the holy fathers and it pleased god that the same custom should be retained among the gentiles that their torpor might be roused by the image of the resurrection thereby set before them though this ceremony produced no good effects upon them yet it will be useful to us if we wisely consider its tendency for it is no slight refutation of unbelief that all united in professing a thing that none of them believed but satan has not only stupefied men's minds to make them bury the memory of the resurrection together with the bodies of the dead but has endeavoured to corrupt this point of doctrine by various fictions with an ultimate view to its total subversion not to mention that he began to oppose it in the days of paul not long after arose the millenarians who limited the reign of christ to a thousand years their fiction is too puerile to require or deserve refutation nor does the revelation which they quote in favour of their error afford them any support for the term of a thousand years there mentioned refers not to the eternal blessedness of the church but to the various agitations which awaited the church in its militant state upon earth but the whole scripture proclaims that there will be no end of the happiness of the elect or the punishment of the reprobate now all those things which are invisible to our eyes or far above the comprehension of our minds must either be believed on the authority of the oracles of god or entirely rejected those who assign the children of god a thousand years to enjoy the inheritance of the future life little think what dishonour they cast on christ and his kingdom if they are not invested with immortality neither is christ himself into the likeness of whose glory they will be transformed received up into immortal glory if their happiness will have any end it follows that the kingdom of christ on the stability of which it rests is temporary lastly either these persons are extremely ignorant of all divine things or they are striving with malignant perverseness to overturn all the grace of god and power of christ and these can never be perfectly fulfilled till sin is abolished and death swallowed up and eternal life completely established but the folly of being afraid that too much cruelty is attributed to god if the reprobate are doomed to eternal punishment is even evident to the blind will the lord do any injury by refusing the enjoyment of his kingdom to persons whose ingratitude shall have rendered them unworthy of it but their sins are temporary this i grant but the majesty of god as well as his justice which their sins have violated is eternal their iniquity therefore is justly remembered then the punishment is alleged to be excessive being disproportioned to the crime but this is intolerable blasphemy when the majesty of god is so little valued when the contempt of it is considered of no more consequence than the destruction of one's soul but let us pass by these triflers lest contrary to what we have before said we should appear to consider their reveries as worthy of refutation besides these wild notions the perverse curiosity of man has introduced two others some have supposed that the whole man dies and that souls are raised again together with bodies others admitting the immortality of souls suppose they will be clothed with new bodies and thereby deny the resurrection of the flesh as i have touched on the former of these notions in the creation of man it will be sufficient again to apprise my readers that it is a brutish error to represent the spirit formed after the image of god as a fleeting breath which animates the body only during this perishable life and to annihilate the temple of the holy ghost in short to despoil that part of us in which divinity is eminently displayed and the characters of immortality are conspicuous of this property so that the condition of the body must be better and more excellent than that of the soul very different is the doctrine of scripture which compares the body to a habitation from which we depart at death because it estimates us by that part of our nature which constitutes the distinction between us and the brutes 
Thus Peter, when near his death, says, Shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. And Paul, speaking of believers, having said that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building in the heavens, adds that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, and willing rather to be absent from the body, and to be present with the Lord. Unless our souls survive our bodies, what is it that is present with God when separated from the body? But the apostle removes all doubt when he says that we are come to the spirits of just men made perfect, by which expression he means that we are associated with the holy fathers, who, though dead, still maintain the same piety with us, so that we cannot be members of Christ without being united with them. If souls separated from bodies did not retain their existence so as to be capable of glory and felicity, Christ would not have said to the thief, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Supported by such undeniable testimonies, let us not hesitate, after the example of Christ, when we die to commend our spirits to God, or, like Stephen, to resign them to the care of Christ, who is justly called the faithful shepherd and bishop of souls. Over curious inquiry respecting their intermediate state is neither lawful nor useful. Many persons exceedingly perplex themselves by discussing what place they occupy, and whether they already enjoy the glory of heaven or not. But it is folly and presumption to push our inquiries on unknown things beyond what God permits us to know. The scripture declares that Christ is present with them, and receives them into paradise, where they enjoy consolation, and that the souls of the reprobate endure the torments which they have deserved, but it proceeds no further. Now what teacher or doctor shall discover to us that which God has concealed? The question respecting place is equally senseless and futile, because we know that the soul has no dimensions like the body. The blessed assemblage of holy spirits, being called the bosom of Abraham, teaches us that it is enough for us, at the close of this pilgrimage, to be received by the common father of believers, and to participate with him in the fruit of his faith. In the meanwhile, as the scripture uniformly commands us to look forward with eager expectation to the coming of Christ, and defers the crown of glory which awaits us till that period, let us be content within these limits which God prescribes to us, that the souls of pious men, after finishing their laborious warfare, depart into a state of blessed rest, where they wait with joy and pleasure for the fruition of the promised glory, and so that all things remain in suspense till Christ appears as the Redeemer. And there is no doubt that the condition of the reprobate is the same as Jude assigns to the devils, who are confined and bound in chains till they are brought forth to the punishment to which they are doomed. Equally monstrous is the error of those who imagine that souls will not resume the bodies which at present belong to them, but will be furnished with others altogether different. It was the very futile reasoning of the Manichaeans that it is absurd to expect that the flesh which is so impure will ever rise again, as if there were no impurity attached to the souls which they nevertheless encouraged to entertain hopes of a heavenly life. It was therefore just as if they had maintained that anything infected with the contagion of sin is incapable of being purified by the power of God, for that reverie that the flesh was created by the devil and therefore naturally impure, I at present forbear to notice, and only observe that whatever we have in us, now unworthy of heaven, will not hinder the resurrection. In the first place, when Paul exhorts believers to cleanse themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, thence follows the judgment he elsewhere denounces that every one shall receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad, with which agrees also another passage, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Wherefore, in another place, he prays to God that the whole person may be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, even the body as well as the soul and spirit. And no wonder, for that those bodies which God has dedicated as temples for himself should sink into corruption without any hope of resurrection would be absurd in the extreme. What is to be concluded from their being members of Christ, from God's enjoining every part of them to be sanctified to himself, requiring their tongues to celebrate his name, their hands to be lifted up with purity to him, and their bodies altogether to be presented to him as living sacrifices. This part of our nature, therefore, being dignified with such illustrious honour by the heavenly judge, what madness is betrayed by a mortal man in asserting it to be reduced to ashes without any hope of restoration? And Paul, when he gives us this exhortation, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, certainly does not countenance consigning to eternal corruption that which he asserts to be consecrated to God. 
nor is there any point more clearly established in scripture than the resurrection of our present bodies this corruptible says paul must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality if new bodies were to be formed by god what would become of this change of quality if it had been said that we must be renewed the ambiguity of the expression might have given occasion for cavil now when he particularly designates the bodies that surround us and promises that they shall be raised in incorruption it is a sufficient denial of the formation of new ones Quote, he could not indeed says tertullian have spoken more expressly unless he had held his own skin in his hand End quote. nor will any cavil evade the declaration of isaiah cited by the apostle respecting christ as the future judge of the world as i live saith the lord every knee shall bow to me for he plainly declares to the persons addressed by him that they shall be obliged to give an account of their lives which would not be reasonable if new bodies were to be placed at the tribunal there is no obscurity in the language of daniel many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt for god does not collect fresh materials from the four elements for the fabrication of men but calls the dead out of their sepulchres and this the plainest reason dictates for if death which originated in the fall of man be adventitious and not necessary to our nature the restoration effected by christ belongs to the same body which was thus rendered mortal from the ridicule of the athenians when paul asserted the resurrection it is easy to infer the nature of his doctrine and that ridicule is of no small weight for the confirmation of our faith the injunction of christ also is worthy of attention fear not them which kill the body but which are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell for there would be no reason for this fear if the body which we now carry about were not liable to punishment another of christ's declarations is equally plain the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation shall we say that souls rest in graves and will there hear the voice of christ and not rather that bodies at his command will return to the vigour they had lost besides if we are to receive new bodies where will be the conformity between the head and members christ rose was it by making himself a new body no but according to his prediction destroy this temple and in three days i will raise it up the mortal body which he before possessed he again assumed for it would have conduced but little to our benefit if there had been a substitution of a new body and an annihilation of that which had been offered as an atoning sacrifice we must therefore maintain the connection stated by the apostle that we shall rise because christ has risen for nothing is more improbable than that our body in which we bear about the dying of the lord jesus should be deprived of a resurrection similar to his there was an illustrious example of this immediately on christ's resurrection when the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose for it cannot be denied that this was a prelude or rather an earnest of the final resurrection which we expect such as was exhibited before in enoch and elijah whom tertullian speaks of as quote, the candidates of the resurrection end quote, because they were taken into the immediate care of god with an entire exemption from corruption in body and soul i am ashamed of consuming so many words on so clear a subject but my readers will cheerfully unite with me in submitting to this trouble that no room may be left for men of perverse and presumptuous minds to deceive the unwary the unsteady spirits i am now opposing bring forward a figment of their own brains that at the resurrection there will be a creation of new bodies what reason can induce them to adopt this sentiment but a seeming incredibility in their apprehension that a body long consumed by corruption can ever return to its pristine state unbelief therefore is the only source of this opinion in the scripture on the contrary we are uniformly exhorted by the spirit of god to hope for the resurrection of our body for this reason baptism is spoken of by paul as a seal of our future resurrection and we are as clearly invited to this confidence by the sacred supper when we receive into our mouths the symbols of spiritual grace and certainly the exhortation of paul to yield our members as instruments of righteousness unto god would lose all its force if unaccompanied by what he afterwards subjoins he that raised up christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies for what would it avail to devote our feet hands eyes and tongues to the service of god if they were not to participate the benefit and reward this is clearly confirmed by the following passage of paul 
the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body, and God hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. The following passages are still plainer, that our bodies are the temples of the Holy Ghost, and members of Christ. In the meantime, we see how he connects the resurrection with chastity and holiness, and so he just after extends the price of redemption to our bodies. Now it would be extremely unreasonable that the body of Paul, in which he bore the marks of the Lord Jesus, and in which he eminently glorified Christ, should be deprived of the reward of the crown. Hence also that exaltation, we look for the Saviour from heaven, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And if it be true that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God, there can be no reason for prohibiting this entrance to the bodies, which God trains under the banner of the cross, and honours with the glory of victory. Therefore, no doubt has ever been entertained by the saints whether they should hope to be companions of Christ hereafter, who transfers to his own person all the afflictions with which we are tried, to teach us that they are conducting us to life. And God also established the Holy Fathers under the law in this faith by an external ceremony, for to what purpose was the rite of sepulture, as we have already seen, but to instruct them that another life was prepared for the interred bodies. The same was suggested by the spices and other symbols of immortality, which, like the sacrifices under the law, assisted the obscurity of direct instruction. Nor did this custom arise from superstition, for we find the Holy Spirit as diligent in mentioning the sepulchres as in insisting on the principal mysteries of faith. And Christ commends this as no mean office, certainly for no other reason but because it raises our eyes from the view of the grave which corrupts and dissolves all things, to the spectacle of future renovation. Besides the very careful observation of this ceremony which is commended in the Fathers, sufficiently proves it to have been an excellent and valuable assistance to faith. Nor would Abraham have discovered such solicitous concern about the sepulchre of his wife, if he had not been actuated by motives of religion, and the prospect of more than worldly advantage, that by adorning her dead body with the emblems of the resurrection, he might confirm his own faith and that of his family. There is yet a clearer proof of this in the example of Jacob, who, to testify to his posterity that the hope of the promised land did not forsake his heart even in death, commands his bones to be reconveyed thither. If he was to be furnished with a new body, would not this have been a ridiculous command concerning dust that was soon to be annihilated? Wherefore, if the authority of the scripture has any weight with us, no clearer or stronger proof of any doctrine can possibly be desired. Even children understand this to be the meaning of the term resurrection, for we never apply this term to any instance of original creation, nor would it be consistent with the declaration of Christ, of all which the Father hath given me, I shall lose nothing, but will raise it up again on the last day. The same is implied in the word sleeping, which is only applicable to the body. Hence the appellation of cemetery or sleeping place given to places of burial. It remains for me to touch a little on the manner of the resurrection, and I shall but just hint at it, because Paul, by calling it a mystery, exhorts us to sobriety, and forbids all licentiousness of subtle and extravagant speculation. In the first place, let it be remembered, as we have observed, that we shall rise again with the same bodies we have now, as to the substance, but that the quality will be different, just as the very body of Christ, which had been offered as a sacrifice, was raised again, but with such new and superior qualities, as though it had been altogether different. Paul represents this by some familiar examples, for as the flesh of man and of brutes is the same in substance but not in quality, as the matter of all the stars is the same but they differ in glory, so though we shall retain the substance of our body, he tells us there will be a change which will render its condition far more excellent. The corruptible body therefore will neither perish nor vanish in order to our resurrection, but having laid aside corruption will put on incorruption. God, having all the elements subject to his control, will find no difficulty in commanding the earth, the water, and the fire to restore whatever they appear to have consumed. This is declared in figurative language by Isaiah, Behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. But we must remark the difference between those who shall have been already dead, and those whom that day shall find alive. We shall not all sleep, says Paul, but we shall all be changed. 
that is there will be no necessity for any distance of time to intervene between death and the commencement of the next life for in a moment in the twinkling of an eye the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and the living transformed by a sudden change into the same glory so in another epistle he comforts believers who were to die that those which are alive and remain under the coming of the lord shall not prevent them which are asleep but that the dead in christ shall rise first if it be objected that the apostle says it is appointed unto men once to die the answer is easy that where the state of the nature is changed it is a species of death and may without impropriety be so called and therefore there is a perfect consistence between these things that all will be removed by death when they put off the mortal body but that a separation of the body and soul will not be necessary where there will be an instantaneous change but here arises a question of greater difficulty how can the resurrection which is a peculiar benefit of christ be common to the impious and the subjects of the divine curse we know that in adam all were sentenced to death christ comes as the resurrection and the life but was it to bestow life promiscuously on all mankind but what would be more improbable than that they should obtain in their obstinate blindness what the pious worshippers of god recover by faith alone yet it remains certain that one will be a resurrection to judgment the other to life and that christ will come to separate the sheep from the goats i reply we ought not to think that so very strange which we see exemplified in our daily experience we know that in adam we lost the inheritance of the whole world and have no more right to the enjoyment of common elements than to the fruit of the tree of life how is it then that god not only maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good but that for the accommodations of the present life his inestimable liberality is diffused in the most copious abundance hence we see that things which properly belong to christ and his members are also extended to the impious not to become their legitimate possession but to render them more inexcusable thus impious men frequently experience god's beneficence in remarkable instances which sometimes exceed all the blessings of the pious but which nevertheless are the means of aggravating their condemnation if it be objected that the resurrection is improperly compared with fleeting and terrestrial advantages i reply again that when men were first alienated from god the fountain of life they deserved the ruin of the devil to be altogether destroyed yet the wonderful counsel of god devised a middle state that without life they might live in death it ought not to be thought more unreasonable if the impious are raised from the dead in order to be dragged to the tribunal of christ whom they now refuse to hear as their master and teacher for it would be a slight punishment to be destroyed by death if they were not to be brought before the judge whose infinite and endless vengeance they have incurred to receive the punishments due to their rebellion but though we must maintain what we have asserted and what is asserted by paul in his celebrated confession before felix that there shall be a resurrection of the dead both of the just and unjust yet the scripture more commonly exhibits the resurrection to the children of god alone in connection with the glory of heaven because strictly speaking christ will come not for the destruction of the world but for the purposes of salvation this is the reason that the creed mentions only the life of blessedness book three chapter twenty five section ten to book three chapter twenty five section twelve but as the prophecy of death being swallowed up in victory shall then and not till then be fully accomplished let us always reflect on eternal felicity as to the end of the resurrection of the excellence of which if everything were said that could be expressed by all the tongues of men yet the smallest part of it would scarcely be mentioned for though we are plainly informed that the kingdom of god is full of light joy felicity and glory yet all that is mentioned remains far above our comprehension and enveloped as it were in enigmatical obscurity till the arrival of that day when he shall exhibit his glory to us face to face now we are the sons of god says john and it doth not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is wherefore the prophets because they could not describe that spiritual blessedness by any terms expressive of its sublime nature generally represented it under corporeal images yet as any intimation of that happiness must kindle in us a fervour of desire let us chiefly dwell on this reflection if god as an inexhaustible fountain contains within himself a plenitude of all blessings nothing beyond him can ever be desired by those who aspire to the supreme good and a perfection of happiness this we are taught in various passages of scripture abraham says god i am thy exceeding great reward 
with this david agrees the lord is the portion of mine inheritance the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places again i will behold thy face i shall be satisfied peter declares that believers are called that they might be partakers of the divine nature how will this be because he shall be glorified in his saints and admired in all them that believe if the lord will make the elect partakers of his glory strength and righteousness and will even bestow himself upon them to be enjoyed and what is better than this to be in some sense united to them let us remember that in this favour every kind of felicity is comprised and after we have made considerable progress in this meditation we may still acknowledge the conceptions of our minds to be extremely low in comparison with the sublimity of this mystery sobriety therefore is the more necessary for us on this subject lest forgetful of our slender capacity we presumptuously soar to too high an elevation and are overwhelmed with the blaze of celestial glory we perceive likewise how we are actuated by an inordinate desire of knowing more than is right which gives rise to a variety of questions both frivolous and pernicious i call those frivolous from which no advantage can possibly be derived but those of the second class are worse involving persons who indulge them in injurious speculations and therefore i call them pernicious what is taught in the scriptures we ought to receive without any controversy that as god in the various distribution of his gifts to the saints in this world does not equally enlighten them all so in heaven where god will crown those gifts there will be an inequality in the degrees of their glory the language of paul is not indiscriminately applicable to all ye are our glory and joy at our lord's coming nor christ's address to his apostles ye shall sit judging the twelve tribes of israel but paul who knew that according as god enriches the saints with spiritual gifts on earth so he adorns them with glory in heaven doubts not that there is in reserve for him a peculiar crown in proportion to his labours and christ commends to his apostles the dignity of the office with which they were invested by assuring them that the reward of it was laid up in heaven thus also daniel they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever and an attentive consideration of the scriptures will convince us that they not only promise eternal life generally to believers but also a special reward to each individual whence that expression of paul the lord reward him according to his works it is also confirmed by the promise of christ that his disciples should receive a hundredfold more in eternal life in a word as christ begins the glory of his body by a manifold variety of gifts in this world and enlarges it by degrees in the same manner he will also perfect it in heaven as all the pious will receive this with one consent because it is sufficiently attested in the word of god so on the other hand dismissing abstruse questions which they know to be obstructions to them they will not transgress the limits prescribed to them for myself i not only refrain as an individual from the unnecessary investigation of useless questions but think it my duty to be cautious lest i encourage the vanity of others by answering them men thirsting after useless knowledge inquire what will be the distance between the prophets and apostles and between the apostles and martyrs and how many degrees of difference there will be between those who have married and those who have lived and died in celibacy in short they leave not a corner of heaven unexplored the next object of their inquiry is what end will be answered by the restoration of the world since the children of god will want nothing of all its vast and incomparable abundance but will be like the angels of god whose freedom from all animal necessities is the symbol of eternal blessedness i reply there will be such great pleasantness in the very prospect and such exquisite sweetness in the mere knowledge without any use of it that this felicity will far exceed all the accommodations afforded us in the present state let us suppose ourselves placed in some region the most opulent in the world and furnished with every pleasure who would not sometimes be prevented by disease from making use of the bounties of god who would not often have his enjoyment of them interrupted by the consequences of intemperance hence it follows that calm and serene enjoyment pure from every vice and free from all defect although there should be no use of a corruptible life is the perfection of happiness others go further and inquire whether dross and all impurities in metal are not removed from that restoration and incompatible with such a state though i in some measure grant this i expect with paul a reparation of all the evils caused by sin for which he represents the creatures as groaning and travailing 
they proceed further still and inquire what better state awaits the human race when the blessing of posterity shall no longer be enjoyed the solution of this question also is easy the splendid commendations of it in the scriptures relate to that progressive increase by which god is continually carrying forward the system of nature to its consummation but as the unwary are easily caught by such temptations and are afterwards drawn further into the labyrinth till at length every one being pleased with his own opinion there is no end to disputes the best and shortest rule for our conduct is to content ourselves with seeing through a glass darkly till we shall see face to face for very few persons are concerned about the way that leads to heaven but all are anxious to know before the time what passes there men in general are slow and reluctant to engage in the conflict and yet portray to themselves imaginary triumphs now as no description can equal the severity of the divine vengeance on the reprobate their anguish and torment are figuratively represented to us under corporeal images as darkness weeping and gnashing of teeth unextinguishable fire a worm incessantly gnawing the heart for there can be no doubt but that by such modes of expression the holy spirit intended to confound all our faculties with horror as when it is said that tophet is ordained of old the pile thereof is fire and much wood the breath of the lord like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it as these representations should assist us in forming some conception of the wretched condition of the wicked so they ought principally to fix our attention on the calamity of being alienated from the presence of god and in addition to this experiencing such hostility from the divine majesty as to be unable to escape from its continual pursuit for in the first place his indignation is like a most violent flame which devours and consumes all that it touches in the next place all the creatures so subserve the execution of his judgment that those to whom the lord will thus manifest his wrath will find the heaven the earth and the sea the animals and all that exists inflamed as it were with dire indignation against them and all armed for their destruction it is no trivial threatening therefore denounced by the apostle that unbelievers shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the lord and from the glory of his power and when the prophets excite terror by corporeal figures though they advance nothing hyperbolical for our dull understandings yet they mingle preludes of the future judgment with the sun the moon and the whole fabric of the world wherefore miserable consciences find no repose but are harassed and agitated with a dreadful tempest feel themselves torn asunder by an angry god and transfixed and penetrated by mortal stings are terrified at the thunderbolts of god and broken by the weight of his hand so that to sink into any gulfs and abysses would be more tolerable than to stand for a moment in these terrors how great and severe then is the punishment to endure the never ceasing effects of his wrath on which subject there is a memorable passage in the ninetieth psalm that though by his countenance he scatters all mortals and turns them to destruction yet he encourages his servants in proportion to their timidity in this world to excite them though under the burden of the cross to press forward till he shall be all in all if you enjoyed this recording please support our channel by subscribing liking and sharing our content we would also be happy to receive any comments or feedback below